Good morning. Welcome. I'm Jeff Balzer. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs at Vanderbilt University and Dean of the School of Medicine. And it's an honor to welcome you to the first national workshop of the Precision Medicine Initiative Working Group. I want to extend special welcome to Senator Lamar Alexander, NIH Director Francis Collins, and the distinguished panelists from other institutes and universities and advocacy organizations all around this country. Thank you for joining us today. As you know, we're at an exciting time in medicine as an explosion of progress in science and technology has really changed the art of the possible. In particular, at Vanderbilt and many centers, The marriage of health IT and genomics is showing tremendous progress for advancing a precision medicine initiative for this country. The brightest minds in digital health, genomics, research cohort design, and countless other disciplines are gathered here today. I have no doubt all of you are simmering with important and transformative ideas. Vanderbilt is honored to be your host as you share those ideas and hammer out the details. Thank you for giving your time and talents to this work. So let's begin. Let me to allow me to introduce Kathy Hudson, Deputy Director of Science, Outreach, and Policy at the National Institutes of Health for a meeting overview, and welcome to Vanderbilt. Good morning and uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Jeff, and to all your colleagues here at Vanderbilt for um, hosting this meeting of the Precision Medicine Initiative cohort. Um, I also want to thank the NIH team who has been involved in working with the um, Precision Medicine Working Group to put together today's and tomorrow's um, agenda for you. In particular, I want to uh, give a shout out to Josie Briggs, Dan Macy's, Terry Manolio, and Mike Lauer, who worked with our working group to plan uh, this workshop for you. This workshop is being webcast, so welcome to everybody who's tuning in from the comfort and safety of your offices and homes. Um, We will be uh, throughout the day, and that's not working, and that's not working. Okay. Um, So I'm going to wing it now. (laughs) So we are, um, have a hashtag uh, PMI network. That's hashtag PMI Network. So please uh, tweet, and we'll be following the tweets throughout the day and bringing those uh, into the room uh, as appropriate. I also, uh, on one logistics matter, want to point out that the workshop will be moving locations, and so tomorrow we will be at the Vanderbilt Commons Center. So I want to talk a little bit about sort of how we got here and what we're hoping to accomplish here today before turning the podium over to uh, Dr. Collins and uh, Chairman Alexander. So the Precision Medicine Initiative has two research components, one focused on cancer and one focused on this large uh, research cohort. We're focusing here today and as a part of this working group on designing, uh, building a roadmap for this research cohort. And this cohort we hope we'll have one million or more uh, eager volunteers who um, will be compiled either by leveraging existing cohorts or by de novo recruitment or perhaps by a combination of those two. And we'll hear a lot about that uh, today from folks who are involved in existing cohorts, either through healthcare delivery systems or research cohorts. Um, We anticipate that participants will be centrally involved in the design and implementation of this cohort, and that they will be able to share genomic information, uh, lifestyle information, and biological samples and EHR information with the cohort, and importantly, that the cohort will share information back with them. So data sharing is going to be a central value and premise for this cohort, and it's not just data sharing among scientists, it's data sharing with and among participants. So we think that this will really be a new model for doing uh, research where it's not just us collecting information and using that, um, but having a real model of engaged participants with open, responsible data sharing and appropriate privacy protections. So uh, the Precision Medicine Network was first announced by the President Um, in the State of the Union address on January 20th. And between that moment and now, a number of important steps have been taken in the planning. Uh, Soon after the President's announcement, we had a workshop 
on campus at the NIH on February 11th and 12th, where we really started to uh, queue up some of the key areas that we're going to need to explore in order to design this cohort. Um, the subsequent month in March, Dr. Collins put together an advisory, a working group of his advisory committee uh, that is chaired by uh, Dr. Rick Lipton, uh, Bray Patrick Lake, and myself. And the members are here uh, with us today and will be actively participating in this workshop before we meet tomorrow to uh, continue our deliberations. We then had a workshop uh, last month on the NIH campus that was really intended to explore um, what unique scientific questions can we ask utilizing a cohort of, uh, that we're envisioning here, and uh, what are the unique scientific opportunities? So that was really a, a visionary uh, and important meeting for us in sort of setting the context and framework. Um, this meeting here today, we're going to be talking about uh, digital data and what kinds of um, data do we need, how do we share it, how do we store it, how do we analyze it, and how do we build a cohort, uh, what are the existing resources that we might leverage. And I'll come back and talk a little bit more about what we're going to be doing today in a second. So after today's um, workshop, we will move quickly on to two additional workshops in July. At the beginning of July, July 1st and 2nd, we will have a workshop on uh, participant and community engagement. We're well on our way in planning that important meeting. And in addition, we are um, currently, the Foundation for the NIH has a survey out in the uh, community to uh, gather information about the public's um, hopes, uh, concerns, aspirations, and general views about participating in a cohort such as this. And so we'll have those data in hand to consider during that workshop. And then at the end of July, we will have a workshop uh, hosted by Eric Dishman at Intel in Santa Clara, California. Thank you, Eric. Um, where we will talk about um, using mobile devices, wearables, uh, environmental sensors, and the like as a source of uh, constant flow of data into the cohort. So I won't walk uh, through the agenda for today uh, with you. I do want to um, uh, point out that you all should have agendas and you should have uh, additional materials that were provided to you. The top of the agenda um, lists the, re the questions that we're trying to address during this particular workshop. We have very little time uh, before we need to deliver a blueprint to the advisory committee to the director, um, that being uh, due in September for their consideration so that we can, if we receive resources uh, through an appropriation from the Congress, actually get underway with this ambitious effort at the beginning of the next fiscal year, which begins on October 1st. Um, so we uh, have a lot of work to do. We appreciate all of your input and help along the way. Um, the research questions that we're going, the workshop questions that we're going to address today um, are uh, really looking at how can we leverage existing resources, um, how do we tap into the patients and impatience of, of um, the energy and impatience of patients, how can we collect health information prospectively, and what baseline information and samples do we need. So those are the issues that we're going to be tackling uh, over the course of the next day and a half. And so with that, I think I will turn the podium over to uh, my boss, uh, Francis Collins, the NIH director. Oh, thank you, Kathy. Good morning to all of you, and many thanks to our hosts uh, here at Vanderbilt uh, for all of the effort you've put into making us all feel welcome and taking care of us so hospitably. Uh, it is great to be here because of the strength of this institution in the very area that we're wanting to talk about in terms of the digital health data in a million-person precision medicine initiative cohort. We couldn't be in a better place because of all the things that have already been emphasized here uh, by some of the research team that's represented at this meeting. So thank you, uh, Vanderbilt folks, and thank you to all the staff who've worked very hard uh, to make this happen. I particularly want to mention Gwen Jenkins, who's uh, worked tirelessly uh, since she got pulled into this whole thing a couple of months ago uh, for many different aspects uh, of dealing with logistics and uh, other important aspects of what we're trying to do. We are at a signal moment. I think all of us who have begun to imagine what might be possible here are getting pretty excited about it. The idea that we might have a million participants all consented for research, all excited by the opportunity to participate in research, 
and with access to electronic health records, potentially complete genome sequences, and a variety of other information sources in terms of environmental exposures uh, and lifestyle experiences uh, and so on, we could have the power to really begin to get answers about what works in terms of maintaining health, what works in terms of managing chronic illness. And goodness knows we need that information if we're going to optimize our health care system, which I think we would all agree at the present time is far from optimal. So this is a really remarkable opportunity. We're having this summer with this series of four workshops to paint a picture about exactly how to organize that kind of a cohort to get the most out of it. And we need to think carefully about what's realistic, but also dream big and try to find some happy medium in between uh, those things, because my goal for this would certainly be that what we put forward is achievable, but it's a bit of a stretch because that's often what inspires people uh, to actually go to the next level uh, of challenge. Uh, certainly, imagine if we had this, what you could do. If you really wanted to understand, for instance, the variability in drug responses for commonly prescribed drugs, and you had a million people, there would be many people who were, in fact, receiving a particular drug. You could look at their genotypes. You could look at their environmental exposures, and you could actually draw very compelling com conclusions in the real world about how to pick the right dose for the right person at the right time, the whole area of pharmacogenomics. We know that that is out there waiting uh, to be understood. Well, there's many different ways that we've gotten glimpses of that, but this would be a way to really nail it down. The idea of being able to identify individuals who are actually healthy, but who by the basis of their DNA analysis really shouldn't be, may help us a lot as well in terms of understanding protective factors. Most of medical research has been focused on people who are sick, but sometimes we learn more from understanding things about people who are healthy and maybe have been exposed to various environmental things or have a genotype that says they shouldn't be. How are they managing to avoid illness? If we could learn that and then pass that on to others, we'd be going somewhere pretty interesting. And certainly the opportunity, as we'll talk about in the fourth workshop in this group, about using the proliferation of wearable sensors uh, to be able to track what's happening, both in terms of exposures and just in terms of body performance, is an enormous opportunity, but one that needs to be rigorously tested to see if it's going to contribute uh, to health maintenance and to management of chronic disease. I'm curious, in this audience, how many of you right now are wearing some kind of wearable sensor? I'll out myself with my Fitbit here. A fair number. I would be willing to bet that in four or five years that number will grow in an audience like this to an even larger proportion. But we would want to be at that point in a position of knowing how to use that information in a way that actually works. And that's what this cohort has the opportunity to do. So we're thrilled to have the chance to be here with you all for this intense couple of days of deliberation. I must say, looking at the agenda, I think we've lined up exactly the right people uh, from all over the country and a few from outside to help us think this through. And I'm counting on, therefore, this not just being a meeting where people get up and give their standard talk, but this is going to be highly interactive. We are going to try collectively uh, to help this working group come up with real recommendations about answers to some of the critical aspects uh, uh, that are still on the table about how best to optimize this cohort. So uh, it's going to be a wild ride, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I am now happy, however, to ask a very special guest who's here with us this morning, uh, Senator Lamar Alexander, uh, to say a word. Let me just say a, a minute about him for those of you who don't know his background. Uh, Senator Alexander, now chairman of the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, commonly known as the HELP Committee, uh, and also a member of Senate Appropriations Subcommittee uh, that oversees NIH, has a very interesting and appropriate background for this kind of conversation because he has formerly been uh, a university president. He's formerly been a secretary of education, formerly governor of Tennessee, and a graduate of Vanderbilt, I was told to be sure to bring up, so I will uh, mention that as well. Uh, and this year, he has displayed, I think, a remarkable interest in this whole area of how to optimize biomedical research by launching, uh, together with Patty Murray, who's the ranking member of the HELP Committee, this Innovation for Healthier Americans initiative, focusing on examining the challenges to getting safe treatments, devices, and cures to patients more quickly and effectively. And he's here specifically to understand from you all a bit more about this initiative and ways in which the Congress uh, might facilitate a good outcome, and we deeply appreciate that. 
He's been very supportive of the conversations that have happened so far about the Precision Medicine Initiative. He came personally uh, to the White House, to the East Room on January 30th, uh, when President Obama announced the Precision Medicine Initiative. He held a hearing on the topic earlier this month where I had the honor to testify, and it was a great opportunity to put forward some of the plans that are in place, admittedly plans that are still in development. So he has been a wonderful friend uh, to all of us who are dreaming about this possibility. And knowing that we were coming uh, to Vanderbilt, uh, we extended him an invitation, hoping that he might be able to join us. And it's a great pleasure indeed uh, to have Chairman Alexander here with us. Let me ask him, therefore, to uh, come forward and say a few words uh, to you, and then we'll convene a panel to have a bit more of a discussion with him about this. Please join me in welcoming Chairman Alexander. Thanks, Francis. It's a little unnerving. My name used to be Lamar Alexander, but in the last few months it's been Chairman Alexander. <laughs> but um, thank you, thank you very much, Jeff, Kathy, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I had a friend who died several years ago, Alex Haley, the author of Roots, and he heard me make a talk one time, and he came up and offered some advice. He said, "Lamar, when you make, when you're about to make a speech." If you would say, instead of making a speech, let me tell you a story, people might actually listen to what you have to say. <laughs> so let me tell you three short stories and sit down and join the panel. The first one is about a former United States Senator, uh, Howard Baker, from whom I learned a lot. He made, we have this tradition in the United States Senate called the maiden speech, still called that, your first speech. And Senator Baker was making his this was 1967, and, and the leader of the Republicans in the Senate was Everett Dirksen, Baker's father-in-law. So the senators were there listening. Baker spoke for over an hour. And Senator Dirksen came over to congratulate him, and Baker looked up at his father-in-law and said, Senator Dirksen, how did I do? And Senator Dirksen said, Howard, may I suggest that occasionally you should enjoy the luxury of an unexpressed thought? <laughs> So I'm going to follow that rule today. When Francis Collins asked me to speak, I said, I don't want to speak. I don't know much about this. But you're having people from all over the country who know everything about it. So I'd like to listen. So I'm going to sit down next to Francis in just a minute and, and listen. Now, here's what I'd like to hear. And this is my second story. I'd like you to know that what, what we're doing that affects you in, uh, in January or February, uh, earlier in the year, uh, after the president had already talked about uh, precision medicine, he flew to Knoxville in East Tennessee to make a speech about community colleges, and I flew with him, and so did our other senator, Senator Corker. On the way down, we had a conversation about what we were working on. I told him I was working on... on uh, fixing No Child Left Behind, elementary and secondary education. I was working on deregulating higher education. That's my second objective. In fact, the Vanderbilt Chancellor, Nick Zeppos, led a study with the Chancellor of the University of Maryland saying that the overregulation of higher education is a jungle of red tape. And they hired the Boston Consulting Group here at Vanderbilt to figure out how much it costs Vanderbilt each year to comply with federal rules and regulations and it's $150 million a year, uh, and which causes all of us to think, what if that money were spent on research or on lowering tuition or, or, or what else? Well, and then I said, the third thing we're going to do, Mr. President, is we're going to focus on innovation in medicine. How do we get ideas from the discovery process all the way through the valley of death and the capital investment and through the regulatory process into the medicine cabinet and, and, and into the doctor's office. He said, well, I'm interested in precision medicine. And he, we talked about that. It was after that that he had his event at the White House, which I tended to show my support for it. But what I said to the president, I'm telling you this so you can, you can see why I'm here and what I hope to get from you and Dr. Collins as we go through the next several months. I said, well, Mr. President, we're, we'll take your precision medicine initiative and we'll incorporate it into our innovation initiative. 
And, and while we're arguing about other things over here, we'll get this done over here. So if there's anything we need to do legislatively about precision medicine, this will be a way to do it. And in addition to that, the House of Representatives is moving ahead with something they call 21st Century Cure. Well, the next Monday, I got a call from Sylvia Burwell, who's the very able head of the Department of Health and Human Services. And since then, we've been working. I work with Senator Patty Murray, a Democrat from Washington, who's a senior Democrat on the committee. We formed a working group on precision medicine, which will be meeting once a week on, or, or regularly uh, with, with, with uh, Dr. Collins' staff and, and, and others who are working on this. We have a subgroup on electronic health care records because the more we've gotten into that, we've seen that the government uh, has spent $30 billion trying to require people to do it. And for some, like Vanderbilt, it works enormously well. For others, it doesn't work very well at all. And it has to work well for this initiative, A, to gather the million cohort, and B, for doctors and others to be able to use the information effectively when they make prescriptions for their patients. So we are meeting once a week with working groups between the Senate and the administration to identify the five or six things that we think we might do in the next few months to improve the operations of the working group. Karen DeSalvo, who is here, is heading that right now. She's been recommended for a higher position by, by, by President Obama, which is fine as long as she gets this fixed <laughs> on her way there. But we've, we've, talked about, we've talked about that. The, the, what I'd like for you to know is that this is a train that's going to get to the station. And while you're working on your objective of developing this million cohort, a, re, a really ambitious uh, idea, and doing it at such a remarkable university as Vanderbilt, which has both in, in, in the research it does and the electronic medical records, uh, really a model for the country. In the Congress, we're going to be moving in a direction that can help you. I mean, my, our objective is to create an environment in which you can succeed. But we need to know from you the specific things that we need to do to, to, in order to have that to happen. And if they can be done administratively, why well, then Secretary Burwell and Dr. Collins and others can do that themselves. If it requires a change in the law, you need to get on this train that's moving through the station. The House is going to pass its version of this innovation project probably next month. Ours won't be finished until the end of the year, but it will pass at the beginning of next year. So the ideas that you have need to come to us uh, in the, say, by September or October. I found in my work around different places over my lifetime that there are all these smart people with all these ideas, and there are all these people in the Congress and the government who need the ideas, and they have a hard time getting together. And what, helped, what keeps them from getting together is an understanding of the process, but more specifically, the very specific idea. I mentioned the deregulation of higher education that I asked Chancellor Zeppos and the head of the Maryland uh, system to work on. The value of that is they gave us 59 specific proposals, and we're literally putting those into legislation and going to introduce that in a bipartisan way, and a lot of it will get done. So that's my invitation to you, is involve yourself in this progress that the President and we and the House of Representatives are working on in a bipartisan way and that we expect to finish uh, in 2016. Now, finally, stories about Dr. Collins. I don't want to embarrass him, but he's making good use of his time in Nashville. Tonight, he and I are going to the Bluebird Cafe to the late show to see the songwriters. Uh, I'm picking him up at 8.15. This is a great treat. It's like if you were in Napa Valley, we'd be going to a winery in Nashville. You go to, you go to a songwriter's roundtable where three people you never heard of play songs that you've always heard of, and you, and you learn about them. And what you might not know about... Dr. Collins is his, he's a musician himself. He, he, he once played at the Bluebird Cafe on Monday night when they let anybody play. <laughs> I don't know how he did, probably he was great. And he gets that from his father who roamed the mountains of North Carolina in the 1930s and early 40s, I guess, collecting, collecting songs that were passed down orally before they disappeared and they're in the Library of Congress today. So those are all my stories. I look forward to your advice, and I'm going to sit down and listen. Thank you. All right. well, let me invite the panel to come up, if you would, uh, and I'll introduce them as they're coming out. Senator, that was terrific. 
Uh, so on the panel, uh, we're going to hear from Josh Denny, who's here at Vanderbilt, Associate Professor of Biomedical Informatics and Medicine, whose interests include natural language processing, but who's been particularly a leader in the use of electronic health records for doing research. Next to him will be Eric Dishman, who is at Intel. He's an Intel Fellow and General Manager of the Health and Life Sciences Group in the Data Center and Connected Systems Group, obviously a critical part of our effort to build bridges with industry. Uh, next to him, uh, Bray Patrick Lake, who is co-chair, as you heard, of this working group, along with uh, Rick Lifton and Kathy Hudson, and she's Director of Stakeholder Engagement for the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative and Director of Patient Engagement at the Duke CTSA. And then Jay Shanduri, who is Associate Professor of Genome Sciences at University of Washington, a real guru of technology development in the genomic space, so we have quite a distinguished quartet here. We could have picked others of you to put up here as well. But I thought just for starting off the morning, and particularly maybe to provide some of what Chairman Alexander is looking for as far as a question or two about where this is going, I might pose a question to each of you. So Jay, I'll, I'll start off with you. I started uh, at the podium saying a couple of things about imagining what we could do uh, with a cohort of this sort. So what would you say if we could see this coming into place, uh, this cohort of a million well-consented, highly motivated participants, how would that change for you the face of medicine in the next five to ten years? Uh, so, this on? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, so it's a good question. Um, I think the, the ways in which, the, there are at least a few different ways in which it could prove to be transformative. So certainly, uh, probably the most important one is the kinds of questions that we'll be able to ask. Uh, so as, as you mentioned in your, in your uh, comments, um, the last decade has seen a, a revolution in terms of the molecular uh, technologies that we can use for characterizing individual patients. So this includes, for example, uh, whole genome sequencing, but many other technologies. Um, and uh, to, to, to really, I mean, we're already getting a lot out of those technologies, but to really maximize their value, um, applying them to, to very large numbers of individuals, I think, is, is the way forward. And moreover, um, uh, doing it in a way where the information, the molecular information is seamlessly connected with uh, electronic medical records. And this is something where, where the work here has really um, been kind of the, the leading wedge, uh, so to speak, for, for making this possible. Um, a second uh, area is, I think, how we ask questions. Um, you could imagine, you know, in, in the current model where we have, you know, siloed research cohorts or whatever it is with traditional uh, the traditional way we, we do science um, being replaced by something much more uh, uh, imaginative where uh, the data and the records and, and the, the molecular information is all accessible to a very broad tent of researchers. And I think that will be transformative in terms of bringing a lot of creativity to the table. Um, and moreover, um, you know, you think about companies like Google and, and how they improve their products. Uh, and, the, and the very fast cycle time of being able to, to look at immense amounts of data from, from large numbers of people and, and to improve their product very quickly. I think that's something we currently lack in medicine. But you could imagine, this is where I, I think people get really excited about the PMI, is the integration of EMRs, of mobile devices, uh, and, and molecular information really leading to a, 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 a sea change in terms of the, the cycle time by which we improve uh, how we deliver healthcare. Terrific, thanks. Well, Bray, let me as, turn to you, because one of the things that we are passionate about <clears throat> with this initiative is that the people who are involved are not going to be patients. They're going to be participants. They're going to be partners. Uh, how do you think a potential participant will look at this? What will they want most from this Precision Medicine Initiative and from being part of this million-strong cohort? So I think what um, what participants and certainly patients like myself who are living with medical conditions, um, what we are looking for, and I think it's what um, Senator Alexander hit so astutely on, is we have people with ideas and they have people who can do something about it. We have people with data and we desperately need people who can do something with that. And so we need to bring all the different pieces in the system together. And we see as patients, we see so much potential and we want to be your research partners. We want to help you, um, help us 
with our, our data and with all of the uh, information we're collecting, and we want to actually say, this is what's most important to us. This is what you need to be studying. But we also want to get something back. So we need to make sure that we're sharing and that we're all creating a system together and we have to stop all of the different fragmented efforts that are going on. And I think also what we really want, we want the best and the brightest minds working on these issues. And I think we have um, starved biomedical research funding in this country to the point where we are losing the best and brightest minds. So we need to give the researchers something to study. We need to give them the mechanism, which is funding, to actually do that. And we need to bring the U.S. back up to its potential because as patients we see every day what could be done. And I think it is the most frustrating thing in the world to be sitting on all this data and know we can't do anything about it. So we really need your help to take um, our genomic data, which is over here on, let's say, the left, and then our health is over here on the right, and there are all these things in the middle, the environmental factors, behavioral, diet, lifestyle, there are all these things in the middle that help us get to being a healthy person, and we've got to tighten the loop and um, really free the data as far as the regulations and the policies and then make sure that we can um, support these efforts and get the U.S. back up as an innovative nation. Right, that's terrific. Eric, let me ask, uh, in terms of the opportunities that you might see here for the whole ecosystem that we hope to take part in this, which is partnerships between public and private, and particularly from your perspective, what do you see as industry's role, and how do, would industry see this as a real opportunity? Well, it's interesting. I mean, actually, I'll start with a patient perspective. I mean, I, many of you know, because um, I've talked about it before in these sessions, I am a precision medicine prototype. A whole genome sequence saved my life about three and a half, four years ago. After 23 years of chemotherapy, 38 rounds of chemo, immunotherapy, or radiation therapy, um, I'm now part of a whole genome study of survivors because I should not be alive. I should not have survived the chemistries and the chemicals that I was put through. And we wonder if me, like those rare other patients who have survived decades of this, that perhaps we have genetic qualities and capabilities that could teach us about um, um, how to help other people survive these. But it was interesting, I'm going back through the six months of analysis that our, my medical teams across multiple sites around the United States and one in Europe, uh, the challenges that they had actually sharing data and the mixed disciplines and industries that they came from. It took people from pharmacy, it took people from the IT industry, which obviously Intel and, and my team are involved in. It took people from um, academic backgrounds in computer science. And it took people from, you know, probably three or four other industries to come together to sort of get to a precision treatment for me. Um, so we do need to realize that to build the platform for, for precision medicine on a national scale is a multi-industry, just not, not just you know, the high-tech industry. For the, for the world that I live in of computing and the future of computing, I mean, as Bray mentioned, there's a space race going on amongst countries to invent the future of precision medicine. But there's also, if you step back, there's a space race going on to own the future of computing. Um, at the, the levels of computing that will, it will need when we make precision medicine available to all uh, Americans will be what's called exascale computing, right? That's 10 to the 18th power of process of, of instructions per second that will need to happen to be able to create a model of you as an individual patient and know reliably what to do with you. We as a nation and we as a technology industry don't yet know how to do that. And I think one of the things that this cohort will do is it will force multiple industries like ours to understand these use cases that challenge everything we know about the, the, the microprocessor, about the memory, about the database, and it will be a very challenging and important playground where hopefully, as a nation, we continue to develop the intellectual property that, that puts us at the, at, at the forefront of inventing what's next for computing. So as we invent what's next for healthcare, we'll invent what's next for computing, we'll invent what's next for pharmacy, and, and we want to make sure that we're in that global competition to win it. Josh, that's a great point, and it makes me remember sort of what happened with the Human Genome Project, where it was not just about getting those first readouts of the three billion letters of the Human DNA Instruction Book. It was all the things that were stimulated to happen as a result in terms of whole industries that were built up around DNA sequencing. And, of course, the economic returns, which people have recently calculated about 190 to 1, uh, may very well also apply in this situation if you start to consider all of the spinoffs in terms of new businesses and expansion of other businesses that will be driven by this kind of insight. Well, Josh, uh, you're the uh, local boy, but you're also the national expert in uh, this whole question of how to make electronic 
health records usable uh, for research and actually for patients' use as well. Uh, so what, what will bioinformatics programs like the one here uh, need to contribute uh, to this uh, area for precision medicine? And maybe also ask, uh, do we have a pipeline uh, sufficiently broad and deep of investigators coming into this field uh, to help us? Well, great question. And um, I, I think, you know, if you look at, I want to underscore something Eric and, and Bray hinted at. You know, if you, if you look at the successes in this space, it'll always come with multidisciplinary teams. You have um, clinicians, you have biologists, you have uh, computer scientists, and, and you have these domains that interact with each other. And importantly, I think you have a lot of cross-training between them. Um, I think one of the things informatics can bring, um, especially when you, you kind of merge the clinical informatics and how to design electronic health record systems such that they are, um, get accurate information from physicians, they are interoperable, they are designed in such a way that they can easily share information forward um, such that you can develop these large data sets and hopefully interoperate them and pull them together in a large cohort with more comprehensive and deep, not just broad, but deep as well, information on the individual that is accurate. I think um, when, you, when you think about the to generating these teams, you have to have clinicians that get trained in quantitative sciences. So, so that means that we need clinicians that, that do more advanced you know, computer science or, or, or math or you know, even physics types of educations. But, but, you, but you also want to um, have physicians that just become aware of that and part of teams as well as taking the basic science folks and, and having them be more educated um, in, in sort of the clinical domains bringing them together with access to large amounts of data that's also deep. I think a key thing is not just at a high level, but one of the things we keep talking about is getting the depth of the information as well um, over a longitudinal period. So I appreciate uh, all of your, your comments because I think they're right in the center of what we're trying to accomplish. So Senator Alexander, you can tell this group is uh, rolled up their sleeves or intensively engaged in trying to put together a design for this uh, by August, uh, which will then go to the parent group in September. And I, I'm pretty excited and optimistic that they're going to come up with something that is inspiring, bold, and achievable. But it's also the case that this kind of a project will take some time to get fully ramped up, to find these million people, to get them engaged, uh, to begin to accumulate the data in terms of laboratory tests and DNA analysis. Uh, so the full potential of this uh, will take a few years before it emerges in the way that we are all dreaming of here. I guess as somebody who's been uh, at NIH now for 22 years um, and dealt with the Congress, I know that sometimes there's some impatience about things that don't happen quickly. So how much should we worry about the issue of a project of this sort, which for its full potential is going to take a fair amount of money and some time before the payoff really starts to kick in, but then it's going to kick in in a big way? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Collins, and thanks to each of you for your comments. I think the answer is that uh, the most important thing you can do is to rear back and come up with a, a, a think big and think of a, a create a blueprint of where we really ought to go. Don't think about, oh, that we have this problem and that problem and they may not fund this or may not do that. Because my experience with Washington is that most ideas fail for lack of the idea. I mean, there are very few people that come in and say, here's a picture of where we need to go. I'll give you an example. In 2005, I was at a budget hearing and I was kind of depressed over the fact that all the entitlement spending was going up, but it was squeezing out all the kind of things that you're interested in that Bray just talked about. And we, and we can't, you know, we got to restrain this in order to afford this, but I went down to the National Academy of Sciences that afternoon and they put together a group as a result of it called Rising Above the Gathering Storm and the Congress passed an America Competes Act, which we're reauthorizing for the third time. Now, it didn't all get funded like it was supposed to in the first two years, and not everything passed as was recommended, but the Augustine Commission came back with 20 specific recommendations. Most of them are law today. Most of them have been funded today, and it was because somebody laid out a blueprint of where we need to go. That's the most important thing you could do. I'm sure it will be multidisciplinary. It'll have to be. That's the way the whole world works today. And uh, as I was listening to what you, what you were saying, I thought of, thought of, uh, of these things. On exascale computing, there, there, there's an area in which the administration and Congress agree. I mean, for the last five years, we've funded that. The Obama administration's 
laid out what to do. We have the summit computer over at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. We're designing the next stage of exa exascale computing. So that's 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 got a good that's got a good uh, that's got a good beginning. Uh, the best way, Bray, you can bridge this gap between all the people over here with data and all the patients over here who need it, or all the people over here who know something and all the people over here who pass legislation or regulate, is this blueprint. Just if everybody can always go back to that, and I'm sure this must have been what Dr. Collins did when, or something like that, I don't, I, with the Genome Project. I mean, you just had, my grandfather used to say, aim, he was a railroad engineer, aim for the top, there's more room there. So you just rear back and say, okay, <laughs> here's where we're going. And then, you know, probably, uh, probably uh, you'll get there. And the last thing I was, I was thinking about was uh, the blueprint, the, the specifics, the specific suggestions, because it's hard. We don't know what you know, so you need to tell us specifically what to do if you want it done. And then, then the last thing is a, is a bit of experience I had that your comments made me think about. When I was governor of Tennessee in 1980, uh, we had an idea of uh, making all middle school graduates computer literate. It was pretty early. And uh, we didn't know how, I didn't know how to do that. So I flew out to California and sat down with Steve Jobs and talked to him about it and ended up, ended up buying Mac computers for every middle school in the state. I mean, they were about that tall then. <laughs> and, uh, but I forgot something training teachers and now the, ex the exact the exact thing won't happen to you here but w particularly when you get into all of this computer stuff it's easy to forget something <laughs> that's essential to actually getting a result it may not be training teachers but it'll be something else which i guess argues toward the multidisciplinary approach so somebody can say hey that all sounds great exascale computing is a fine thing but what about x y and 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 z so i'm I'm, I'm, I'm going to work hard on this electronic, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to force some improvement in this electronic record system. I mean, I know there's someone somewhere who, can, who knows how to do this. Vanderbilt thinks it knows how and does it very well. Well, if they do, uh, then we should duplicate that and not get all stuck in 15 different silos and, 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 and inadequacies in the, in the government. So I, wh what you're doing is very, very important, and there are a lot of us who are looking forward to your blueprint, and the money will follow the bl blueprint. <laughs> well, that's encouraging, that last sentence, especially because we are, <laughs> we are a little anxious about how this is all going to get paid for. And as Bray said, well, this comes in the context of what's been a pretty difficult 12-year downward trend, and we would love to see that get turned around and appreciate your strong support for that. Uh, so I, I appreciate also what you said about aiming for the top. There's more room there. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from James Russell Lowell, who said, not failure, but low aim is a crime. We are not going to aim low here. That's uh, for sure. Um, Senator, you asked, and, uh, and we heard you clearly, that you would like to have some suggestions about specifics that might find their way into the innovation legislation when legislation is needed. I can tell you that we are accumulating a series of very specific measures that we think would be benefited by some legislation, and they relate particularly to privacy and confidentiality, so that those who participate in this cohort have the maximum confidence that that information is going to get used the way they intend for it to, to and doesn't end up leaking out into other places where it should not. And there are some things that need tightening up there, and they're not things that I think can be effectively done without legislation. So we will be getting you those in a very specific way in order to meet your deadline, which I think you said was maybe August or so, to have that kind of input. So you all take note. You had a great invitation here for anything that looks like it needs that kind of fix. Uh, that requires the Congress. Uh, we have the leader uh, of the, uh, the committee that is now going to be putting together just what we might need. Well, I know we have a very full agenda, and I don't want to slow it down any further, but one, one, you certainly may. I, I wanted to ask uh, Alicia Henney and Melissa Pfaff and Brent Re Meeks to stand up. Yes. They're, they're back here. There are three members of the Health Committee staff of the Senate. They'll be here today. And so if any of you have suggestions you want to make to them, they welcome them.
Well, thank you, Cha uh, Chairman Alexander. Thank you, panel. Uh, we will now uh, adjourn this group and move on to the next step. But please, again, let's uh, thank uh, our chairman for coming all this way, uh, although it is his home state, uh, <laughs> to be part of this conversation. Thank you. So um, next, we're going to hear from uh, Gina Way from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And she's going to present to us the um, sort of a summary of what we heard from a request for information that went out asking a series of questions of the public, uh, you and uh, others, to give us input that we could use in um, our deliberations. And this is going to be a, a, a mechanism that we use repeatedly throughout the course of the summer is putting out requests for information and uh, getting that back in, distilling it, and, and using it really as fodder for our planning process. Um, so the first one, uh, the first request for information went out, and Gina's going to describe this, the uh, results of that to you. Another request for information will be going out shortly, and it will specifically be um, soliciting information that will help us with our next workshop on participant and community engagement. So keep your eyes out for that, and I would encourage people uh, to provide input through that mechanism, which is very useful to us. So with that, uh, Gina, come on up. Okay, just want to make sure. Okay, great, this is working. Okay, let's step this way so you can see everybody. So um, it is my great pleasure and honor to speak to you today on behalf of the NIH Precision Medicine Cohort Team. The co-chairs of the cohort team are Terry Manolio and Mike Lauer, who are both here today. So for the next 15 minutes, I will be giving you an overview of the public responses that we received to this RFI or request for information that was put out. About a month ago, we at the NIH released a request for information. Again, we call that RFI for short, and really to solicit comments on the precision medicine cohort. The period, the open, the comment period closed earlier this week. Again, the purpose of the RFI was to gather information to help the NIH in determining how best to design and implement a cohort of one million or more Americans. The RFI covered two broad topic areas that you see here. First was a general topic on how best to implement and design this cohort. And the second, we really wanted to get an idea of what research entities are out there that might be interested in becoming part of the precision medicine cohort. Under the general topic, we asked four specific questions. What are the optimal study design and the sample size for this cohort? and what data should be collected at baseline as well as follow-up, and what potential research questions would the precision medicine cohort be uniquely or really well positioned to address? And finally, any other suggestions that we at the NIH should consider. For research entities that might be interested to join this cohort, we ask the following questions. Is the particular research entity able to identify consent and follow more than 10,000 participants? Will they be able to provide individual level participant, participant data that can be integrated in a standard format and be able to be combined with data from other research entities? Also, we ask whether they're able to retain and follow the participants for several years. So as you can see, there are a total of seven topic areas or seven questions to which one can answer. A person can answer all seven or just pick one. We were pleased to receive over 150 submissions. These came from over 32 cities and, sorry, 32 states and 71 cities across the U.S. We also received submission from five foreign countries. So we see one here in, from South America and Europe, several from Europe and also from Australia. This is a list of seven topic areas and questions that I showed you two slides previously. And here are the number of responses to each of the questions. And you can see the range go from 80 to 110. And so overall, we were quite pleased with this number. We thought they were quite robust. So gathering all this information, somebody's had to go through this and really sort of distill it into this 15-minute talk. And really, we had a great team to do that. This is our cohort team hard at work doing just that. 
And you can see at the head of the table is Debbie Wynn from National Cancer Institute leading the team discussion. Sitting to the right of her is David Murray, and we really want to thank David Murray and his staff of the NIH Office of Disease Prevention. They did a great job curating the raw information into a digestible format, which really greatly helped with our discussion. And really, we really did look calm. This is a candid shot. We were not posing for the camera. So um, now for the rest of the talk, I would like to give you some really overview of the content of the responses that we received. But before I get into the specifics, I want to start off with some take-home messages. First, as I said, we were very pleased, but not just with the comments, not the number of comments that we received. We we're also impressed by the thoughtfulness of the comments. We were also pleased that many, many interested, many, many entities or research entities expressed interest in becoming part of this big initiative, of this big cohort. And also, the Commons really validated a lot of the concepts we've heard today in the previous NIH precision medicine workshops. But at the same time, we also saw several ideas that we thought were intriguing and that perhaps should be explored further. Okay, so now on to the specifics. Most respondents agreed that we should have at least 1 million participants in the study. In fact, about 20% of those responded actually thought, you know, you should really go way beyond 1 million if you can. In terms of demographics, the, the, most of the people actually thought that the cohort should reflect the diversity of the U.S. population. I want to caution and say this does not necessarily mean that the composition of the cohort should replicate the U.S. census. In fact, the thought was that for many of the groups that have been previously underrepresented in studies, those are the groups that perhaps should be oversampled. There's really a strong theme of the study being as inclusive as possible rather than exclusive. So it should be able to cover a wide spectrum of age groups, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, geographic location, and the list goes on. As to what research topics this cohort is well positioned to address, so not surprisingly, not surprisingly you see here drug and other treatment responses. I want to clarify by saying that this does not simply mean pharmacogenetics or using genetics data to help determine prognosis or other non-drug treatments. There is also a suggestion that perhaps the precision medicine cohort could be used as a platform to efficiently recruit participants into precision medicine treatment trials. Of course, lifestyle and environmental exposures factors, there is a call to really carefully capture those information. And this is not just to, again, no identify novel risk factors, but as you heard earlier from Dr. Collins, you also want to use that to uncover protective factors. Again, a theme of being inclusive, so cover as broad range of diseases as possible with this cohort, and also capture biomarkers, omics, metabolomics, microbiome, the proteomics, and of course, we need to do genomics and study gene bioenvironment interactions. And the last bullet here really is about sort of taking all of these information, put them all back actually into the healthcare system, and sort of integrate and incorporate them into sophisticated clinical decision support tools. And that way, you could actually enable the actual application of precision medicine while the study is still ongoing. As for optimal study design, Again, most thought that follow-up should go at least five years. There was actually some differences of opinions as to how often the study should bring particip participants back for re-examination. Some people thought, bring it back every six months. Some people actually thought every two years. And there was also a thought of actually doing this real-time data collection so you not have to rely on these intervals. And another interesting suggestion was actually the study might want to tailor the intensity of the follow-up by different subgroups or, or different diseases of interest. 
Of course, the theme of leveraging existing studies and existing platforms that have already invested a ton of money into their studies and other platforms, but at the same time, also recruit new participants into the study, especially those that are typically underrepresented in current studies. At a minimum, it was at a minimum the study should include a core set of data that is collected in a standard way. Also, incorporate electronic health records and and health technologies, which we were here, at least for the EHR part, most of today and tomorrow. Adequate consent is a must. In addition to be able to recontact participants, that in order to actually get them into even more clinical or sub-studies of either deep phenotyping or even clinical trials. Also, there was a mention of doing clinical and pilot studies early on. And the pilot studies really, when you do them early on, you really want to test out the new technologies, new data collections, or new recruitment platforms that you'll be using to see if they've actually worked, and therefore if you can actually scale them up. So we were pleased to receive about over, almost 60 entities we thought they would be interested and might become part of the precision medicine cohort. You can see they're from healthcare systems. We also got responses from large healthcare networks, which just mean that more than one healthcare system sort of meeting together. Cohort studies or consortia of cohorts, individual universities and individual projects, and also cancer registries and communities. And about half of these 60 research entities indicate that they have the ability to identify and follow more than 10,000 participants. Lastly, I'd like to share with you some ideas that our team felt were intriguing and that might be explored further. The first is something I already mentioned, which is really to tailor, for the study to tailor the intensity of the follow-up by subgroups or diseases or um, risk factors of interest. Another interesting idea is to actually enroll blood donors or use blood centers to recruit new participants into the study. The idea is that typically blood donors are generally um, altruistic, more, more altruistic, and they're more willing to give their time, their, their energy, and their biospecimens and their data to enhance the public health. And so perhaps blood centers could be used in that way. And in fact, some of the blood centers men- that, mentioned, um, that responded to the RFI mentioned that they're already doing that. They're already helping researchers recruiting really highly interested participants into their studies. Another idea is that the study might want to create a what to tell your doctor pamphlet that they can give to their participants. So the thought is once a participant decides to join the study, he or she would give the pile of just all these pamphlets to all of his or her doctors. And that way the doctor will know first that, oh, Mr. Smith is part of the precision medicine cohort. And also, you know, what if I have questions and I want to ask the study investigators and, you know, to be able to communicate. Maybe I have information I want to share with the precision medicine cohort investigators. Allow all participants, regardless of their background, to have complete access to their data, if they wish, even raw data. The study should also consider how to handle potential clinical care costs that could arise from unexpected abnormal test results that will be detected during the course of the study. So you can imagine if a participant doesn't have insurance to cover genetic counseling, genetic results, how do you handle that? And also, what about all the incidental findings of of unknown significance? How should a study handle that? Also, it was urged that the study should dedicate major efforts into social media, not only for recruitment, for retention, but also as a means of information exchange between the investigators and the study participants. Finally, to really use this platform that we've created and to enable rapid recruitment of clinical trials that are relevant to precision medicine. So let me end with this um, slide that I showed previously. First, we were very, very pleased with the number and the thoughtfulness of the comments. We were very reassured that so many existing entities are are really willing to jump right in and become part of the precision medicine cohort. 
we felt reassured also that many of the concepts that we've heard today in the previous NIH precision medicine workshops were validated. While at the same time, we found several intriguing ideas that the study might wish to pursue. So on behalf of the NIH, NIH Precision Medicine cohort team, I thank you for your attention and welcome your comments. Good morning. My name is Rory Collins, and um, I'm sure by the end of tomorrow I'll understand how I'm meant to chair a panel review by watching other people do it. <laughs> um, uh, so forgive me if I, I stumble through this a little bit. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Francis Collins and the others at the IH for involving me in this uh, uh, fantastic opportunity uh, with the Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, and um, uh, I, I'm incredibly enthusiastic for what, you're, what you will be able to achieve. Um, so I'm a cardiovascular epidemiologist at the University of Oxford and involved in um, a cohort in, in, the U, in the UK called UK Biobank, um, which, like the Precision Medicine Initiative, is intended to be a resource for all researchers um, uh, to use uh, for all kinds of, of health-related research. Um, could I ask the, uh, the, all the panel members to, to come up? <clears throat> so, a, a, as they do, uh, and when they're up, I was going to ask them to, to uh, first introduce themselves, because, um, uh, as you can tell, I have enough difficulty introducing myself. Uh, so I think it's uh, much better that they, they try to explain to you... Um, uh, why they think they're here, um, <laughs> um, and uh, how, how, how they think, uh, and we'll go into this in the discussion, um, they might be able to contribute to this resource. Um, I, I would like to suggest for this panel that we try to forget that there's anybody here uh, and, and really have a conversation amongst ourselves as to, to, to what we... Um, uh, what we think we all could contribute to this resource. But first, let me ask um, each to introduce uh, yourself. So start with you, Keith. Uh, thank you, Rory. Uh, my name is uh, Keith Stewart. You can tell I'm a native of Arizona from my accent. But um, I I'm a hematologist at Mayo Clinic and uh, about uh, three months ago became the director of our Center for Individualized Medicine. So that's why I'm here. I'm Raj Srivastava. Um, I'm the Assistant Vice President at Intermountain Healthcare, uh, which is a large healthcare delivery system uh, in the Intermountain West. Um, I'm also a hospitalist at a children's hospital. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Marilyn Ritchie. I am a professor at the Pennsylvania State University, and I'm also the director of a new institute for biomedical and translational informatics at Geisinger Health System. Um, which is an integrated healthcare system in central Pennsylvania, and, and that's the reason that I'm here today. Hi, everyone. I'm Peggy Pysig from Marshfield Clinic, and I am a research scientist and director of the Bio for S director of Biomedical Informatics Research Center, and I am here representing the Personalized <coughs> Medicine Research Cohort. Hi, good morning, and thanks for the invitation uh, for the organizers. Uh, my name is Larry Cushy. I'm at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. I'm not certain exactly which hat I'm wearing here, but uh, I guess one thing locally is I'm on the executive uh, committee for the Division of Research's research program on genes, environment, and health, uh, which Dr. Collins, uh, Rory Collins, that is, visited just recently. Um, I'm also the PI of the Cancer Research Network, which is a consortium of uh, integrated healthcare programs, uh, NCI-funded consortium. Uh, so, anyway. And I'm Haukon Haukon Arsson. I, uh, I'm the director of a genomics uh, center at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and University of Pennsylvania. 
uh, physician scientist uh, by training. And uh, I have built a large-scale uh, pediatric biorepository at uh, Children's Hospital uh, with a uh, link to electronic medical healthcare records. And we are conducting uh, precision medicine uh, clinical development trials out of that. And I hope to be able to contribute to this effort uh, through that venue. So I'm Mike Gaziano. I'm a cardiologist at the VA Boston uh, and an epidemiologist. Um, I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard, and I'm fortunate at this very interesting time with the confluence of all of the omics and data and computing revolutions to be um, serving as uh, one of the PIs of the Million Veteran Program. That's great. So, so I, I just thought you know, maybe I could set the scene for at least what I think we're trying to do here um, and then um, open up the, the, the conversation. So, um, I mean, given the range of people here, uh, I suppose the first question is, you, why is this being done at all? Um, you, uh, and that was touched on earlier. You, uh, the, why would one recruit uh, a million people uh, and follow them up uh, long term? Um, and in the UK, there was a, a lot of argument about why do that with the UK Biobank cohort. You know, if you're interested in genetics, there are much more efficient ways of doing it. And, of course, the point that has been made is that we're not just interested in genetics. We're interested in all of the different things that can determine health, um, whether they be environmental, lifestyle, um, genomics, other omics. Um, and the, the value of a large prospective cohort in the long term is how cost effective it can be because you don't focus on a single disease. Uh, it provides a resource for all kinds of researchers interested in all kinds of exposures to study all kinds of health outcomes. And, and the thing that, that I've found in the development of UK Biobank, it's taken quite a lot of time for people from other disciplines to understand why a million. And of course the point is that although um, many of the, all the individuals will be informative in the long run, um, the, only a very small subset of them will be informative about any particular uh, health outcome. And although that's obvious when it's pointed out, it's not obvious uh, to people who don't play with this game all of the time. Uh, and uh, so although at the beginning it looks very inefficient because you recruit a million people and in five or ten years' time only 5,000 of them will have this disease. But of course another 5,000 will have that disease and another 5,000 will have the other disease. So in the long run, it's a fantastically cost-effective way of building a resource for all kinds of researchers. Um, but if we're to do that, you, what, are the th what, are, what are the constraints that that then places upon the resource uh, and how uh, particularly the uh, organizations that you're involved in and other organizations like you uh, can play a part. And I wanted to propose that we start at the end uh, in two senses. So the first sense is uh, what are we trying to build in five or ten years' time? And I think what we're trying to build is a resource that allows a number of different things. It has information about all kinds of different health outcomes because we want different researchers to look at lots of different diseases. We want a resource that has all kinds of different information that might be relevant to those diseases. Uh, so we want to have a whole set of uh, answers to lots of different kinds of questions that relate to lifestyle and environment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, a lot of different kinds of measures that might be relevant to one disease but not to another, a whole lot of different kinds of sample. The, the point that was made uh, in the, uh, the previous talk uh, in, the, in the consultation was if we have all of this health outcome data, and I think that's probably where you are particularly able to help in terms of embedding the resource in a setting where one would be able to get long-term uh, follow-up of lots of different health outcomes. And we have all of these answers to questions, physical measurements, samples. The third thing that we need is the consent to use it for all of these different kinds of research. Um, and so what are the things that you feel um, your organizations could do to help provide that resource in five or 10 years? 
the resource that, that can get all health outcome data. Because I think that in many respects, that may be the most difficult part of this project. It's not five years. It's more like 50 years. Uh, this resource will become richer and richer and more and more valuable with longer and longer uh, follow-up. So it needs to be built with that recognition that it has to be used in the very long term. Um, and the consent has to be applicable to that very long-term use for all sorts of different kinds of things. And the data and the samples and the questions have to be collected in ways that allow that. Yes, there may be remeasurements. Yes, there may be uh, specific subsets. But as a core in a million people, you, how are you going to build it? Or how, how can you help to build it? So does anyone want to kick off with those questions? Yeah, Keith. Rory, my comment is I'm not sure we have to wait that long. I mean, when I look at, um, I'm sure all of us may have the same sentiment, when I look at the content of the Biobank Mayo Clinic has built already, and many on the table have also, the average length of follow-up of members in that is, is 10, 10 years mean and 15 years median with, with over 60 physician visits each. So we already have, even looking backwards, a very robust record which can be mined today not having to wait 10 years, I guess that would be my comment. I wasn't suggesting one needed to, to wait, but I was, what I was trying to suggest was that if it will become more and more valuable as time goes by, how do we build it to ensure that that can be achieved? Certainly there will be short-term gains just from the cross-sectional data, but if we're thinking, why are we doing a prospective cohort? It's because we want to look at the effects uh, on a lifetime of, of health outcomes. Yeah, for sure, let somebody else come. Um, so at, at Geisinger, we have already started a research cohort called MyCode um, that we have been consenting patients very broadly, so all types of research um, and return of results. And so we have the capacity now to recontact patients. So as we learn something about new biomarkers that we might want to measure for different environmental exposures, we can go back to the patients, get additional blood samples or other tissue samples as needed. Um, we are actively engaging the participants and the physicians, along with genetic counselors and, and specialty physicians, to actually start to build the pipeline of returning the information to the patients via um, electronic means, sitting down with the patient, not just kind of firing something to the doctor, but also sending materials to the patient, sitting down with the patients and explaining them. And, and those pilots have just started to happen. Um, but the other types of things are um, starting to structure some of the, what was typically free text in the EHR so that it's easier to mine the health outcomes. So we found that it's been a lot easier to put phenotypes together electronically because we've started to structure a lot of the data. And starting to roll out, I guess the way that I think about it is um, kind of some of the things that you would get from a, a traditional epidemiology cohort kind of overlaid with what you get out of an EHR-based cohort, and that is being able to start to ascertain other types of things that you don't get in the clinic. So health outcome, things that are happening at home, um, dietary, nutrition, environmental, social, behavioral, and we're starting to roll some of those out, um, actually using some of the things developed by the NHGRI, so the, the Phoenix Toolkit is one of the mechanisms we're using to do that. And we're sending them out to patients um, in paper form, we're starting to put them into our patient portal so that patients can log in and enter their information. Um, we're starting to talk about putting them on kiosks and iPads in the clinics, as well as interacting with mobile devices so that we could get continuous feeds of you know, some of the information that you might want. So I think thinking about how to collect broadly, but in a, as structured a way as possible, because as even though our, our ability to process, you know, do natural language processing to get things out of free text is getting better and better, as much of the data that can be structured will help. Um, but I think having that mechanism where we can continuously go back to the patients and collect more information as time goes on. Because one of the things I certainly learned early in my career in some of the more epi-related things that we did where you know, we did a big ascertainment and then three to five years later we'd go, oh, I wish we had collected this and that and oh, if only we could go back and get this sample now because we really want to be able to measure that. So I think you're right about staying broad in our consent so that we can go back as often as we need and also be able to have mechanisms to keep adding 
data to the system. And I think the EHR is a great way that we'll still capture all of their clinic visits over time. And, and as you said, Keith, we can go backwards 10, 15, 20 years. And so we could start right away to look at some things that we have measurements on. But I think having that kind of elements that you would get from an epi cohort to integrate with the clinical data in the HR is the way that, certainly the way that we're thinking about it at Geisinger. Thank you. Mike. So just to answer the, the first question of, of why a million, we have a million veteran program, the MVP, but well, the first reason was because the acronym wouldn't have worked well if it was several hundred thousand veteran program. <laughs> um, and the second reason, having spent time with Neil Risha Kaiser and Dan, and then Rory over at Oxford, if, if the UK could do a half a million, we thought we could at least do a million. Um, but, um, but a million is, is the, it, it, you know, as, as you point out, this is a platform that will do an awful lot of things. And so we explored you know, various oppor opportunities to assemble the data and thinking along the lines that, that you had just iterated, that this is an organic entity. Um, you know, when, when Framingham started, they didn't envision that they would be going on for 70 years. Um, and they had, they had a, a more traditional cohort model where they were collecting data. The getting the health data came later, but they layered on um, year after year. And what we did is we explored the, the three main models. One was Framingham-like, where you collect most of the data yourself. And that's just not economically feasible. It's just not gonna, you can't do that over 50 years and have the richness of the data. And then we looked at um, what Dan has done here very efficiently with an opt-out strategy. And I think that that's been a wonderful way to assemble a, a very useful resource. But we did wanna add the element of being able to recontact the participants for this layering on. So, and and the the um, the alternative was to have a, have a, a a passive way of accumulating various types of data. That it's just a fundamental element that if you're gonna follow a million people, doing it with Framingham type, you know, periodic health examinations is just not economically feasible. Um, and, and then I, I think we can get into much more detail about how you integrate the various sources of data, but our, our model is to take the health record, combine it with things like National Death Index, Medicare claim style data, data that goes back in time from the Department of Defense for our special population, and to, to continually improve the quality of the data, um, number one. And then the second fundamental principle was to allow for special subpopulations that become of interest to a given investigator um, to be able to be recontacted to augment a data set in a unique way for a unique set of questions. If you need an image for a study, you can contact people. If you need a telephone questionnaire, if you need environmental exposure, you, the, the investigator can take the backbone, which is a cohort of individuals that has, we start with three fundamental core elements. The first is the biospecimen that gets centralized. The second is core questions self-reported that really don't exist in the health record. And I'm sure if everybody looked at our questionnaires, we borrowed heavily from all of you, you know, um, that, that you would recognize it. So core elements of data. And to the extent that that can be updated, that's wonderful. And then the third element is the, the passive follow-up. But that's the core database that exists across the platform and the capability is to, to go into the EHR, to go into other data sources, to layer on environmental data, to go back to subsets of individuals and to, to you know, add to the resource on, on an, an as needed or as indicated basis when there's both interest and the appropriate funding. So that, that's sort of the, the, the fundamental model that we adopted to establish this resource that we hope will be sustainable, will sustain um, the delivery of information for um, decades and decades to come. Thanks very much. Uh, Peggy, you had. So Marshfield looks at um, precision medicine, personalized medicine, very similar to the way that Geisinger and, you know, the vets do. Um, 
we basically know that linking the genomic data to the electro electronic medical record is really important because you have that health history. We have over 30 years average for each patient of health data at Marshfield. Um, something that hasn't been said um, already is, and we can't really forget this as well, um, it's important to integrate in insurance data because it completes the picture. Uh, patients can go to a provider, but now more than ever, they have the flexibility to go to others. And when you have that insurance data, you can actually get the whole spectrum of health care. And in addition, dental data. We're starting, we've, um, through uh, the family health centers, we've started to collect and integrate in dental data to look at the oral systemic conditions. And this is really important, and it really hasn't been considered in the talks that I've heard. But, um, you know, just, just working with a cohort, making sure that the broad consent, you know, that you can reconsent or recontact these individuals for sub-studies is extremely important. Um, you may have, especially at Marshfield, we have a very homogeneous type of population. And, you know, but what's unique is there's different parts of the country that have different things going on, so the environmental factors um, are really important and contribute to the genetics as well. The other thing, um, and this is focused more on the electric health record, you need to be able to assess health outcomes and then to take that information because think about how the physicians are going to use this. They're going to rely on the data to classify um, the participants in the medical EHR and if we can't identify these patients using the EHR, then how are they going to intervene? So that's another consideration. But, you know, as far as what Marshfield can contribute, we've got a cohort. We followed them probably 15 years now. It started in 2001, so almost 15 years. And we've definitely got the linkage to the EHR, and we've collected the Phoenix and other tool dietary types of data and collecting dental as well. I mean, that's an important point uh, that you made, and Keith made as well, was that um, you, if, as, as Mike says, one looks at embedding this cohort within some kind of healthcare record systems that allow you to get what I think Mike described as passive follow-up, to get mm -hmm. uh, relatively low cost information about health outcomes, there may be ways in which you can then enhance that um, people like Josh Denny can perhaps comment on, on that, but at least to, to get a relatively low-cost way of finding out what's happening and then getting more, more detail. Um, but a point that you made, which I think is very important, Keith Woods, I think, alluding to it as well, uh, is that that's not only health outcome data going forward in time, it's health outcome data going back in time that tells you a lot about uh, these participants even before um, they become participants uh, in, in the cohort. Um, Larry, you had a, a comment. Yeah, so uh, along, along the lines of follow-up, I think uh, most of us who are represented here are connected somehow to some health system and so have the EHR sort of access, so to speak. One of the things I want to point out or make a point about is uh, the concept of uh, having a defined population that you can actually follow passively, or at least for some of the data collection passively. And so in the Cancer Research Network, uh, for example, uh, we looked at uh, people who were uh, looking, at, looking forward for people who were diagnosed with cancer. Uh, Ten years after their diagnosis, only less than a quarter of the people who were diagnosed in cancer in our systems have disenrolled from the participating uh, uh, organizations, which includes uh, uh, Marshfield and Kaisinger and stuff. Uh, looking the other way, you know, for people who were diagnosed in 2012 with cancer, two-thirds of those people were continuously enrolled as members of our systems 10 years before. You know, so, so it shows that there's the ability to potentially follow people in both directions, depending on what one is interested in. Uh, and that's something that's relatively unique to the integrated healthcare systems that are represented here. Uh, it doesn't, 
this includes, uh, this is just uh, the claims data that one can link up with, you know, with large health insurance, and, but it's the detail of you know, the diagnoses, the actual lab values, you know, blood pressure levels, et cetera, that one could potentially link with. Um, and so, so that's something that I think that uh, if one wanted to try and do this million person or larger cohort in a relatively efficient manner, that's something that could potentially be tapped into. Uh, I think it does conflict with some of the other concepts or principles that have been put up here in terms of inclusiveness and you know, representation of everybody and, and also sort of patient, perhaps patient driven uh, in terms of enrollment because if one bases a cohort in settings like ours, then people who aren't getting healthcare from our systems you know, may be interested in participating, but then they wouldn't necessarily be included. Uh, and, and as uh, Peggy mentioned, you know, some, uh, some of our systems you know, don't necessarily represent you know, sort of the, what the population of the United States looks like. Uh, so in any case, I think that's one thing I would, another, another thing I want to mention, which was in some of the questions that you had, or somebody had distributed beforehand, is that one of the things that we've done is we have developed a, a multi-institution uh, virtual data warehouse data model that does allow for uh, relatively efficient sort of multi-institution uh, data analyses and sort of uh, pooling of data potentially. Uh, and we can talk about that in another context, but uh, anyway. Can I just expand on your, your point about you know, being unrepresentative? Because um, there were some quite interesting comments that came out uh, with the consultation about trying to be oversampling of particular uh, groupings. Um, and so, I mean, if this cohort was established largely within a whole set of different um, uh, healthcare systems, um, I mean, it's not necessarily the case that each healthcare system has to be representative, um, but that the cohort as a whole um, either represents or over represents uh, all of the different uh, groupings that, that one would want. So it may be that. Half a dozen of them don't achieve that, but another half a dozen really kind of do, do much more in terms of uh, getting yeah. particular groups. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the case. When, when we look across the Cancer Research Network, for example, Kaiser Permanente, Southern California, their membership is about 40% Hispanic. That's out of over 3.5 million people. Henry Ford is about half African American. Uh, we're about 60% white, but the you know, wide variety of Asians, African Americans, uh, Hispanics as well. So, so definitely that's the case, but we are also all health insurance providers. And so, so, and as unfortunately in the US, not everybody has health insurance. So we're missing potentially that large chunk of, uh, of people. Hacken, you had a point. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so I wanted to emphasize the importance of the, uh, of the pediatric uh, contribution to this <clears throat> because uh, 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 monogenic diseases, as you know, they almost all uh, present themselves in, uh, in childhood. <coughs> and, you know, yes, we are born with these variants. And uh, for common complex disease, the uh, earlier the disease expresses itself uh, in, in children early uh, in childhood, typically the stronger the genetic uh, component and the heritability when you do heritability assessment of the, of the data. Uh, so I, I feel that that's a critical sort of uh, uh, part of this to be able to follow disease progression. Most diseases, even uh, presenting in adults, they, they actually start in children. Uh, and so, so I think we should, you know, in, in order to follow the uh, developmental trajectory, uh, understand uh, neurodevelopment, uh, uh, neuropsychiatric and cognitive uh, functions, it's, it's going to be critically important. Now, what we have done at uh, CHOP uh, uh, to in, in Philadelphia to uh, understand this is that we have now recruited over 100,000 uh, individuals. There are 75,000 kids. They've all consented broadly uh, for participation in any omics study, integration to electronic medical records that go back to 13 years at uh, CHOP. Uh, within about 40 different satellite systems in the uh, tri-state area of Philadelphia. Uh, and uh, and uh, we have collected uh, uh, these uh, uh, data now, uh, and, uh, and all of these individuals, again, have given informed consent to share these data for re 
contact approximately 90%. So you can go back, you can do environmental surveillance, you can bring back family members uh, or re-phenotype individuals, get another sample over time because diagnosis may not have shown up until after you draw a blood sample, so you get them back in and so forth. And also in terms of, you know, one of the points that uh, Dr. Wei mentioned earlier is the sort of the rapid uh, turnaround time. We have now completed our first proof of concept study, which was done by uh, stratified patient recruitment based on genetic variation. It took two months to recruit because we knew of all of the individuals who had these variants. We sent them letters and we invited them. This is a subset of a common complex disease and, and the recruitment rate, this is something you can't accomplish if you don't have this type of a, uh, environment. And so I think it's critically, uh, critically valuable to keep that in mind. I know there have been debates about whether to include children uh, or not in this effort, but I, 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 I will emphasize that I think it's really critically important. So, so do you think uh, Francis Collins isn't ambitious enough, really, um, and that we should be going for two million, you know, a million, a million families, maybe? Right, right. A rush. Um, I'm not going to answer that immediate question that you just <laughs> asked. Um, we haven't been formally introduced. But what I would say is, um, uh, I think to, I'm going to start with one of the questions you asked is, why are, why are we interested? Our patients want it. We're committed. We're, the um, People are asking for this. We have um, really, um, the earlier panel that talked about from personal experience why they want it. Um, they want it, so we have to deliver. So as healthcare delivery systems, we're charged with figuring out how can we deliver this in a thoughtful, responsible manner that takes the best science but can be actually implemented as well at the patient level. So that's what I just wanted to start with. I think at Intermountain Healthcare, um, we have some of those advantages like other health systems. So we've already been in the space for some period of time. Um, you know, we have a large biorepository that has 4.3 million samples that um, goes back decades. Um, it's, much of it is linked to our electronic health record. It's linked to the pedigree information that we share um, with our university partner and uh, at the University of Utah, and then people can do this work. And I think it's important to understand that as we're discovering on the genomics omics piece in a cohort that either is going to be newly created or a hybrid from some that exist, um, understanding something that happens to an outcome, because as at Intermountain Healthcare, we track outcomes as well. So somebody has a heart attack, you want to figure out what the genomics pieces are. You might want to look at what the lifestyle pieces are. I'm pretty sure that person or their family are going to want to know, wait a minute, what's my risk? What's my child's risk? And so I do think these connections of going back to the children are critical um, as well. And just my disclosure, I'm a pediatric hospitalist, so sorry. <laughs> I'm sure we've all got conflicts of interest. We'd be here forever if we did. But, but can, can I just op open up that, that point you made at the beginning about you know, the patients want it? Um, and just you know, ask people on the panel to say, what, it, you know, what is it that they want? Um, uh, so you know, when we listened to the, the, in, the, the previous talk about the consultation, there was a comment about blood donors. Now, blood donors don't become blood donors because they want blood back. They, want to, they do it for altruistic purposes. So there is a resource that helps other people, uh, may well help them as well. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll put a proposal to you and you can shoot it down. But when you say they want it, um, do they want it as a resource that will work out how to treat their children, how to treat their relatives, how to treat people better? Um, uh, to a greater extent than they kind of want some, some feedback or some results. I mean, obviously, m different people want different things, but I mean, what are people, yeah, Peggy. Um, our patients want it for, a, for several reasons. One is to help future generations. Um, at Marshfield, we have, met, we have a multi-generation um, cohort and patients as well, and they want by contributing to our biobank, they want to help their children's children and future generations. 
the other thing is we've participated in an eMERGE um, pharmacogenomics project and they also, they are actively engaged in seeing their results and how their physicians interact with it. You know, they want to be able to know that if they're, they're allergic to something and to know that their physicians are seeing the alerts and can actually react to it. The other thing that I wanted to add on to, in addition to the patients wanting this information or wanting to do this, our providers, you know, the people who care for the patients, really want this information. We had a, we did this uh, pharmacogenomics project, and I worked with not only the Marshfield Clinic system, but we were our EHR um, also integrates into another large uh, healthcare system. And we implemented our system, and I got an awesome email back from the chief medical officer saying, it's about time. Thank you so much for doing this. And they were just ecstatic that they were finally seeing this information in the electronic health record. So it's both, it, you know, safety, everything. Keith. I want to make a comment. I, our own experience is that we've approached 250,000 people, and this is probably relevant to your ambition here, that uh, they're self-selected. About 22% of people we approached volunteered to enter the biobank, and about 90% of them re-volunteered when they were re-approached for new studies. So they're uh, clearly a, an engaged and altruistic group. There's an over-representation of women who want to participate, which might get to the a generational issue of 60% versus 40% male in our system. So that was really the main comment I wanted to make. And something just uh, was said, which I think is important about, um, and the senator addressed this earlier as well, is not to forget to provide education to the providers who are receiving the data, because our own experience is they do as much education as everybody else uh, in trying to interpret and use this. And actually a little bit nervous about receiving genomic data that they don't know what to do with. So don't forget that. Uh, Mike. So we get uh, information about the veterans that enroll from multiple sources. We did a, um, an opinion survey beforehand. Kathy Hudson was involved um, with, uh, with that. We get um, ongoing feedback from the, the, the three million mailings that we've done to veterans today. And when, also feedback when they come in um, and then uh, Suma Raldar is here is going to um, do more formal engagement of our participants and what they want. And um, they, the, the, the key driver is this, the sense of altruism. Can I make the system better? I, I think that the blood donor analogy is actually quite apropos. Can I make the system better for my, my brethren who they served with? Um, that's that's a, a theme in the, in the VA. Um, for the for the world, um, and um, we, we intend to provide uh, them with information about um, the progress and the, the advantage of doing this within a healthcare system, and I think this is a, a, a universal theme too, is that we can, as has already been mentioned, inform the healthcare system of the, the, the knowledge gained from this process in, an, in, a, in, in a number of ways to improve the healthcare system in, in a, a really meaningful and active way. So, so there, I think there are an enormous number of, of potential benefits, but the, the overriding theme is this sense of, of altruism. Marilyn and Raj. Yeah. yeah, I think not only returning the information so that the patients themselves know better how they should be treated or what medications they should be taking and their families, but in a lot of these healthcare systems, they are in communities that are, are <coughs> very broad, you know, some of them, so Geisinger is in a very rural area of central Pennsylvania. It serves 31 counties in the state, but people don't move in and out of that area a lot. So even if it doesn't help their direct family, it helps the family that runs the farm where they get their milk or the farm where they get their vegetables. And then because of it, kind of social networks and internet, mm. the, our communities have actually gotten larger. There are a lot of communities for different diseases that we have now. And you know, people want to help not only their family, but everyone who has multiple sclerosis or everyone who has this type of cancer or that type of cancer. And so I think those communities have gotten broader. And 
So yeah, people are doing it not only to help themselves, but to help others. And I also want to echo that I think the providers also really want this. They want to be able to treat their patients more effectively. And in particular with the pharmacogenomics, it's kind of a buzzword that's come up quite a lot today. And I think it, it's a key element where we, we know a lot of information that we can implement quicker. And if we could tell the provider, patients are likely to have an adverse event with this drug, but not that drug. They want that information. The patients want it, but the physicians want it just as much, as well as the insurance provider. So I think it, it's to benefit all of those. Rory, I do think um, altruism is, is going to be a big driver of this. I also think, um, as we've read of examples and hear of examples, there are places that are offering this to patients as a treatment option, even though these are incredibly early days and we'll, we're still learning. And some of this is why we need the science to help understand what are we learning. Um, at Intermountain Healthcare, we have a large um, cancer genomics initiative where we are actually taking patients with advanced stage cancer and, and understanding what their genomics is, figuring out what drug is available, offering that to patients, and then studying what happens to them and comparing them to controls. Um, and that's actually presented at the American Society of Cancer Oncology meeting, the ASCO meeting tomorrow. So, so, but I think others are working on this area as well. That's why the return of results are really important. The, so I do think while altruism is gonna be a major driver, there are opportunities that we might learn to benefit people during the actual study period, however long that is determined to be. The other thing is, um, uh, I think the other piece is, why do we wanna participate? We probably wanna participate for the same reasons others wanna participate. This is a complicated story. We are talking about getting to a million, which is maybe not bold enough, Dr. Collins, that Dr. Collins. Um, <laughs> two, we are talking about the omics initiative, of which genomics is the first of many. We're talking about three, the understanding of um, data analysis for data that we did not understand generations ago, the complexity of it. And then four, we're talking about linking lifestyle data through technology. I mean, this initiative has major potentials. But I do think Larry's initial comment, it might have been Larry or I can't remember the gentleman beside him, talking about we do need to understand what are the core data elements we believe we should collect that's most beneficial and allow healthcare delivery systems and others, because I think you probably end up wanting a mixed portfolio to be very representative, to be able to do some of those novel experiments that maybe a couple of health systems can say, you know what? We can do the core, we want to actually do this additional piece. Why don't we do that, but we'll feed it back to the larger group so that we can all learn how are these spin-offs happening? What's, we need this two-way dialogue and structure in place so that we're actually all learning together. And some of that may be borne by some of us to say, actually, you don't need to worry about that. We'll do that. Why? Because we're actually already doing it. But science is better together. So this is an incredibly... Um, major opportunity that I think we're actually going to be better together by understanding all of these pieces. Larry. Yeah, so uh, in terms of patient uh, sort of or member uh, engagement, um, one of the things that uh, there's been some work on is this concept of open notes, uh, which is not exactly sort of you know, motivation of someone to participate, but um, I think Geisinger was involved in, <coughs> in that. Uh, Kaiser Permanente Northwest, after some of the initial findings from some of that work, you know, decided to become an open notes sort of organization, which basically means that their patients, their members, have direct access to all the information that's in their medical records. Uh, that's not the case in some of, the, some of our other organizations. Like, we, we're not in that position ourselves. But it's required a little bit, for, as I understand it, uh, not being directly involved, but it's required some education on both the patient side as well as the provider side. Uh, one of the anecdotes that people, that someone mentioned is that, you know, at least in some physician notes, you know, you might use a terminology, SOB, which might be misinterpreted. You know, it's, yes, you, you might mean shortness of breath, but that's not maybe the way that it's interpreted by the patient. <laughs> so, so I think that uh, 
So, so some of that type of thing, you know, is something that does that probably will need some sort of evolution as we become much more open in terms of how we share things. And I think that if that does happen more and more, then, then I mean, I had never heard of this blue button initiative that was in the draft document, but then that possibility becomes more of a possibility, I think, uh, if patients do have more direct access to everything in their medical records as opposed to just the specific results that they, you know, they get back from a particular visit or something like that. So, so the uh, decision making by the parents to authorize uh, <clears throat> a blood sample to be donated uh, from their children to future research uh, in a sort of anonymous or de-identified way, I mean, it's a very, very big uh, decision. And what we find is that uh, almost all of the parents, they, they participate because they want to contribute to a good cause. And I think the concept here for precision medicine is, is exactly that, and, and therefore we can, we can get people to participate in that, uh, uh, in that uh, setting. So any, any return of variants or other information that could potentially contribute to the benefits of their children uh, is, is hardly ever sort of uh, uh, the driver of, of the participation in the pediatrics. So just to shift gear a little bit, and, and let's assume that we're using the health care record systems, your, your health delivery systems, uh, as this passive follow-up of health outcomes in the past, health outcomes in, in the future. Um, and again, going to the previous consultation around uh, having a consistent set of data, um, having samples that uh, um, uh, researchers um, from all sorts of different disciplines can, can use to have a consent um, across the whole million group. Um, from, from my perspective, that would seem to mean that, uh, one, that one would be working with the healthcare systems to recruit the million people. Um, they may be in existing cohorts, they may be new, uh, but effectively they, they will have to be a process of consenting all million of collecting the core data uh, from questions, from measurements, um, from samples, from all million. Um, although there will be existing information, it will be different for different individuals. So to get that core set um, and a resource that people can use, there is going to have to be a process of getting that on, on all the million. Again, I'm putting this up to be shot down, but um, uh, so... Having done that, I mean, if one assumes that one's done that, then um, where are these data? Where are these samples? Um, is this a federated system? Um, or is it a system where those data, those samples, are in a centralized um, location? Um, uh, so the person with the mic goes first. So, um, well, I, I, I will take a stab at that. Why, why not two million? Well, why, why is one million in one cohort the right answer? And, and, I, and I will tell you that, um, you know, what you've alluded to and using the word federated, that I, I'm not sure that a single cohort um, can solve all problems for all people at all times for uh, us to be able to understand the confluence of these wonderful revolutions and, and the, the amazing data resource. So I, I, I do think that perhaps a cohort of a certain size that's focused on children and families or a, a cohort in various health systems, um, some have already gone far down that path and others need to be added to be able to collect different kinds of data. Um, but I, I think that the, um, the, the, the core data elements um, that have to enable us to do something on this scale. Um, it, it, it does, embedding it from, as you talked about, Rory, looking at what's the, the back end, what's the potential utility, is embedding it in a healthcare system, well, the, the, the follow-up is in, in some sense passive. And in some ways it's antithetical to us traditional cohort builders of yesteryear, which is where we wanted to get the same thing on everybody, exact same interval, all the time, 
cleaned the way we wanted it, collected the way we wanted it. That, that's just not going to work for um, the scale that we, we want. And the truth is, do we need to have all the same information on all the people? I mean, we're going to have deeper information in certain subset of individuals. Now, you use the word passive follow-up. So the accumulation of data is passive. I mean, as Josh and I have talked over a number of occasions, the curation of that data is anything but passive. Yeah, sure. Um, and it requires ext you know, extreme precision. And the, the utility of, of using this data backwards and forwards in time, we have up to 20 years of data on certain individuals with an enormous durability within the system. And we can begin to think about disease phenotypes in ways that nobody has ever conceived of before. We can look at trajectories of renal decline over decades. If we go back and get the physical entry information from the time that you know, our particular cohort enrolled in the military, we can actually go back decades and look at blood pressures that, that go over time. But the, um, I think the, 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 the point I'd, I'd like to end with is that I'm, I'm not sure that necessarily a single, uh, there's a single solution to solve all of these problems, that, that um, looking at a similar question in multiple resources um, with slightly different collection parameters, slightly different diverse representation, slightly different durability within a system, but potentially could be complementary in a, in a federated sort of way. But, but to, to follow up on that, one has a, a base, a kind of core million. Uh, there may be enhancements, if you like, in large subsets. There may be another cohort of a million. Um, but if one starts with the core million and all the things that you want to have on all of them, um, and then from that you think about what you might add in them, and based on the success of that, what other cohorts you might want to establish. Is that right? Right. So I think, I think that you, the, the, you know, our, our approach is to have core elements, hmm. and there are some that we put very strict boundaries on. The lifestyle questionnaire data, um, fairly refined, and then core elements that we will extract and, um, and curate from, in our case, multiple data sources, and then core elements in um, core elements in omics that we think should be perhaps useful across large populations, which could, could certainly be um, augmented. I mean, we're, it's, it's an enormous undertaking to, um, to think about um, something like augmenting with, let's just take the example of imaging. So if you think about within a healthcare system, you know, that, that's an, a domain of data that we'd love to, to some investigators would love to have some um, data on. So what the UK Biobank is doing is doing some imaging on a subset. They're going out and actively doing the imaging. You could think about collecting the data on imaging from within the healthcare system that's accumulated over the course of care, and we think about it in, in a tiered way. The first element is the metadata that a, an image was, was um, done. The second is structured data that the that, that comes from the report. The third is there's stuff hidden in the, in the language that's not in the structured data. And the fourth is actually the image itself. All have different data parameters. And if, that's, if that core begins to catalog what's available, and then we have some of these wonderful scientists in the room that can help us organize the catalog for an, uh, uh, multiple users to come in and say, well, geez, what's, what's, ava what's, what's available? And what's potentially available, um, and 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 what and as thinking blue sky, you know, what could I do to augment this? I, I really think that that's gonna that that's gonna be the the way forward for us, is that we're gonna be in each of the domains of types of data, we're gonna be wanting to s provide some core elements, um, but create the catalog of the possible in each of those domains to allow the, the greatest use of the resource. So, so I'll ask Marilyn and, 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 and Peggy to, to give some comments. And then, actually, this conversation, there are some people listening to it, it turns out. So I have been instructed uh, to, to open it up to, 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 to questions. But um, um, first, Marilyn and Peggy, and if people have kind of comments or, or 
um, agreement or disagreement then, then do, do kick in? So, so I agree that I think a, a combination of a central and federated model is, is what's most likely going to work. So I think the, the sequence or genetic or other omic data that we generate, I think that is a little more straightforward to centralize and put in one place and in one format and make it accessible to the community. But the clinical data and the other types of data are a little more complicated. So I could imagine, much like Mike said, that there would be core elements that we would get from all of the cohorts that participate, and those would go into some centralized database that is well-structured and easily searchable. But we'd want, certainly, if, it, if the model includes the health systems with EHRs, you, know, you can't just do a data dump of the EHR, and if you did, you'd only have one snapshot in time, and you want the longitudinal passive follow-up. So you would want occasional kind of passes of data from that federated model into the central model. But one of the other things that I think is going to be really important for that, and this is certainly something we've started to think about, is that so we have this amazing, rich, longitudinal, phenotypic, and clin clinical data in the EHR that is kind of under lockdown. And what we don't want is this huge community of researchers who could really actively develop algorithms to mine that data to not have access. And, and I know privacy is one of the things that will come up, and there's this line between, you know, we can't dump the EHR into the public, but we can't keep it under lock and key so that we, researchers can't access it. And so we've started to think about ways that we could develop partnerships with you know, clinical informaticians or bioinformaticians who can mine the data. They might not work at Geisinger, but we can make them visiting scholars where they can have access and help us to extract phenotypic and clinical data. Because you know, in terms of research, we're a small organization. <laughs> We're not going to be able, as Mike and I know Josh, we've worked on this and we all agree, the electronic phenotyping is a monumental task. It is so much more complicated than the sequencing at this point. And so mm -hmm. having ways that it won't just, so you know, let's say that you know, seven healthcare systems ended up the cohort. We would need to have clinical informaticians from another 20 universities partner to extract data. It can't be just the health system who has the EHR. We have to get other investigators involved. And so I think having that type of model would allow us to maximize pulling the data into a centralized repository. And, and this was the point that Josh Denny was making about how you can't just give the data to the informaticians. You actually need a, a very close collaboration between the informaticians and the clinical people and the other people uh, that, that sharing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my uh, comments actually reflect the comments of Marilyn. And, but another just point to add is if, we, if, if our participants know that we're going to take all of this data and just dump it into some place, they're going to be more skeptical to contribute. They trust um, the local data bank or bio banks. They trust their local health healthcare system that we will do the right thing. And I think, you know, it may hinder us if we do, you know, go with a sort of one size fits all concept. You know, I think it has to be sort of a, a mix between federated and um, centralized. And I also think that we need to incorporate common data models so that when algorithms are created, you can run them, you know, at the different sites. And actually that's been done in some of the other networks. So, yeah. so I think we're going to hear that, you can, that um, it's going to be more than a million. Um, so. <laughs> Keep going higher, it's right. Sorry, as long as we can figure out how to afford it. Uh, this is a very interesting discussion, but I want to try to be sure that we're capturing the practicalities uh, of what this panel represents, because sitting up there at the panel, we have well over a million participants in the cohorts that you are already uh, have put together, which have a wealth of data, some of it going back many years. One of the debates, of course, that we're wrestling with at this meeting is whether we can, in fact, assemble this kind of a national cohort largely by pulling together uh, such existing enterprises and then doing gap filling because undoubtedly we will discover there are areas that we don't have adequately covered. But I don't want to make the assumption that all of you sitting up there are actually in on that idea without asking. So I'm going to ask very explicitly, <laughs> recognizing that for this cohort to be what we all dream of, it's going to need to have broad access 
to a wide range of researchers because we want to be able to have the kind of power that comes out of an analysis that has very large numbers of participants and some degree of uniformity of the data so that you can compute on it. So that's the dream. And recognizing that that won't be trivial. I just would like to ask each of you, uh, if that is the model, uh, are you interested in having your cohort included uh, in that design? Uh, yes or no? And if it's yes, and if you have a major caveat, you could say what that is, but don't go on too long. Yes. If, is it on? Yeah. Uh, yes, we're, we're very willing to assist from the Mayo Clinic perspective. I think the two issues for us will be the privacy one, which you addressed uh, earlier this morning, and data, <coughs> the data sharing element. Uh, we, we have not sequenced the vast majority of our biobank, unlike some others who've contracted with private sector, and so the issue of data sharing would be one that we'd want to pay close attention to. Um, yes, I think the caveats would be the privacy and then the consent. What, from our patient's perspective, what did they think? Why are they giving the data? What are they expecting to get out of it? If that's not the understanding, then I think it's not reasonable to just give a blanket yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't be here if we weren't interested. Um, but I, I think, and one of the things that we, we're act, actually really interested in contributing and sharing is the consent model that we've developed. Because I think a lot of what I've read in the kind of meeting documents that we're looking for in this cohort, we've developed in our consent documents. And we've been sharing them with other clinics as well. And, and so we'd be happy to contribute those um, and see how they can even be improved upon for the project. But I think it covers a lot of what we've talked about. Yes, we are interested. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> no, we are. And um, I think it comes down to the consenting model, you know, making sure that our, our participants are comfortable with what we're doing with their data. Great. Yeah. So I'll say yes, too. I, I can't, you know, sort of explicitly speak for Kaiser Permanente. You know, oh, come on. Go ahead. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, but I'll definitely say yes. I'll also say that I'm currently uh, sitting on the KP Research Bank, which is sort of an outgrowth of some of the regional sort of uh, work that uh, we've done or KP Northwest, uh, et cetera, have done, uh, where we're, trying, we're developing our access policies. And one of the principles is that we do want to be a resource for the large, broader scientific community. Uh, so that's definitely you know, one of the principles that, uh, that we're trying to adhere to. But I will agree that the consenting is important and the data that's not explicitly collected under research bank auspices, which basically means the EHR data in this context, um, that there may be other considerations that come into play. And uh, my answer is yes. And uh, we already have, I believe, a role model uh, informed consent that uh, already authorizes this. and. Uh, I also want to emphasize that the, the constitution of our 100,000 individuals is 50% uh, Caucasians, 40% African American, and 5% uh, uh, Hispanic, Latin, and Asian uh, each. Uh, so, so I think it's uh, you know, quite representative also of uh, the population in the US. So I, I, uh, when I promised I'd fill in for Dr. O'Leary, I told him I would defer all tough questions to him. But, um, <laughs> But the, the, I think it, the, the, the uh, sentiment is, is to make, the, make it unanimous that the, the, the VA does want to be an active partner in, uh, in this process. And I think that there are you know, many ways where the, uh, you know, a federated model can, can really make that happen. Terrific. Thank you. I, I think um, one thing that's come out, particularly I think the comment from Marilyn, um, was uh, to think about the health record system in, in, in the same way that we think about the, the questionnaire and the measurements, that one would be uh, pulling out of the health record systems, the different healthcare record systems, some common data about health outcomes. Uh, but you could then go back to those healthcare systems to enhance the phenotyping of the health outcome. Um, but there would be uh, a transfer of some common data um, at regular intervals from the healthcare record systems, analogous to the questions you ask at baseline, the measurements, the samples. Um, uh, Rick. Thanks. It's been a really interesting discussion. Uh, Mike alluded to the point that uh, this is a scalable uh, approach. Uh, everything's scalable at a price. And the, one of the questions uh, is 
with a limited budget, uh, the cost of what it actually takes to enroll and collect uh, at least the baseline data and then to follow that up uh, or longitudinally uh, will be critical to determining whether we can do a million people or five million people or you know any, any number. And so a key consideration in thinking about this is how cost effective is it actually to uh, use data coming in from a healthcare system uh, like yours, uh, particularly those that ostensibly capture uh, the bulk of uh, people's healthcare encounters. And I'd be interested for those who have been doing this for some time what the actual uh, uh, estimates are of the cost to enroll and maintain people uh, in the uh, study. Keith? Um, well, I'll start since I'm at the end of the table. It, it costs us about $250 to enroll a patient, and our ongoing maintenance cost for what is currently a 50,000 patient biobank but continuing to enroll is about $400,000 a year for that. So if you want to scale that up to a million, maintenance of the bank, including ongoing collection, uh, community advisory board, everything else that it entails, reconsenting, data management, it's about $400,000 is our annual cost. I mean, I guess one question here is you know, the, the healthcare systems could be used to identify people who are in the healthcare system, who've got a, a very detailed healthcare history data and who can be followed up. That doesn't necessarily mean that the healthcare system itself would have to do that core um, <coughs> assessment. Um, and core consent for the million-person cohort, does it, necessarily? Uh, Peggy. I was going to comment that um, our recruiting costs are about $200 per person, so it's very consistent. And we probably are 200000 We're a smaller biobank, but we still have a lot of the overhead costs. It's probably between two to 250000 per year. I don't know our exact dollar amount cost, but the couple of things for efficiency that allows you to get kind of more um, for lower cost are um, we do the, historically, we've done the blood draws for research at the time that people are getting clinic draws. And so it's not a separate clinic visit. It's just one more tube at the phlebotomist, which helps eliminate some cost. The other thing that we're starting to implement is um, electronic consenting. So what the largest cost is having the consenters in the clinic meeting with patients. And so um, we're working now with our IRB to deploy um, patient consent through their MyGeisinger portal so that they can do it online or even on their smartphone. And while there's upfront cost with that, that becomes very scalable because once you have that implemented um, electronically, the cost is very minimal. And there's a question over there. I'm sure I'm meant to be closing this down soon. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so I, again, I don't know. I don't know the specifically the cost per se for enrolling people and maintaining them, but I will say that there are some things that we've instituted to try and decrease <coughs> the sort of the costs of some data collection. For example, like our, our blood draws. I mean, Cal KP Northern California covers a fairly large geographic area, and uh, our researchers are largely you know in Oakland, um, and so so we built upon our clinical systems to enable us to put into the EMR uh, a research blood draw, which then, you know, whenever a consented participant goes to get a blood drawn, then that just is part of the order. And then that piggybacks on the regional sort of distribution system. It goes to ultimately our research biorepository bio in Berkeley. Uh, so, so that dramatically decreases cost. We don't need to pay extra phlebotomists. We don't need to buy new vacutainers just for research purposes and all those types of things. Uh, we just piggyback on the whole clinical system. And even a million people in our context, when we have three and a half million members, you know, if a million is recruited over, you know, a couple of years, that's relatively small because we collect 25,000 blood samples every day, you know, from our members. Uh, Hacken, and then a question there and a question there. Yeah, we, uh, we, we collect uh, uh, somewhere between 350 and 400 samples every week. And uh, we isolate DNA right away. We store away plasma. We isolate PBM cells and put them away. And the whole package of that, plus a link to electronic record, would be way under $100 per patient. Well, that's, and then, of course, there's some maintenance cost. Of yeah, we estimate that. about 20 on the processing end. Yeah, and that's we're in the it. same price range, about 100, between 100 and 200. Um, and we have some good data on the, the, the efficiency within each, each clinic, and that's the incremental cost of getting things in. 
the cost of phenomics core, informatics core, computing environment, those are all uh, n not included in, uh, it's, you know, some elements of, of it are, but the, 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 build, the necessary build out to support the science side of things is, is, uh, going to, is a non-trivial cost as well. So there's a question or comment over there. Uh, my name is George Hill from Vanderbilt. Um, my question deals in, with the issue of overpopulation of underrepresented groups, which was one of the points that was mentioned from the survey, the, the questionnaire. And I'm sure this will come up in session three, which deals with ensuring inclusion. But you all are developing and have cohorts. How are you addressing that issue? I, was, I grew up in Camden, New Jersey, and Philadelphia is a suburb of Camden. And I, well, I think it is. But seriously, uh, and I was impressed with the, the demographics that you mentioned. But how are you dealing with that issue if it's an important issue that one would like to see in your cohorts? Okay. So the, the, the vast majority, that's a weakness of our biobank. The vast majority of our patients, 70% of them are from Minnesota, so it's predominantly Caucasian. So we've gone to our sites in Arizona and Florida deliberately to overrepresent Hispanic and African American populations. So we're deliberately collecting uh, 5,000 Hispanics in Maricopa County in Phoenix to. Uh, address that issue, but it is, it is one of the weaknesses. Yeah, uh, the Geisinger Clinic is, is very similar. Um, it, the, I should say, we're trying to sample as much as we can of the minority populations, but the reality is that the, the region in Pennsylvania that it covers is not particularly diverse. And so, for research purposes, one of the things that we try to do is to partner with other healthcare systems and universities that have more diverse populations so that we can look to see if things that we're finding in a relatively homogeneous population will generalize to those other populations. But unfortunately, it's the demographic of the, the region that we live in. Marshall, I mean, just a comment, the in, in, in yeah. UK Biobank, you, uh, in, the, in the UK, we, we recruited in different places. Um, when we recruited in, in Scotland, we got Lots of Scots, which you know, <laughs> <laughs> Pro probably won't be really very relevant to the UK soon um, because they want to leave us. <laughs> but when we located the recruitment in you, particular parts of London, we got l very high uh, um, recruitment from minority groups. So it's not that each component needs to be representative, I think, going back to this point. It's about the, the whole cohort. Yeah. So, so I'll just say you know, that that is something that we've certainly struggled with in terms of enrolling people into our research program in genes environment health at uh, in KP Northern California, as well as as we're thinking of expanding it to all the other KP regions uh, to become the KP Research Bank. Uh, the people who did participate in the RPGH, while we do have sizable numbers of African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, they particularly the African Americans and to some extent the Hispanics, are somewhat underrepresented re relative to our membership. Uh, and so that is something that we really do want to really figure out how we can do better. Um, I will make the point as well that people who are difficult to enroll into a, pop, into a cohort are also difficult to follow. Mm. Uh, and so, so they potentially you know, compromise the long-term validity of of, of what happens, uh, and that so we need to work both on the initial recruitment as well as the long-term retention. So in the in the Million Veteran Program, we have very good African American representation, about 17 percent. Which in our 380,000, we have, you know, somewhere around 65,000 African Americans recruited, and we recruit proportionate to the representation of the, the of the source population. So I'm told we've got less than five minutes. So uh, question there. I'll, I'll make it brief, but uh, this is Mina Shung. I'm here with the White House. And, uh, you know, you guys have an incredible breadth of experience, and, and each of you has sort of highlighted the extent to which trust is local, engagement is local, the stories that make people interested in participation are about their friends and family um, and, and their providers. And I guess um, a question for the broader success of this nationally is what stories and what key drivers for participation have you experienced and do you wish could be elevated to the national stage? What stories from your system would really help, you know, drive engagement across the country um, and could be utilized by other providers in other areas that, that might not have the same resources or could be used, you know, 
for people who are not associated with a provider or whose providers are not choosing to engage. Um, thank you. I mean, one of the comments that was made about was about working together, we can do better, um, was made earlier, but I don't know if others want to... Uh, Keith? You know, we've we found that those individual patient stories are very powerful, and whether it's, you know, the depressed patient who finds out they're a hypermetabolizer of their antidepressant, that's why it's not working, whether it's a rare disease child who's gone 18 years without a diagnosis and then finds a solution, or whether it's a cancer patient who finds a novel vulnerability, which is... Uh, response to chemotherapy. Those have been the individual patient stories that have, have resonated, I think, uh, with, our, with our practice. So our, what, our, what about the trust issue, the, um, the, 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 kind of the trust national versus trust local? Um. I, I was just going to say that our, our, you know, our, the, the community is both local and, then, 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 and it's the concentric circles of community. There's the community with your doctor and then your, your local VA and your local VFW post, and then with the VA system at large, and, and, and then with the broader community. And I think there can be some transference of that uh, sense of community um, to a, a, a larger effort. We talked to our community advisory uh, group about this initiative, and they were like, yes, why wouldn't we want to try to do this? You know, they were really excited about it. Not only are they local, you know, going back to what you said, they're also looking at the broader picture and know that everyone needs to come together to do this. So they're very supportive. I'm just going to take a question over there and a question over there, uh, uh, and then I think we probably better break. Um. So uh, I'm Liz Millwood from Australia, and uh, with regard to the one million, um, probably very small. So in terms of global inclusiveness, I'd like to know about how, how people are thinking. So you have a beautiful system already with the Human Genome Project, the NCBI, run through the NIH, through the United States leading this, but open to, to um, EMBL and all the other uh, Japan initiatives that were able to tap in and link into this. So can we be doing this in a more global way, first of all? And secondly, uh, when we're thinking of patient groups, all the previous initiatives a lot of the time are hampered by not having really powerful control groups because you don't tend to get the follow-up and the detailed information on your control groups. And so, again, how can we also make sure that community groups and control groups are included? Um, so, yeah, I think thinking globally is really important, and I, I think many of us have been doing that in our particular um, projects and networks that we've been involved in. I, I know certainly in the pharmacogenomics research network and the eMERGE network that I'm a, a part of, you know, we've been collaborating with folks at Genome Netherlands and people at the RIKEN in Japan, and, you know, being able to kind of collect the cohort, cohort of cohorts makes all the analyses more powerful. So as much as we've been saying, you know, we can do better together within the U.S., we can do better together if we collaborate with other similar cohorts around, around the world. Um, and then the other point about controls, I think um, part of what an EHR gives you, especially with controls, and we've seen this a lot in the eMERGE network, is you know, healthy people go to the doctor too, every year or two or three years for their routine physicals. And so you can much more definitively say that someone is a control if you have 10 or 15 years of data to show that they don't have any conditions or maybe they have one condition but they don't have any of these others. And we've seen that, especially with things like autoimmune disease, we've been able to do association studies with much smaller data sets because we know that the cases are the, that type of disease because we have their record, we can rule out that the MS cases are MS, they're not lupus, they're not rheumatoid arthritis, they're MS. And the controls have absolutely no evidence of any autoimmune for the last 15 years. And so I think having that longitudinal data really does enable you to get controls. Now, it's still a biased control in that they will still be people that choose to go to the doctor. You know, some healthy people don't go to the doctor. And so we will miss those. But of people who routinely go for physical exams, we would have those data. So Hacken, and then we'll go to the last question. Oh, sorry, not Hacken, uh, uh, Larry, I beg your pardon. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah I was going to basically make that same comment, but I think that one of the things that we do have to be aware of when we talk about EHR data is that the data are there because people came in 
to see a provider or to communicate with a provider or whatever. So, so they are inherently biased in that sense. So confounding by indication is a big issue when dealing with our data that may not be in sort of the traditional cohort context where you're actively collecting data and following people in a uniform fashion, et cetera. So, so I think that, you know, obviously I think there's great opportunity in our settings, but there's also, they, they, things need to be interpreted appropriately. I think when we, I think we do have the opportunity to have, you know, the uh, controls or whatever people without conditions of interest uh, uh, in our settings and for exactly the reasons that were just outlined. Uh, so I think that that's something that we can do. And I'll just mention that Maccabee Healthcare is part of the HMO Research Network, um, and we're talking about with them about trying to get them into the Cancer Research Network as well. Keith, uh, you wanted to add a quick comment? Well, just real fast. It just, it, we were a bit conscious of this control set, and so we've deliberately targeted uh, patients coming in for obstetric problems, orthopedic problems, nicotine dependency. These are not patients coming for treatment of... Um, a subspecialty disease, their primary care or otherwise, or healthy, on our executive health program. Final question. Comment. Suma Muralidar from the VA. Uh, it's great to hear that, you know, all of the groups here are interested. I'm just curious about um, the reconsenting. I'm not, I know we haven't nailed down the specifics of the design, but I'd like to hear from all the groups uh, whether they think that they will need to reconsent to become a bigger, to uh, become part of the bigger cohort. Let me Thank answer you. that, and then I'll let other people answer. I mean, it, it seems to me that there is a bit of a, a straw man between this new cohort and old cohorts, that one is building a new cohort within existing systems. Um, if it's going to be a resource that can be used for all kinds of different research by all kinds of different people, it's going to have to have a new consent for those million people. It's going to have to have a new set of core data and samples, I think, for those million people over and above all of the richness of the data that exists within the healthcare system. But that's my view. Uh, other, uh, Peggy. I think that, with, at least with Marshfield's population, I think that we can hit the ground running if we use the already consented individuals. And then, as time goes on, then reconsent. If we have to stop and reconsent everyone right now, this will take a long time. So, from Marshfield, our cons consent is such that we can contribute to the research portion of this. But we would have to reconsent if we wanted to actually integrate this um, information back into clinical care and get CLIA certified lab results. So, so. Uh, so we have made uh, every attempt to uh, make this very explicit in our informed consent and to ensure that the families, they understand that any data generated or sample obtained can be shared uh, for, you know, for sort of public good. And, and, uh, and there's a specific box that uh, the parents are going to have to check and, and the uh, uh, individuals uh, have to check if they authorize that. For Geisinger, I think it, it will obviously depend on the very specific details of the cohort, but I'm not convinced that we will have to reconsent. Um, our patients, our participants have been consented broadly for research, for recontact, for um, use of any omics or sample data that we have, for data sharing within the research, for contributing to um, dbGaP or other public um, data sources, as well as returning the results and returning the results to the, the EHR. So it's possible that there might be some specifics that when our IRB looks at it, it turns out we do have to reconsent. But um, because of other ongoing research projects, we actually just reconsented the cohort. And, and so I think that at this point, it largely consented for what it sounds like would happen here. Good. Okay, well, uh, I think um, uh, I... Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Kathy. Yeah. Roy, I was just going to say that we're running late, and so when we break, we can take until uh, 11.15. Yeah, thank you very much, Kathy. So I th um, we're, we're running late because uh, no one should let me uh, chair a panel. Um, uh, but, but I wanted to thank the, the panel, actually, for contributing huge, uh, hugely to, to this conversation and discussion. Uh, I think a lot of things came out of it. Um, 
Uh, and uh, with the final comments on consent, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be contradicted. I plan to move to the, the US to do my research. It sounds a lot more straightforward. So we have uh, till 10, we have till 11.15 um, to come back and, and reconvene. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is uh, Say Katharason, and uh, I'm a preventive cardiologist at Mass General Hospital and a human genetics researcher. Uh, thank you for being here. We're going to start our second session, uh, which is going to focus on the issue of recruitment and research cohorts in, in, in general. Um, our panelists today are Dr. Danny Benjamin, uh, who's the chair of the Pediatric Trials Network and faculty associate director of the Duke Clinical Research Institute at Duke University. Dr. Eric Borwinkle, um, who's the uh, uh, chair of the Department of Human Genetics and Epidemiology at the University of Texas and associate director of the Human Genome Sequencing at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Will Deere, who's executive director of Personalized Health, uh, co-director of the Center for Clinical and Translational Science at the University of Utah School of Medicine. And Dr. Susan Gapster, who's vice president of epidemiology at the American Cancer Society. And then lastly, Dr. Uh, Jeff Olgan, who's the chief of the Division of Cardiology at, um, and co-director of the Heart and Vascular Center at UCSF and principal investigator of the Heart uh, eHealth Study. So thank you to all. Um, a, a, moment, uh, a couple of comments before the first uh, question, I guess. Uh, the first workshop uh, about a month ago, we really focused on kind of why should we do this project. And I think now we're turning to uh, several questions. One is, who should we recruit? Um, second is, how and where should we recruit? And then thirdly, uh, what baseline information and biosamples should be collected in each participant? And then how will we prospectively ascertain health outcomes? And then lastly, how will we manage the data? So this session is really about questions two and, two, two and four, um, how and where should we recruit? And then how will we prospectively um, ascertain health outcomes? And in that context, we just heard a lot about uh, doing this recruitment within the context of healthcare systems. And now we're turning to the idea of doing this recruitment within um, research cohorts. And so you may be wondering, what are, what's the difference? What are research cohorts? And here I think the idea is one model of a research cohort is the, uh, the Framingham Heart Study or the Atherosclerosis Risk and Community Study, kind of traditional observational epidemiologic uh, studies. But there are several other ideas in terms of what research cohorts could mean, including um, Jeff's most recent study in terms of the uh, the, the eHeart study. Um, so that's, that's kind of just, just to set the stage. May the first uh, question I think we'd like to maybe get to is um, this idea of uh, using existing research cohorts. And so maybe we can have each of the um, panelists address the issue of what are the barriers and potential solutions to expanding the scope of your existing cohorts to allow them to be part of the precision medicine cohort. Maybe start with uh, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Sec. Um, so we view the question a little bit differently in that we set out about two years ago to build a platform to create a totally decentralized electronic cohort where we could pull in medical records, patient reported outcomes, sensor data, smartphone data, et cetera. Um, we even have a, a patient slash participant advisory board on the steering committee, um, and we set a goal of enrolling a million people. Um, and so it would be very easy for us to transform what we've done into doing this, whether it's with our existing 30,000 participants or just replicating the, the way we do online consent and, and some of those things. So um, since the, what we set out two years, to do, two years ago to kind of do, I think it would be very easy to morph that into the precision medicine. We collect biospecimens as well. So the pieces are there. It's just a question of scale. So barriers to contributing. I think the American Cancer Society has been running cohorts for um, several decades. And our, our newest cohort that we just completed recruit, recruitment of is probably the one that we've consented the most broadly in the sense that it does allow for data sharing and biospecimen sharing, um, but under the guidelines of our data sharing policies and procedures, um, which really, when I think about that as a barrier, it's more that these really become case-by-case, research-question-by-research-question, 
versus a contribution to a larger pool where we lose that control. Um, so that's, I think, an important piece that we would need to grapple with. I'll provide just some background first about the, um, the setup at the University of Utah, which works very closely with um, Intermountain Healthcare, which you just heard about at the last session. Um, and in the early 1980s, the, by executive order in the state of Utah, um, a Utah population database um, was set up. Um, and what it is, is it is a vir it's a virtual database linked with um, a variety of existing databases, Utah Department of Health, the electronic health records of Intermountain Healthcare and the University of Utah, Cancer, Utah Cancer Registry, Driver's License Bureau, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an extensive network of data contributors. And the database itself is um, the um, uh, addresses right now contains a nearly 8 million uh, patients and um, has about 20, nearly 30 million different records. So kind of that's the background. External stakeholders for each of the data contributors actually sit on a monthly basis and review incoming research protocols. Okay, therefore, to answer your question, um, Sec, uh, you can, if you have a particular type of disease pedigree or like that you are interested in, the, um, the, uh, this particular stakeholder leadership group considers that, has the proposal reviewed by an IRB, and therefore then um, the a particular problem um, can be addressed. Let's say I'm interested in osteoporosis and familial osteoporosis, and you can do it in that way. The Utah Genealogic Society is a huge contributor because families play such an important role in Utah. So there is an extensive record, genealogic um, a database record that has been involved in discovering BRCA1, APC, et cetera, et cetera. So you can look at particular diseases and the hope, therefore, is you can identify disease-causing um, um, variants. Therefore, um, I see no barriers as long as that particular process, namely external data contributors being able to review a particular proposal, um, is, is kept in place because that has been established by executive order. And I need not tell this audience the power of families to be able to look for, to look for the importance of, of rare variants, which obviates, I, I would say not obviates, it is actually very complementary to the much larger a million person, two million person cohorts that can be done using GWAS data. Thank you, Eric. So like the others, I'll, I'll first step back and put the answer in context is, I view that there are sort of three sources of information or, or recruitment for this million, and my own opinion is probably needs to be larger than a million cohort. Um, the first is healthcare networks. The second are population-based samples, and the third are disease groups, disease-focused groups, particularly for rare conditions. And, and each of those are going to have strengths and weaknesses. And, and I think at the end of the day, this precision medicine cohort itself, not just the database structure, but the cohort itself will be a federated or confederated model of these various um, ascertainment mechanisms, if you will. And they'll all fit under a single umbrella, which we call the cohort. And that's, that's really not unusual. If you look at the existing population-based cohorts themselves, in fact, it's not a homogeneous sampling. It's, it's, it, has, it, it has strata. And so, so we're, we're used to that. And so if you, you look at the, the advantages and disadvantages of population-based cohorts, the, one is that they're going to have very detailed phenotyping and hundreds of millions of dollars in investment to get that phenotyping that would be available to the precision medicine cohort be available today. And so in the words that I've used, I think it's one mechanism to seed this cohort so we could have early results. The second is there's a lot of interest in, in you know, sort of e-phenotyping. And the, the existing population cohorts are one way to validate you know, very cost-effective e-phenotyping. So we'll have a gold standard, if you will. The gold is in quotes now. We'll have a gold standard of which we can compare back to, which I think has some advantages. I think the other is going to be ethnic diversity. Um, 
now with, with, if you look across the NCI and NHLBI, we have very rich ethnic diversity. My own opinion is I'm, I'm actually much less worried. This is probably not a politically correct thing to say. I'm much less worried about ethnic diversity and, and ethnic inclusion. I'm very worried about um, socioeconomic inclusion. We've become a very stratified society of haves and have nots. And I'd be very worried about ascertaining only through a mechanism that gets the haves and we leave the have nots out of the study. That would be a mistake um, for many, many reasons. And I, I think finally is the, the, the quote population based cohorts have, a, have an enormous infrastructure and an enormous expertise base that they would offer um, the, the PMI. And, and I think you'll see that they're very well, you know, ready, willing, and, and able to do that. There are many disadvantages, including the age structure. Uh, the current cohorts don't have a, a very broad age structure. I also think many of them are, have aged themselves, if you will, and uh, like the investigators have aged. And, <laughs> and so um, we'll, we'll need to revisit and, 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 and augment various <coughs> age groups. And looping back, as I've said, both clinic-based and population-based, we're, we're going to miss rare and low-frequency conditions, which are extremely important that we can't leave out. And that's where we could bring in these disease-focused um, or disease-oriented groups to supplement. Danny? Thank you. Uh, so uh, first of all, my, my apologies. I, although I love visiting Vanderbilt, there is something in this zip code that Every time I land at the airport, I know I'm an hour away from a hacking cough. So I just want to <laughs> reassure my colleagues up here, it's not contagious. It just happens to me every time I fly in. Yeah, yeah. all right. That's awesome. Uh, so I would say just based on my experience, just a couple of things. As the director of the Peace Trials Network, our responsibility is to collect PK and safety data from all off patents and children of all ages in multi-center trials and then submit those data to FDA for labeling. And a lot of times we would like to collaborate with other folks who've already done the trials because redoing the trials is of course unethical. Uh, but of course you have to get permission from those colleagues to submit the data to FDA and we say, gee, this wouldn't be too bad, we've got some money, here's this data use agreement. Uh, you can send to these humans who couldn't provide informed consent uh, because they're pre-verbal. Uh, so you might like to have them benefit um, and uh, we'll never publish from it. All we'll ever do is send the data to FDA and uh, here's, I don't know, two, three, four times your cost. I don't care. Uh, whatever you need, I'm willing to negotiate. And the number of times people say no has been impressive. Uh, it falls into three groups. Uh, group uh, number one um, says yes, and it just, like, we'll get data out of the back of the trunk of somebody's car, literally, the gospel truth, and uh, they, they, they just want to collaborate. They just, they just want to partner and see the right thing happen to the data. About one-third of the people just say, you know what, tick off. My data, can't have it. No. Nope. Uh, and by the way, some of these were uh, federally funded in the era before uh, NIH required data sharing. They're NIH funded studies. No. No, we're not giving you the data. Uh, and then one third um, kind of combines both. Uh, they say yes, but then they'll put up a series of hurdles that are so painful that they involve a signature from um, my great, 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 great grandmother, plus her Bible and her blood, uh, and a bunch of other things through 18 different subcommittees who might eventually consider the request. So my experience has been that if you actually want uh, people uh, at the party to truly share data, uh, have it written into the law. Uh, and have it tied to any dollars that they're going to get and have it tied to any participation that they're going to get. Um, and as far as our data is concerned, um, we just, uh, I got so sick of this that we just started posting it on the web. We got NIH approval, we got IRB approval, and we just started uh, putting it up. Great. So, Jeff, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh the model that you've established in terms of electronic consent and getting the information directly from the participants, um, particularly, you know, the idea of, I mean, how are you planning to get health outcomes in your 
a cohort that's basically been recruited through um, through uh, an app. Yeah, so let me start with the consent. So we worked very hard with our IRB to break down the usual consenting barriers. So everything is done electronically. We've set it up modularly. So the, the main consent uh, allows us to contact the, the person electronically or by phone or by mail, uh, pretty much about anything. Um, it allows us to deliver surveys on you know, any scale, daily or weekly or monthly, um, either through their smartphone or through their tablet or through a, a desktop. Um, and it allows us to invite them to participate in either randomized intervention trials or other sub-cohort observational studies. Um, and it allows us to invite them to um, other modular consent. So for example, uh, for everybody who has a Fitbit, they can sign a consent that's very simple, that doesn't repeat the entire Bill of Rights um, and the privacy policy that's you know, basically three, three lines uh, that lets them know exactly what they're doing and they can refer back to the, the main consent. Um, so everything is very modular. Um, the second thing we've done is um, we've now worked with uh, a couple of existing cohorts. So we're doing data collection, a pilot for Framingham. We're doing another pilot with the cancer, uh, Childhood Cancer Survivors Network, uh, a couple of DCRI studies where um, those people are already consented in those cohorts, but they use our consent, our existing consent, without having to go through the entire IRB process to, data, to, to do data collection on our platform. And um, uh, there's a, a, another modular consent that basically acknowledges, the participant acknowledges and agrees to the two groups sharing the data. Mm -hmm. So the Framingham participant says, yes, Healthy Heart can see Framingham data, and Framingham can see data they're, they'll be collecting in, in Healthy Heart. And then we've established a very simple um, way to cross-reference between those two studies that's sort of blind to the, to the participant uh, just by using code in the, in the links the way we mark them. Um, so the consenting process has been very smooth and, and straightforward and, and simple. Um, the medical records and outcomes, so we wanted to, to do this as a you know, very rigorous um, epidemiologic study. Uh, and so most of the things we release for data collection, we validate. We either use validated instruments or it, we're in the middle of completing a Fitbit validation study <coughs> or validating against Actograph in free living environments, for example. So most of the things we validate um, in some way or another. Um, in terms of medical records, uh, we have kind of three ways to get medical records. Uh, one is uh, we can integrate with systems if systems allow us, but the, the problem is not a technological one, it's a bureaucratic one. So uh, we've integrated anybody who happens to be in the UC system, we can get through uh, a, a federated, integrated, UC-wide medical record system. Um, it's not complete yet, but the process is underway. Um, but we have participants from all over the world. In fact, the minority are from a UC system. So the second way we do it is in about a week, we'll re be releasing some technology that we just developed to allow people to connect their patient portal from about 2,000 different systems around the country. Uh, and it's just like connecting their Fitbit. They go in, they provide us their credentials for their portal in a secure way. Um, and every 24 hours, we pull CCDA data from their records. For those systems that don't have blue button capabilities, we do screen scraping. So we can pull records from Kaiser, we can pull records from partners, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then the third way um, is, uh, so we have a PCORI grant, which is how we've established the patient-centered aspect of it um, and the patient steering committee. Um, and Part of this is that we're now part of PCORnet. So we'll be doing some pilots in the coming months where we'll be working with the CDRNs, these are the large networks of medical records that many of the previous panel are actually part of. Um, and so we'll be able to go in to those people who are not consented participants, they're just 
They have the records. They have their contact information. <coughs> so through the same cross-reference system that I talked about that we're using with Framingham and the other things, we'll be able to invite these people to participate in this cohort and cross-reference to their data in the CDRN and thereby get medical record data. So those are the three approaches we're using for medical records. And then we've taken other approaches for ascertaining outcomes. So uh, in our app, we have the ability to detect hospitalizations in the US. Uh, and then we get self-report data about those hospitalizations in, in time proximity to discharge. So about an hour after discharge that we can detect, uh, we ping them to get additional information. So based on GPS, or you, yeah, yeah, we've developed a, a unique system on the back back end. To so if they just walk into them. a hospital, then they get a, or do they have to be there for a little while? They or? have to be there for a little <laughs> while, and we don't ping them until after we've detected that they've left the hospital. We don't want to bug them while they're in the hospital. Obviously. <laughs> um, uh, so that's that's one way. Uh, we've also deployed a number of sort of intermediate outcome assessments. So we've just finished for the cardiologists in the crowd. We just finished an app that delivers a, you know, a, a six-minute walk test at home uh, that very highly correlates to an in-clinic test. So we can use that for intermediate outcomes. Um, other validated patient-reported outcomes we use as intermediate outcomes that we can deliver daily, for example. We can do you know, quick two-question surveys about symptom intensity or mood or you know, PHQ2, et cetera. Great. Um, just jump around here. A couple of other items came to mind as people were talking. So, Danny, the, one of the questions that the group has been wrestling with is children and in, in inclusion of children or not. And the UK Biobank, for example, I think the, the age range is from 40 onwards. Um, do you want to speak to the idea of this, this issue? Sure. I, I, um, I think uh, I'll be politically uh, correct as usual. I think... Um, that uh, in addition to being ethically challenged, uh, if one were to include, uh, exclude children, uh, it'd be, um, it'd be a, there's so much to disease that's set up in childhood that if you're trying to understand the human experience without um, understanding what happens in childhood, it's a bit like um, saying, gosh, we're going to hit this iceberg here on the Titanic Let's everyone go rearrange the deck chairs. Um, it's, it's from behavior to heart disease to obesity to um, psychiatric illnesses to that set up uh, in childhood, uh, notwithstanding uh, the background of education and social problems. Uh, there are challenges to studying um, in children to doing studies in children. And you just simply need to be dedicated to looking at things a little bit differently and to thinking uh, creatively. You know, for example, why is it that the vaccine rate in childhood is so much higher than it is in adults? You know, we're not, we're not compensated more for that. We're not smarter than internists. We're not more dedicated. Um, well, we linked it to schools. You know, that's, an, that's a creative approach. You want to go to school, you get a vaccine. Um, if you uh, had to, um, uh, in order to eat at a restaurant, if you had to get a vaccine, the vaccine rate in adults would be 100%. <laughs> um, so it, it'll take some creativity to do it. You might want to enroll families, but we made this mistake before when we developed the Food and Drug Administration a little over 100 years ago. You know, if you were a drug company, um, you could market your drugs as long as you said, this hasn't been tested in children, don't use it here. Do you really want to be a part of a national study that says this information is great for Americans, but don't use it for children? So uh, whether it's linking enrollment to schools, partnering with schools, doing something creative with families, enrolling family groups, uh, it's an imperative both scientifically, ethically, um, historically, and if you actually want to understand um, human uh, physiology and development. Yeah, please, yeah. So 
One, one thing to think about is if you look back, the, the population studies in children, I'm thinking of Tecumseh in Michigan, um, Muscatine in Iowa, Bogalusa in Louisiana. I'm not sure if Olmstead County had a childhood component or not. All of those studies were done long before social media. And we really have a dearth of data about the development of risk factors and risk behaviors in children in 2015. Right. And I really think leveraging social media today for the precision medicine cohort is an opportunity to, number one, collect data on young people, and number two, and we haven't talked too much about it, is you know, Facebook-like mechanisms of data collection is something we probably need to pay attention to and leverage uh, more, both in young people and adults and in the elderly. Eric, uh, maybe just to follow up on terms of general idea of uh, recruiting from within the existing population-based cohorts. One of the, the themes that's emerged uh, the last few days, of course, or last few workshops, has been electronic medical record. So, you know, I was a, a fellow at Framingham for a couple of years um, about a decade ago, and the participants from Framingham live all over the country, not just in Framingham now. So the question is, how how, how do you envision linking to the EMRs uh, for health outcome determination in those kind of individuals? So most of the studies, the large population studies, have annual or I'll just use the word periodic content with the study participants, Eric, Framingham, Cardio, whatever. And, and they ascertain outcomes first usually in a, in a telephone interview right. or in a face-to-face -face examination. Then if there has been a hospitalization or a major health care event, they get permission to extract or get copies of those electronic medical records and then do further phenotyping based on information in the medical record that can't be obtained by the participant themselves. I would say in addition, outcomes are ascertained through payer, payer databases. Um, Medicare, Medicaid, what have you. And that's another very, very valuable um, source of information. And we could, you know, there have been whole conferences on the strengths and weaknesses of payer oriented data. But nonetheless, I'm sure the precision medicine, medicine cohort will somehow um, leverage payer information. I think the other outcome um, source of information that we, we should spend more time talking about are, are sort of biomarkers of outcomes. I think we need to think about either electronic or biologic measures of both exposures on one side and outcomes on the other. It's, it's, it tends to be um, less biased and it's probably again something that we have not fully leveraged. So there's multiple sources. The EMR is only one of them and, and once again I think um, I believe it, it was Mike who said, you know, if we're looking for a one-size-fits-all, I, I think this cohort's going to fall short. We're going to need to think about um, heterogeneous solutions to a very complex set of problems. And I think it, we should all move away from just sort of looking for a silver bullet. This, I don't think the silver bullet exists in, in any study design or any source of outcomes. It's going to be multiple sources of information. Susan? So um, cancer, it, you know, people kind of probably think it's a little bit easier because there are tumor registries that we can link to. But something that, you know, I know that we have been pushing for for probably uh, over 15 years and, you know, nationally there are efforts to do is, you know, every state has a tumor registry. And um, in order for us to ascertain cancer outcomes in our cohorts, we have to apply to each one of those state tumor registries, which is a whole lot of work and um, a whole lot of effort. And each of them have, I think, you know, we heard about variation in terms of the levels of um, approval. And, you know, sometimes it's really easy and sometimes it takes months, if not years, to get one year worth of cancer registry linkage. So I think that that's something that needs to be solved. Um, that similar to what was solved at, um, through the National Death Index, um, there's no reason, in my opinion, and I know that this goes state by state and that there's states that would contribute to something like this and states <laughs> that wouldn't. Um, but it would certainly go a long ways to move the research along faster um, in terms of cancer. 
And I think that that would be true, you know, for any of the large cancer cohorts or, or even the small or any cohorts. And I think when I think about the cardiovascular disease cohorts, you guys um, have done a lot more active follow-up on, right. on a um, probably more frequent basis. Um, we, in our, the cancer prevention cohorts, uh, in, our, in our cancer prevention study two, we follow our participants every two years with a survey. Uh, and update their exposure information and get the first step of a cancer diagnosis self-report and then we verify it. Uh, and in CPS3, that's going to be every third, three years approximately because they're younger and we don't anticipate the cases to accrue quite as quickly. But when I think about cohorts, our goal is cancer research and so we don't verify any other disease endpoints. So when I think about your outcome question, uh, it's a, it's one thing that we would have to think carefully about right. in our cohort, because our participants enrolled because they were motivated to participate in cancer, cancer research. Right. Jeff? Uh, one other thing I'd like to just um, pick up where that's something Susan mentioned, which um, I just want to make sure everybody on the committee kind of, I want to highlight it, which is in order to really do this right, I think there's going to need to be some legislative or other kind of national policy type things that will enable these things to be done much easier. So the, the, the tumor registry, I think, is a really concrete example of that. But even just around um, uh, meaningful use and how patient portal data and the types of data that is mandated to get in there and the percentages of, of patients in a, in a particular system that are on the patient portal is another thing. Um, things around the, the rapidity with which things get reported to the National Death Index probably needs to be fixed. Um, legislation, legislation around how uh, insurance, non-Medicare and non-VA insurance, um, you know, creating some sort of national database that, that is queryable in, a, in a, you know, a consented patient in an effort like this. I think those are all sort of pieces that um, probably need to happen, and you know, the 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 British um, you know biobank is an example of how having a national health system enables that. We don't have a national health system, so we we might need to sort of fix pieces of it to to enable these things to happen. Well, and Jeff and Jeff's comment about um, a type of executive order is relevant for the state of Utah, because in the Utah population database, it was the executive order of the governor in the early 1980s that linked the Utah, and actually it was worked at the, the Idaho cancer registries to the various other linked databases, the Electronic Health Record, the Genealogic Society, and the like. So I concur with, with both of your comments, and I mean, it can be done. I think the question is at a, at a national level what can be done, but it certainly has occurred at the state level. So I kind of address a similar issue in terms of quality. Um, and again, as we think about, uh, you know, having had worn on my hat a little bit in the cardiovascular side for a short time um, and now in the cancer side for a much longer time, um, I've really seen a difference in terms of biospecimen collection. And, you know, when we have these large 100 to 300, 400,000 or million person cohorts, the biospecimen collection is a very different animal than it is in a cardio or a mesa, where the protocols are very strict, um, you know, often require fasting, um, where in, for example, our cancer prevention study two, participants went to their physician, got their blood draw, um, and, you know, sometimes it ended up in a, a mail carrier before it got to the processing and wasn't processed until 24 to 48 hours later. So the, the kinds of analyses that can be done across all these different large population studies um, may be different and have to be just kind of thought about and thought through. So um, kind of thinking and making sure that that gets well annotated is probably going to be important. And also something that was said earlier in the previous session was thinking about returning results back to participants. Um, and again, requiring that CLIA approval is really, really important before you can do that. And many of at least our existing cohorts, you know, we've done DNA um, uh, analyses and pretty high Encore Ray level analyses on you know, thousands upon thousands of our CPS2 participants. We have lots and lots of data. Um, whether 
in CPS2, we wouldn't return them. They're all over 90. Um, but, you know, that's the kind of thing we, in a research setting, probably to make sure from the get-go that they're done in laboratories with keeping in mind that it will be done, the data may be returned. Um, and that's something for CPS3 we would have to think about because in our consent we were very clear in saying results would not be returned to them. So um, maybe two more uh, brief questions or, and brief answers uh, from everybody before we open up to the floor. Uh, we have about uh, 25 minutes left. Um, one question that came up in the last session, which I'd like to get everybody's opinion on, is if uh, uh, individuals get recruited into the PMI, from, let's say, a perspective obs current existing prospective cohort, the idea of, of reconsenting um, to be able to get in. So maybe, Eric, you want to start? What, if you wanted to get Eric participants, ARIC participants, into this, would they need to be reconsented, from your, in your sure. opinion? I guess two things. One is, you know, I think the Eric study would be an enthusiast, and Eric study participants would be an enthusiastic, you know, participant in, in the precision medicine cohort for all the reasons that have already been discussed. That's number one. Number two is despite the rhetoric and our hard work to make our consent as generalizable as possible in terms of, um, you know, putting data in DB gap, sharing it with the industry, et cetera, my guess is if the committee and the NIH sets up a central IRB They'll gather all of these consents and look at them. My experience would dictate, and I've learned never to second-guess IRBs, but my prediction would be that they will ask us all to reconsent our study participants so they can participate in the precision medicine cohort. Jeff, is that your view as well? Um, yeah, I think that's right, although I think the, the type of consent um, can, can be looked at a little differently than what's typically done in reconsenting these large cohorts. So again, dep depending on the type of data you're collecting and, and who the cohort is you're dealing with, um, it could be an electronic consent that just sort of explains the, the new stuff. And I think that's, that's going to be the challenge in working with some of the IRBs and sort of getting them to that next step. And again, that's part of this legislation executive order thing is to to sort of move to the next stage of, of consent and human protection. Danny? Yeah, just because it's that way now doesn't mean that it has to be forever. And that goes back to legislation. Great. The other um, point I wanted to ask about is this. There was actually a, a report put together in 2004 um, when Dr. Collins had um, thought about generating a cohort back then. And we had a chance to look at that report um, from a panel similar to this one. And uh, in that, there was a mention of basically a baseline examination modeled after the traditional epi cohorts, which involved basically about three hours. The, the participant would come in, have a range of things done to them, including blood pressure and so forth. At that time, also, we'd get an ex uh, the blood drawn. Um, and so I wanted to ask each of you, is that the kind of model that you're thinking about? Certainly, Jeff, that's not what your cohort does now, but... Well, it actually is. I mean, we have sort of a hybrid, right? So... Uh, we we have the ability to very quickly cohort select. So we have an echo study we're doing. We invited, you know, everybody in the study within 150 miles of UCSF to come in to, to participate in this. And I think that this is going to have to be a hybrid model, either in, um, you know, specific diseases uh, or sub-cohorts. You're going to want very deep phenotyping that's going to require in-person testing. Um, or perhaps take a you know an NHANES on steroids approach where you have a van that roams the country all the time <laughs> and and people come in to get you know some some set of in person tests that is probably still cheaper than having you know five five sites located throughout the country that not everybody can really get to so I think there's hybrid models and ways to to collect things that. Now we can collect remotely, like blood pressure, for example. You don't necessarily need to come in to get blood pressure now. Um, but, you know, an echo, you still can't do at home. So I think it's going to need to be a hybrid approach. Any other comments on that question before we have uh, open it up to the, the group for discussion? Well, yeah, I, um, I think, so let's just make the assumption that we're going to proceed along a hybrid model. So just, just assumption. In a way, I think it's critical, as the panel writes, 
kind of whatever the specific proposal is to say what are the primary and secondary goals of what we want to accomplish. Right. It's, it's kind of hard for me to envisage exactly what the baseline assessments will be. It's, I mean, you're going to have age, height, weight, right. I think background, et cetera, et cetera. But we actually should have in mind what is, what is the end? What, what do we want to see? in two or three years? What do we want to see in five years? What do we want to see in, in 10 years? Very much like you would a particular protocol. Right. Because if we don't have some at least primary and secondary goals, we may miss, right? Because you can do the usual stuff. I think a model, um, I just read the UK Biobank proposal in terms of baseline assessment, that looks like a very good kind of age 40 to 69, looking for complex chronic disease. That's very, very good. Yet, if, and I say yet, if we include, which I favor, a pediatric group and the like, and we have a wonderful opportunity to look at neurocognitive development, development of, of neuropsychiatric disorders and the like in, in such a cohort, and you're going to have a different assessment. So I think on terms of the, I'll call it the national cohort core group, um, I, I believe we should really have, in a way that the UK Biobank wrote, very, very clear primary and secondary objectives and how they powered their, their enrollment um, and the like. With respect to the other part of the hybrid, if you have disease specific, it, again, it kind of depends. Um, at, you know, looking at our individual disease specific pedigrees and families and the like, pretty careful phenotyping is done. These, these, these families are brought to, to attention through the academic medical center. So, you know, there, there is substantive clinical and careful phenotyping I'm done already. So I think it kind of depends. So questions from the audience? You can step to the microphone. Yeah, please. I uh, somebody step would, I think it would be cost prohibitive. So I, I really think from the get-go we're probably going to have to avoid a a face-to-face -face baseline mm -hmm. examination. I, I see that it would add not months but perhaps years to the planning process <laughs> and it would add dollars that probably begin with a B to, to the price. And so I think from the get-go, we're going to have to leverage much more <laughs> cost-effective ways of ascertaining and collecting clinical data. I would love to see such a thing. I just think it, it, it could really um, impede the launch of this if we went that direction. A question from the audience or from the group? Yes. <coughs> Sir. Um, actually, I think I have a cost-effective way for you. Um, as Gina mentioned in the um, presentation, she talked about the RFIs. Um, <coughs> blood centers are very uh, cost-effective. They already have physical sites and mobile sites that they can go out to the community. And um, in terms of children, uh, what blood centers have been participating in is the National Marrow um, Registry such that they can collect a core blood from um, mothers uh, that just given birth and be able to uh, use that and bank that. But most, a lot of the times the core blood that they collect doesn't meet the guidelines of the registry and thus is usually discarded. That might be an opportunity to collect not only the mother sample but the, but the infant sample from the beginning and follow the mother infant and maybe even the father getting the, um, the families together to bring them um, through the longitudinal study. Um, one thing I wanted to say about children, um, and I'm really glad that the panel is um, uh, wanting uh, or perceiving that and children are very important to include in the study, is that we mentioned all kinds of neurological diseases and <coughs> other diseases that child, children get. But we also see a rise in cancer in children. So it would be very important to gather information from birth all the way through um, into adulthood to follow the environmental effects or any other effects that may have and that are contributing to the rise of children, cancer in children. And, they, and we've talked about enrolling children. Um, one obstacle might be not wanting to, the parents not wanting to enroll them. But actually, if we use the children's oncology group clinical trials as an example, that is a model system for clinical trials and since that over 80% of the children are enrolled in clinical trials, 
So that is the parents wanting to benefit um, not only their children, but society in general. So um, I'm very um, pleased that the panel is advocating for that. Thank you. Next question. Uh, my question deals with the uh, SES issue that uh, Dr. Borwinkle raised. Uh, I have two questions. One is, members of the panel, how many do you feel in general that this is a very important issue? Uh, inclusion of individuals from different SESs? And second, uh, how would you go about doing it? I'm sorry, I, I, I just didn't hear the first. Do you feel it's important? And I didn't hear that. And then I do heard, you, how would you do, go about doing that? So do, do you feel in all of the cohorts that you, you might be participating in or that you might be developing, that a wide variety of patients or individuals from different SESs uh, is important. And then, if so, how would you go about ensuring that that was the case in your cohort, and are you doing that now? So, for, so the short answer to the first question is yes, definitely. Uh, to the latter, um, a lot of our studies are concentrated in the neonatal uh, intensive care uh, units, which um, we actually have a, an extremely robust uh, track representation, record yeah. and representation. And um, if, if there are studies where you want to alter that, um, that's where you um, select um, more of your sites, but our uh, racial, ethnic, um, demographic breakdowns are um, r really uh, extremely diverse. I, I think that that's a reflection of the patient care that's administered in neonatal intensive care units. Um, but if we are targeting a greater, uh, for example, Hispanic uh, population, we include more of the large centers from uh, Texas and Southern California and, and Florida, and we use the data available to get to the patients that um, that, that, that we feel are the So, are. so um, to answer your question, yes, it's very important, and um, many publications have shown, and I think that that was stated earlier, that you know, education and insurance status are some of the strongest predictors of um, disease outcomes, and so that that's very Im important to. Um, try to ensure that level of inclusion. It's incredibly difficult, um, and even in our own newest cohort, while we've tried to set goals to be uh, have a broader level of inclusion um, by nature of our reach um, and who our volunteers are, they tend to be higher educated. And I would say that going if if we had it to do over again, we would have um, put that time in probably all on the front end in order to make sure that even towards the end of recruitment, we would have been able to have a lot more um, community engagement to assure the inclusion. Um, but these are tough lessons to learn. So Jeff, have you thought about this in your, because it, it's probably yeah. an acute issue for, yours, for you with a kind of an app-based recruitment, and this yeah. question must have come up. Yeah, it, 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 yes to the first question. We think it's very important. Um, as it turns out, if you look at the demographics of people that have cell phones, um, it is not what you'd expect. And in fact, the, the lower socioeconomic classes have smartphones at, at a pretty close rate as, as uh, the rest of society. Uh, and the fact that we don't require somebody to live near a particular study center, again, opens up the possibility. The challenge um, is that you need... Um, you need entirely different messaging and entirely different approaches to reach those populations. And while we have plans to do that, we just have not had funding. We've done everything based on institutional support. Um, and, you know, we have plans to work with our Center for, for um, uh, Underserved Populations and, and have all these plans to, to try these things out. But we have not done it yet. And, and our approach will eventually be to oversample those populations. 
Just to be able to get to the question, so Dan, um, we have and then two more so, after that. So the, a, a, sort of a notion or an idea that I've tried to pitch to Josh, and, and I'm not sure he's listened to me, so I have to say it out, out loud. Um, uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that I've heard this morning is, is this idea that you know, just about everyone's going to have to be reconsented, even, even if they're really deeply consented already, to participate. And then we've heard lots and lots of models of how people got into these various cohorts. They all feel 20th century to me. And so I, I, I would echo what Jeff says, and I would ask the, the, the working group to think about whether there are ways you can come up with to get people consented electronically, as, as Jeff has pointed out and others are adopting sort of a 21st century approach to consent, and whether, in fact, every single uh, center or every single person has to, be, has to have, go through their local IRB or whether there's a, a national IRB mechanism that you can create so there's one mechanism across the country that will allow people to be recruited. And then if you could combine the electronic consenting with a single IRB mechanism nationally, then you can get to 2 million or 5 million or whatever, uh, assuming you can have the capability of phenotyping them. Just, so that's just my a, suggestion to the working group. One, one quick pretty comment. Simple. Pretty simple. I think it's pretty one, simple. One quick comment about the consent. So um, the way we've approached enrollment of other cohorts into our cohort is as co-enrollment so that no institution needs an additional IRB approval mm. to enroll patients in ours. We just have a single IRB approval from UCSF <laughs> for, for everybody that enters our cohort, and we just link them. So there isn't this need to have 45 sites get IRB approval. Thank you. Um, I, um, I asked this question as a great fan of uh, the work represented on the panel. Um, but, um, you know, so much of what we are discussing will ultimately hinge on trust, and I think that point has been made already. And I, I just wonder, as one aspect of the, the whole trust uh, question, um, I'd like to know uh, what is your sort of nightmare scenario uh, for a breach, a security breach, a privacy breach, as the data and the, uh, the accumulation of the cohort flows through electronic health records, uh, existing uh, studies, cell phones, laptops, in a time where people worry about the possibilities of hacking into a pacemaker of a, a head of state or something like that and, and wreaking havoc, um, how can we assure uh, people that what we're embarking on here uh, will, in fact, not uh, make them more vulnerable, perhaps, than they already are or, or sense? that they might be. So we had a nightmare scenario about a year ago. I don't know if people have heard of Heartbleed, but Heartbleed was a, uh, was a bug that was found in about 90% of the internet. Um, uh, without getting into too much technical details, the, the secure socket, the HTTPS that everybody uses for secure URLs, um, the, the common way that that was coded uh, there was a hole in it. And so, you know, within about two hours, our security person sort of found out about this, shut everything down and figured out what, what if anything, was breached and really nothing was breached. Um, so the point of the story was that we had a nightmare episode for about an hour or two until we figured out really what was going on, as did almost the entire universe of the Internet. And that as long, I, my belief is that as long as we upfront acknowledge that there is this risk and that there's um, mechanisms in place that corporations and other things, banks that, that have just as sensitive data as what we have, there's really very little difference in the sensitivity of what we're collecting than what's already out there. And there's mechanisms for dealing with data security and data privacy. And that I would argue that that medicine, research, and healthcare is about 10 years behind where the, the rest of the industry really is, and we just need to get there. We have about five minutes left, and so one response, and then we're going to go Very to the last two comment. questions. I think, you know, first we have a, a national goal, a national initiative. I think one of the things we've heard both in the previous panel and this panel, we're going to have to have local solutions. So I think local solutions will help build the trust. Um, the nightmare scenario for me is very clear, um, and legislation won't help. If you've ever sat down and actually read a bill, 
usually the first or second sentence of any bill from Congress is they exempt the federal government from the law. <laughs> and so my nightmare scenario is that the FBI is going to call that there's a match of, from DB Gap of a DNA sequence from something they, they happen to be interested in. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're just going to have to work through these problems as, as we go forward. Two more questions. So uh, my name's Adam from the American Sleep Apnea Association, and uh, the real question for, for us and the patient is, as a representative of a few of the patients in the room is, overnight, Apple has changed the game uh, from a recruiting standpoint, and why we're talking about 20th century ideas. Uh, I know, Jeff, with Healthy Heart, you guys have got 27,000 patients enrolled and signed, but Apple did that in nine days. It took you guys three years. So if you look closely at what Apple's actually done, um, the, the current researchers don't actually have uh, access to the granular identified data, number one. Number two, the numbers that they're reporting are people who've actually gone into the App Store and downloaded the app. It's not, not consent. It's not data. Um, it's people who've actually gone to the App Store and if you follow, because I've talked to my colleagues at Stanford, if you follow the, the, the enrollment, it's sort of an opposite scenario from what we see. So what they saw was that when Apple made their announcement, there was a big surge, and then it sort of gradually dropped off. What we see actually is that we've had a couple of surges, either from press or some other things, and then there's this continued enrollment that occurs even between these little surges. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that Apple has changed the game. I think they have lowered the barrier for entry, and I st still think it requires that, that the communities um, who, who want to do research and high-quality research take the same approaches that we've always taken in research and use you know, rigorous methods and validated methods. Um, and uh, that, that isn't an out-of-the-box solution for, for Apple. Um, so I, I'm happy to talk more with you about it uh, at the break or something, but um, I, I don't think that it's, it, it is evolutionary. It is not necessarily revolutionary in my opinion. One last question or comment? There is someone there. I, I don't know. Anyway, so one last question, comment. Uh, so I, I would say, um, you know, I, when I was flying here on American Airlines last, yesterday evening, there happened to be this article, Patient Uprising, about the use of social media and, and other things uh, in terms of moving forward clinical research, medical research. Uh, and it talks about patient groups getting together, using social media to uh, connect with people who have really rare conditions, etc. I raise that partly because of this whole point about <coughs> really thinking about 21st century epidemiology and you know, recruitment and retention and data collection, et cetera. And I think that we are somewhat guilty of still thinking of the same old ways of doing things. And so I think some of the work that you know, is being done at UCSF and elsewhere you know, does sort of pertain to this article in a sense. Uh, but I also want to say, sort of, sort of counter to that in a sense, is that the comment about being really efficient in what we're doing, I and mean, we can't maybe necessarily do, you know, sort of de novo, you know, detailed data collection, you know, on a regular basis and that type of thing. So we do have the opportunity, I think, to think about how can we take advantage of the pre-existing sort of studies and efforts that are going on, healthcare systems, et cetera. Uh, but as we're doing this, I also think it's worth sort of raising the sort of the warning flag of the National Children's Study, you know, where, where, you know, we don't want to sort of create a Christmas tree that everybody's, you know, everything that every, everyone who's interested, you know, tries to get their own pet sort of project in there, and then the whole thing falls apart as a result. Uh, so... So how, I mean, I don't envy the people who are actually, you know, sort of putting this together, but, but I think that there are some great, you know, opportunities as well as some lessons that we really need to think about. So. I've had a blind spot to the left here, so sorry. Last uh, comment or question. Thank you. Uh, Paul Bleicher from Optum Labs. Um, the, uh, the approach that's being contemplated, as I understand it, is, is one that um, 
uh, feels like a combination of registries with consented uh, electronic health record data and p potentially claims data and leads to issues of, of, uh, of uh, bias uh, and inclusiveness, et cetera. I wonder whether a solution to this might be a, a more of a hybrid model in which a de-identified very large electronic health record database is, is used alongside and potentially uh, along with uh, in a linked fashion for those patients who consent um, so that you can investigate <laughs> bias uh, and inclusiveness. You can uh, look for uh, rare diseases and, and be able to uh, come up with methods for interpolating data based upon the smaller percentage of, of linked data. So something that that would be much more than a million patients, that could be 150 million patients, if you will, um, but, uh, but would take advantage of the, of the more intense registry-oriented uh, in-depth data from the consented patients along, alongside the more de-identified data. Thank you. We'll have to leave that as a thought to mull over lunch. Um, so we're going to break now, um, and uh, we have lunch out back, and we'll reconvene at 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Today, um, we're going to have a very, this afternoon, we're going to have a, a tight schedule, and I'm going to try to keep us on, on schedule. We have a distinguished list of uh, speakers who I will introduce in a minute. I'm going to give a f brief overview of this topic. I'll introduce our guests, and then I have specific questions for our guests, which I'd like for them to address. And um, hopefully we'll have a dialogue, dialogue and uh, bring out the best of our experiences and share them with the group. And then midway point, we'll open it up to the group. So um, I'm going to begin by providing a little bit of background. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the nation um, and in the scientific press as well as the lay press about the validity of scientific advantages of including diverse populations. Clearly, this session is about making sure that no one's left behind. And that's a good social justice reason to make sure that we have diversity, but there are also scientific reasons, which I will address uh, today. Next slide, please. Or there's... Great. So... There's always been a debate of whether or not race is a social or biologic construct. And what I've done here is this is the package insert for a drug called carbamazepine, which is the number one drug for pediatric seizure disorders. And it causes a life-threatening uh, disorder called Stevens-Johnson syndrome. In Asians, there's a 4,000-fold increased risk of developing Stevens-Johnson syndrome if you take this drug. And this is, if you read the package insert, which is about two, three, two feet by three feet, like the United States map, if you read the fine print and pull out a microscope, uh, micro magnifying glass, you see this slide here, and it says that if you're of a particular ancestry that you need to get genetically tested. To me, this is good enough evidence that there is biology, biologic differences between groups. These are the demographics of the United States, which we know very well. Um, also, one of the important reasons as to why we need to have diversity, because these are the folks that are funding uh, our effort here today. And I want to just provide some historical perspectives of what we have done as a nation. In 1980, we have initiated the Women's Health Initiative. In 1993, Congress recognized that we were not meeting our mandate of having women and minorities included in NIH-funded basic and clinical research. And so what they've done is they initiated the congressional mandate. And we asked, my group asked the question, how have we done in the last 22 years since it was implemented? And this is a paper that we published um, in February of this past year. And basically, we looked at all the publications uh, related to NI that were supported by the NIH over the last 22 years since the implementation of the federal mandate. And in the last 22 years, out of all clinical studies funded, less than 4.5% have included non-European populations. And, and again, this is a scientific problem because we're missing out on tremendous scientific opportunities. When we look at modern genetic studies, this is a, a review that we published in Nature a couple years ago, 96% of all modern genetic studies have been done in European populations. Again, underscoring the need that we need to uh, really pay attention to this. And that's what 
the goal of this panel is uh, to do. And so I am going to introduce our distinguished guests. Um, our first guest is um, Dr. Anad, who is the Can Canadian Research Chair in Ethnicity and Cardiovascular Disease. Um, and she studies, she's the Chair of uh, Population Health and Epidemiology, as well as Heart Disease and Stroke. Um, Professor of Epidemiology and Director of Population Genomics at McMaster University. Then we have Bill Blott, who's Associate Director of Population-Based Research here at Vanderbilt, uh, is leading the Southern Community Cohort. Uh, then we have Jennifer DeVoe, who is the Director of Practice-Based Research Network at OCHIN. And then we have uh, Dr. Taylor, who's an endowed professor and director of the Cardiovascular Research Institute here at Morehouse. So I am going to begin with the first question, and then I would like each of the guests to chime in on based upon their expertise. And one of the questions that we have for us is, are there particular populations in the United States that um, are important enough to oversample? And we've, we've heard over and over again that our efforts here in the next several years have to reflect the diversity of the United States. So, that's a big charge. So what does that mean to each of the panelists? And are there particular populations that we should go after? Uh, thanks. Uh, I would say yes. Um, I think from the cardiovascular perspective, a uh, recent uh, paper in uh, the Journal of American College of Cardiology really highlighted the uh, ethnic patterns in cardiovascular disease and showed that certain ethnic groups, the Asian subgroups in particular, um, people who originate from the Philippines, Vietnamese, uh, and Korean have an increased risk of hypertensive-related vascular diseases. Um, people who originate from India, South Asians, are high risk for coronary artery disease uh, deaths. So certainly I think uh, there is a scientific rationale to to be inclusive and perhaps over sample, given that in most of the large observational cohorts and clinical trials, these high risk groups were underrepresented. So that's what we're doing in Canada, and we actually have ethnic specific uh, cohorts. We have um, South Asian only cohorts, as well as First Nations or Indigenous peoples cohorts on their own to try and make up for the, the missing information. So any cohort going forward, I think definitely needs to be inclusive, if not oversample. I would con uh, concur, and we know, we've known for many years now that there are striking differences in disease rates uh, according to uh, various population groups. Uh, I'm involved in a, a study that uh, has enrolled people who were, uh, who were recruited from community health centers. So by definition, they included people in underserved areas of the country. When we look at mortality rates as a function uh, of income and education within this low uh, uh, SES population, we see enormous differences, more than two, two and a half fold differences in mortality rates among people in the lowest versus the highest levels of SES in this country. And this is recently in the 21st century. Uh, so. It's, it's a, a problem that, that this country has faced that, uh, that hasn't yet been addressed. So uh, definitely in, in the precision medicine cohort, uh, various uh, groups who are at elevated risk because of their uh, demographic or ethnic status should be included. Jenner? I think I'm going to say almost the same, but in, in order, so I concur. And to add to that, I think what was raised this morning was um, thinking about other factors beyond the race ethnicity. So we're thinking about the low SES, yeah. um, low education, low health literacy, um, multilingual, multicultural. And I think the other piece in, in addition to oversampling is I think we need to stratify the budget in such a way that we may need to over budget to make sure that we're reaching those populations with different materials. They have low literacy levels. They often don't speak English or don't understand um, much of the informed consent materials. And the way that many trials are moving is to actually shrink budgets and try to do things on a lower budget. And this is a population that will drop out first because we will not have the resources 
to reach them. So we need to be very careful about oversampling as well as what I would say over budgeting and bud or using a different budgeting model mm -hmm. to figure out what's going to be adequate to engage these populations, to educate and inform them and follow them. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and I concur to make it unanimous that um, there are certain populations that um, need to be oversampled. Um, in part to uh, just address the uh, chronic undersampling that has been historical fact for a lot of the um, minority populations. Um, but I think it also is uh, it's forward looking to oversample in these uh, populations because as you look at America in 2050, uh, some of the populations that we call minority, at least together, will form a significant plurality, a majority, really, if you add them all together. So uh, if you look at the state of Mississippi, where I spent the last uh, decade and a half, um, if you look under the age of 12, um, I think, yeah, under age 18, 49% of the population is African American. If you look under age 12 or so, the majority, that coming wave, is majority African American with a substantial uh, rising uh, Hispanic population and a minority white. Um, the, the numbers differ in different parts of the country, but overall, uh, what is a majority today will not be a majority in the very uh, near future. Um, I'm blocking on the uh, first author's name now, but uh, people have talked about eight Americas, eight uh, different categories of Americans who have distinct um, disease patterns or distinct mortality patterns for um, significant diseases um, and expect different uh, and can look forward to vastly differing life expectancies. All our compatriots, all within the borders of one country. Um, so I think uh, whatever sampling we do, we gotta attend to that type of breakdown in the population. Um, okay. yeah. Well, great. Um, so I wanna, I wanna really pin you down because I asked a specific question. I want a very specific answer. Are there particular populations that we should oversample? On this slide, I've, I've listed some of the demographics of the United States. And the, but basically, you could say that the largest minority group in the United States are Hispanics, about 16%, maybe 18%. African Americans, 15%. We have Asians. Um, currently, 40% of all US citizens in the United States are non-European. So are there, how do we address people that say we want to study uh, obscure populations, say, in Fiji? Is that something that we should oversample, or Tibet, or Appalachia, or Mississippi? Based on your experiences, what, what do you suggest? Well, uh, maybe I'll go first. I, I mean, it comes back to what the objectives of the cohort are. And if they are you know, to improve the health of Americans, then it answers your Fiji and Tibet question. Okay. Uh, and then the second question would be, what is your current population breakdown? You have it there. I would just highlight that, you know, recently uh, more specificity to Asian is being given, and that should definitely be emphasized here. Mm -hmm. So s break it down even more, South Asian, Southeast Asian, and the different groups. Mm -hmm. um, so you may say that proportionate representation is important, although we have heard that there's been historically uh, low inclusion of this group and so over-representation to answer scientific questions. So what is the adequate number of individuals required to answer some important scientific questions in those groups? I think really the science should guide the objective. Right. I would concur. Usually when you're involved in the process of setting up a, uh, a scientific investigation, you start with uh, the aims or the hypotheses to be tested. Uh, and here they're very, they appear to be very broad and, and haven't, actually maybe I missed it, but haven't seen them specifically laid out yet. Uh, so it makes it a little hard to, to answer a question like that. Uh, and in particular, depending on what the specific aim would be, um, maybe then uh, there could be a rationale for including a large enough number of a particular uh, minority group uh, where, based on power calculations and what outcomes you're looking at, uh, you could justify in, uh, including a large segment, and if we're talking about a million or more than a million people, maybe, say, 50,000 or more with this particular uh, minority group. 
Um, okay. So I, th I think it, it, we'll, we'll see, and probably by the end of the summer, the, the, uh, the goals of this project will be lined up uh, quite well. And then a question like that could be answered directly. Add a little tidbit to that. The goals of this project should be informed by those communities as well. Yes. Because we could sit in the room and say these are the goals, but without hearing from those communities, maybe we haven't gotten the goals right. You're right. And I do want to, you, you mentioned something about better granularity on Asian populations. And it would be probably a shock to this audience to know that last March of 2014, the Attorney General of Hawaii sued Bristol-Myers Squibb for marketing Plavix, which is clopidogrel. It's a blood thinner uh, that we give to every heart attack patient who has a, a stent place called PTCA. They, the Attorney General sued because they are marketing a drug to Asians. 50% of Asian populations don't carry the gene to activate the drug into its active form. 65% of Pacific Islanders don't carry it. So basically, if you had a heart attack in Hawaii and you were going to the ER and you're Asian, the likelihood that you have a placebo is pretty high. So that's, that's a pretty major oversight. Um, but let's ask some other questions. Are there particular characteristics of this cohort that we should go after? So we, heard, we talked about SES. Obviously, some cohorts are going to be middle of the road. The Kaiser cohort is going to be uh, middle swath of America. The veterans cohort is going to be very skewed. What are your opinions on what we should what we as a group should include in this particular cohort. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think um, we have to pay careful attention to these categories and what they mean. So um, black for a lot, or African American, for a lot of people that means one thing. And if you read the literature, you'll find uh, black uh, simply addressed uh, again, as one thing, a black cohort or um, outcomes in black people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in fact, um, African-Americans are a vastly uh, diverse group. Um, they uh, not only have distinct um, uh, cultural backgrounds, um, countries of origin, uh, practices, beliefs, and so forth, that if you were, if you artificially lump all people uh, who self-identify uh, in uh, the way we identify in America today, uh, people who self-identify themselves as black, you are going to obscure a lot of important information uh, or not even bother to look um, and, and inappropriately lump uh, people together who shouldn't uh, necessarily be so because their exposures will be different and their risk for different things will be different. I won't go down the list. So I think paying attention, uh, making sure we have a large enough cohort such that the heterogeneity within the groups is adequately represented uh, would actually be quite informative. Um, the other thing I would say, too, is that um, often uh, black research is done under the heading of disparities research, and you do huge group comparisons rather than uh, really getting into intra-racial differences that may have importance uh, uh, relating to people's, um, again, exposures and outcomes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of thing has to happen. Um, I think we're a little sensitive to it within the Hispanic population. Um, and there are other uh, sort of um, categorizing errors that I think we might make and we need to overcome in order to get a real picture of uh, health in America. Okay. Anyone else want to chime in? I was also thinking, um, Certainly, we would need to figure out um, what are the character what are the characteristics we want to prioritize. I think we could we could stall ourselves in trying to figure out every possible characteristic in every category. Um, so lumping them into larger ones, we're thinking about we really want this population to look like the general population, and that might be biologically or um, genetically. I think we also want them to live like the general population, yeah. and this again gets at the socioeconomic status. I mean, over half of the people in this country live with a household income of less than fifty-five thousand dollars per year, and so we want to make sure that there that we have a population that lives like we have a cohort that lives like our general population, 
um, experiencing the same balance of facilitators and barriers to information regarding health and disease and how to appropriately promote health, prevent disease, and manage chronic health conditions. And that really does get us further down that track. I know we could add, um, again, an endless list, but yeah. thinking about these social determinants of health and where our populations live, their lifestyle, what exposures they have, both socially and environmentally. So I want to chime in. Um, before I do, though, because I want to focus us, uh, I, do, I was negligent in forgetting to mention that the NIH has stepped up and has taken on some, uh, this issue right here and has initiated some large cohorts, one of which I direct, uh, called the Gala Study. We've recruited 10,000 minority children in the United States. And even though many people here have said it can't be done, we did it on a very low budget, regular R01 budget. And, uh, we had geocoded measures of air pollution and GWAS and everybody. But I also want to be mindful to what Dr. Cushy had mentioned, that we can't have a Christmas tree where every fan gets to put their favorite toy on the Kwanzaa tree or Hanukkah tree. We need to be judicious, and that's what you, I hear you saying. So how, since we've, we have all done our own recruitment, we have experience, what can we share to the group? How do we actually get this thing done? It's probably not going to be a monolithic cohort. It'll probably be a sub, I'm thinking, I, I hope I have the... Um, writer's authority to, to go out on a limb here. But I, I think there'll probably be multiple cohorts. How should we structure this? So, Dr. Nan, if you had, I'm going to give you a billion bucks, and you're advising this team how to do it. How do we do it? I'd take that billion bucks to Canada. <laughs> so that would be 1.2 billion dollars. Good luck. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I think that, uh, you know, hearing this morning's conversation, the hybrid approach is probably where this is going to go. Um, just to share some of our experience in Canada, we did, um, some of my colleagues uh, ran the Ontario Health Study, um, Tom Hudson's group in Ontario, and uh, Dr. Collins is probably familiar with that. And one of the, the PI had an idea, well, let's get a lot of people in very quickly using uh, the internet. So it was web-based consent, web-based questionnaires, and to join up, you got free aero miles, right? So they had a very rapid... Um, n recruitment, really. They got to 180,000 people recruited. However, when you looked at the demographics of who they, they were, well, who has aero miles? Who hears about studies like this? Who uses the internet? So the majority are, you know, 90% are white Caucasian, high SES, and very, you know, they've been unable to translate getting those people who were onliners into the clinic for a blood sample. Mm -hmm. So I think the strategy has to be very well thought out. And in some cases, if you say you're going for First Nations or Indigenous populations or hard to reach populations, unique patient engagement or people engagement strategies have to be thought of. And I totally agree, the budget has to be thought of differently. It, it will cost more to reach uh, underserved populations, low SES populations. Um, so it takes more work and more money. You can't have a per patient recruited uh, payment model and recruit individuals. I want to follow up on that because I actually experienced something like this. So where I work, and I'm not going to disclose it, uh, I was very enthusiastic about getting minority patients only to realize that there were none. Mm -hmm. So what did you do to fix that problem? And, and many of us come from ivory yeah. towers that are really disconnected yeah. from the community. So I'm a cardiovascular scientist, and recently we were asked to build in cardiovascular phenotypes to a large national cancer cohort in Canada. And they had said to us, you know, we've tried to work with indigenous populations. They're just really hard to work with. That was it. So we said, well, we're going to recruit uh, indigenous people. In Canada, they live on reservations. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we paired up with investigators who have worked with, the, you know, many of those communities in the past. They already had the relationship. They were already engaged. And they trusted, the community trusted that investigator. They wouldn't trust me, but they trust somebody else. So we used this type of model, and we did have to spend more money. We are able to take mobile MRI machines to the reserve and do the MRIs on the reserve. So we have to be creative in our thinking. And if the community trusts an investigator and the, that investigator trusts what we're doing and we can spend more and be flexible in our recruitment model, we can, we can do it. I think the, the model of if we build it, they will come using yeah. the old way of thinking of cohort studies. You won't get the underserved 
uh, minority populations. You have to go to them and say, what will it take for you to participate in the study? What interests you about the study? And then change your recruitment strategies to be successful. Would anyone else share their experience? Yeah. Um, I think we're all agreed that the, the cohort uh, should be diverse with respect to uh, race and ethnicity and SES. And achieving that uh, will depend in part upon how the, the, uh, the cohort is put together. And if, for example, existing cohorts are tapped into, uh, and I'll speak about cancer cohorts because, because I'm uh, more familiar with them, uh, there already may be mechanisms by which to recruit fairly large numbers of underserved individuals, including African Americans. So no one knows African what you're actually doing right now. Could you share that with yeah. me? Okay, so I'm involved in a, a cohort study called the Southern Community Cohort Study, where we have recruited about 85,000 individuals, two-thirds black, one-third non-black, pr predominantly non-Hispanic white, that were recruited predominantly from community health centers, which, as you probably know, are the frontline institutions providing first-line medical care to the poor in the United States. <clears throat> So as a result of that, the, the median income is below, or the, the income, the family income is below $15,000 for 60% of the cohort. So a lot of these people are in poverty or, or close to the, to the poverty line. So this, the Southern Community Cohort is one cohort of over 40 different cohorts that are part of what's called the, the Cancer Cohort Consortium that NCI has put together. Not, NCI hasn't funded, and NIH hasn't funded all of them, but, but the large majority. And together, the, uh, uh, the, the total enrollment is, is uh, over 2 million individuals, uh, some from overseas, but probably within the United States, uh, one and a half to 2 million individuals. And within that group, there are some cohorts like the Nurses' Health Study, the Harvard cohorts that are predominantly upper SES, uh, almost all white populations. Okay. But then there are cohorts like the one I'm involved with that cover a different segment of the population. There's a multi-ethnic cohort recruiting, uh, Larry Cushy's involved, uh, was involved originally uh, recruiting from Hawaii and from California that has five ethnic groups and a total of about 200,000 individuals. So if in fact it's possible to tap in to these cohorts, as was uh, talked about in, in the morning, then maybe some of the, the problems in recruiting minorities uh, mm -hmm. can be overcome. But were there pri practical things that you did that were different that you had to do midstream? So for example, when we started our study, um, it, was, it went through one of the established NIH networks uh, for asthma, called Asthma Clinical Research Network, but I didn't realize that I was binding to a system that didn't include minorities. So we had to drop all of our recruitment through the ACR Asthma Clinical Research Network, revamp, hit the pavement, go to community clinics. Uh, I actually gave speeches for Francis Collins at uh, local community clinics in the Bay Area. Um, this, uh, I need to completely retool. Yeah. So is this something that you had to do? And believe me, my mentors at Parnassus, UCSF, had no clue that where minorities lived in the Bay Area. Yes. Well, <laughs> well we've, we wound up setting up partnerships with uh, 71 different federally qualified health centers across the South. Uh, and these are institutions that are typically not involved in research at all. Uh, but they saw the advantage of getting involved in a long-term research study that would help address some of the uh, reasons for why low-income individuals, and particularly African-Americans, have higher rates of, in our most interest was cancer, but, but also other conditions. Uh, and out of the uh, 74, 75, we approached 71 community health centers agreed to participate. Uh, and working within that uh, network uh, where there, has, there had already been established a bond of trust between the, the community health center and the local community, we were over to, able to overcome a lot of the barriers that it had existed to recruiting uh, low-income individuals and recruiting African-Americans in particular in the past. What were those barriers? Well, That's, um, we, people who, many people here have not recruited, but they've analyzed yeah. thousands of samples. For the people on the ground, boots on the ground, right. I want to know exactly how you rolled up your sleeves and what you did and what right. we need to do. Well, believe it or not, even in this century, you still hear of the legacy of Tuskegee. And there were... Uh, individuals uh, who were reluctant to join yeah. 
in study for fear of what might happen, for fear of institutions. So we were, this is, study is run out of Vanderbilt and in collaboration with Meharry Medical College, which is the, the oldest historically black medical school um, in the United States. And so there, w there was a, a combination of, of institutions that we thought would be friendly or well received and well respected in the United States or w within the South here. But still there are people saying, oh, oh you guys in the ivory tower, you're, you're interested in doing research so you can publish and get famous and you're using us as guinea pigs. Yeah. Um, so we had to overcome that and working with the local community, and in, in, in this case with community health centers, but uh, it applies generally with, with local communities. It took almost an, an education campaign to, to fight some of those barriers. And, and Amongst your scientists? No, no, in, in the local community. <laughs> that was a joke, because That's it right. is true. <laughs> it is true that there's these tremendous, I was telling Dr. Collins there's an infrastructure, a structural institutional difference between who's actually doing the work and then who's the communities that are benefiting from it. Well, so I am, have somewhat of a similar story, although I will say that what it took for me was a very intentional career choice, stepping out of it? the ivory tower well, what? and into the community. So I am the chief research officer at OCHIN, which is a community health information network of 80 federally qualified health centers that are mm. formed, that join together in a collaborative to um, develop their own IT infrastructure. So we run one electronic health record in over 400 community health center sites across 13 states in the United States, um, based in Oregon. Um, so we have now, um, so we're kind of on the electronic health record side, but are now working with our collaborative of federally qualified, qualified health centers to essentially build that trust partner I, with the clinicians. Right there, though, many community clinics are overworked, and they tell us yes. that they don't have time to, to get patients for us. So how did you get around that? So one of the things that we've been talking a lot about, and actually I did, believe it or not, um, Read the talk questions. to our chief medical officer, and he said exactly that. He said healthcare, system, healthcare systems, especially FQHCs, are currently overwhelmed with just trying to provide care. Anything that causes disruption in the efficient provision of care is difficult. Research can be one of those disruptions. This is especially true with, if we're recruiting patients or if there's a process of randomization where we have to do one thing for some patients and something else for others. So we've really worked on one, again, I stepped out of the institution. Yeah. I don't do CBPR. I am a community-based investigator. I live, breathe, work in the community organization, bridge across to the academic health center, go out to the health centers, and then what we have is the sweet spot. They're trying, to, they're trying to figure out how do we provide the best care? How do we improve tools? How do we use our data? How do we reach hard to reach patients? How do we engage patients? So if we come to them and we say, hey, we're recruiting patients. We're gonna help you build data systems. We're gonna help you build recruitment tools. Oh, we're gonna help you work on the patient engagement that mm -hmm. you're working on with your mobile apps and your mm -hmm. portals. And that will be researchers coming in to bring resources. Mm -hmm. They say, great. But if we say, hey, put these up in your waiting room and spend extra time in the day to recruit patients for us and we're not giving you anything back, they're a little bit less interested. I mean, and then you get to the patient benefits and there's, there's issues with coercion. You don't want to provide too much of an incentive that you're coercing someone in a way that they're not informed. But I was thinking about even how do we, for some of these patients, being active in this study, how do we provide them benefit? And even pie in the sky. So you say you're serving your country, you're part of this million precision medicine cohort, you're serving your country in a way that veterans are or that other folks are. Maybe there's some special benefits that they can get, public assistance, food, et cetera. There's a lot of health centers now helping enroll patients in insurance. Can we piggyback on that engagement and that enrollment? So I think there are ways that we can help them take care of that patient population, but unless we show that we're helping mm -hmm. and that there is tangible benefit to the patients and the providers and the communities, okay. um, it's gonna be seen as potentially an intrusion. So. Dr. Taylor? Well, I just wanna uh, echo a lot of what's been said um, and maybe pick up on a couple of points. So um, I'm a veteran of the Jackson Heart Study, which um, recruited 5,300 African Americans in, in Jackson, Mississippi to a longitudinal uh, study that is now 15 years old. And um, at, the, at the outset, and I think, again, reflecting some of the insights that have already been related, um, 
involving the uh, people you intend to help is critical in helping you orient yourself to that population, particularly if you're someone unfamiliar. Um, and it is, I mean, it's absolutely vital. If you want first the recruitment success and then the retention success, a relationship has to be uh, established with the community. How do you do that? There are many approaches. Um, some of what we did was already uh, kind of alluded to, uh, but we certainly um, talked to the community um, and got them involved in various aspects of the development of um, the, the entire study. Um, I won't go into a lengthy detail about that, but it is not the fastest way to do science. I mean, if you pause to entertain the ideas and the insights and the wisdom, really, of the community, that uh, is not the most time efficient thing to do. But I think in the long term results are a higher quality, better recruitment, better retention. We talked to, um, oh, and people mentioned partnerships with uh, academic institutions, other institutions that have a, a particular resonance with the community that you're uh, in, interested in recruiting. Um, you know, thanks to the wisdom of people like uh, Terry Manolio sitting back there and others at the NIH who helped uh, catalyze the Jackson Heart Study, mm -hmm. we involved not just the Academic uh, Medical Center, but also Jackson State University, which is a historically black institution, as well as an undergraduate institution. Those are important because these are trusted institutions that are on the ground, have, in the case of Jackson State and Tougaloo, huge alumni associations, which gives you access, and also it it gives that stamp of approval that's implicit that this, that the motivation behind this mm -hmm. has uh, at its heart the benefit of that community. So let me, ask, let me ask a very provocative question, okay, because it's what I do well. Um, I had an uncomfortable experience because I did, we pulled off 10,000 Hispanic and African American recruitment of children, and I thought we were doing well, so we could do it in Chinese, but I don't need to tell you I'm not Chinese. I learned a valuable lesson that you need to be part of the community in order to get access to the community. Can, you, can either one of you talk about that? Yeah, I think you're right, 100%. Um, when I meet with the South Asian community, it helps that I'm South Asian. When I meet with the uh, indigenous First Nations community, it helps I'm, that I'm not white. Because like Tuskegee, they'll say, well, when white men come to our community, they take the samples and leave. Uh -huh. so, so I think whenever you're going into a community, you need to have a team of people who are you know, either from that community or, or strongly, usually from that community. And uh, so again, in the creation of this co cohort study, what are the communities you want to engage? And then you have to build your teams that, inc that is inclusive of people from that community. That's the only way the community will buy into the study. I'm going to give the whole panel, well, could I just, uh, I give the whole panel two minutes, and I'm okay. going to let you talk. Right. But each of you has wonderful experience. And uh, I know all about your, each of your works. And um, many of you have followed individuals over time that is very difficult to do that are not necessarily part of your your personal community, but you were very successful at it. So in a nutshell, can, oh, and I want to open it up to the group for the next 20 minutes, but tell us what's the parting advice that you want to give the group that's about to embark on a million-person cohort? Well, I'll, nobody's jumping in, so I'll, I will. <laughs> uh, I think um, partnerships with, again, those institutions and individuals that resonate with the community that you're uh, hoping yeah. to target is critical. And I think it is important that uh, these individuals not be just window dressing. Okay, Can I say that? That um, they are actually uh, valued equal partners in the enterprise. Yeah in leadership positions and decision-making positions, as well as uh, being people who can advise and, uh, and sort of be a guide into the, the communities that you want uh, to access. Yeah. Um, and I think that helps not only set you on the right course at the very beginning, but I, I think, again, it shows um, uh, a belief in the people you're trying to help, and I think ultimately it'll reap, uh, you'll reap a lot of benefits in terms of recruitment okay. and retention. Anyone else want to share their experience? Uh, let me just mention a little bit about follow-up since we yeah, haven't and, talked about that. Uh, and, and Bill, you, you've actually been very successful following a longitudinal African-American cohort. Um, so yeah, so we've, we use a combination of uh, passive means and active means. So the passive follow-up 
uh, again, because this is a cancer cohort, involves linkage with cancer registries in each of the 12 states in which we recruited. Uh, we've also made arrangements with uh, CMS for linkage with Medicare and Medicaid. And just as an anecdote, it's uh, amazing how expensive it is to do, to do that, linking uh, with this federal agency to get, get the data and how difficult uh, it is. But we finally uh, persevered and uh, made arrangements with, ex with extreme privacy restrictions. I'm, I'm under penalty of going to jail if anything is disclosed from the, uh, that CMS provides to us. But anyway, this, it's uh, an effective means for tracking a, uh, a pop population, particularly if it's low income and linking with, the me with Medicaid. Uh, and Medicaid is run by the states, but the data are provided nationally now. Uh, and so national, uh, and then CMS uh, will provide for legitimate research purposes uh, ability to link so you can get any uh, encounter, uh, medical encounter of the uh, participant in the in the cohort uh, with those linkages. Um, and then, of course, we link with the National Death Index and Social Security uh, Medical Registry. It's also a U.S. renal disease registry in the United States, which includes information on the identities of any uh, end-stage renal disease patient. And again, our cohort is being low income, highly African American. There are over 1,800 people in the cohort already diagnosed with end-stage renal disease that we could identify passively. And then we, we contact them directly every uh, four years to update exposure uh, information. Anyone else? I think the part that I do want to emphasize is um, this partnership with the communities as well as the trusted primary care physician and primary care team, and that's really been beneficial to us. Now, it was mentioned earlier, and I agree, not all patients access health care, but um, most patients and actually um, family physicians and primary care physicians see more of the U.S. population in their offices every year than any other physician group. So really working with primary care, um, and especially with, in terms of disparities, um, patients with chronic diseases that, that are affluent see um, subspecialists, but many who either are uninsured or underinsured don't have access, so they're in primary care for their complex chronic conditions. So partnering with primary care, it makes a big difference when we send a letter directly from someone's primary care physician saying, you have XYZ diagnosis and I want you to know there's a new study or there's a new patient-powered research network or some other network that may be a resource to you and you might want to get involved. And that's much more helpful than getting a blanket letter saying, oh, I got your name from some database. I'm a researcher who you don't know. So that's been really valuable. Thank you. I want to open it up to the panel. Before we do that, I want to say that we recruited four racial groups, and, and pragmatically we had to have a different recruitment strategy for each group. It was one for Asian, one for Caucasians, one for African Americans, one for Hispanics. But I would like to open it up to the group, um, and I'd like to hear from people who have similar experiences or suggestions on how we make sure that we are globally inclusive of the American population. Um, we have some people here. I'm going to go with the first guest. Can you Hi. say who you are and where you're from? Yes, Consuelo Wilkins, and I'm the executive director of the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance. Um, I think that the panel has given us a lot of great um, suggestions, best practices for uh, recruiting a diverse group. Uh, I could add to that, but probably not substantially. So I would like to though point out that what the panel is suggesting is actually opposing in some ways some of the earlier comments, which is that we want to have an enthusiastic and excited group of individuals in this million person you know, cohort. And if we're going to have a diverse group of people and reach folks who are less likely to be participating in research to start with, then we can't expect that they are going to start out enthusiastic and highly motivated and excited. How they do we may, get them there? They may eventually get there, but I do think that the point about recognizing that there needs to be a budget, there need to be people who understand how to culturally mm -hmm, tailor, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how to prepare documents that are yeah. linguistically and literacy appropriate for diverse populations will need to be considered. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Eric Dishman from Intel. So I have just one very practical hint. So my team of medical anthropologists and the researchers that we hire around the world have studied thousands of people ethnographically. We often live with them for periods of time. It's a very difficult recruitment challenge. The three most effective ways that we have done it across many, many different countries and cultures is through sports events, music, music events, and through churches. Um, and we're able to reach very diverse populations and enlist those kinds of organizations to actually help us do it. The, uh, one other thing I want to mention, and it piggybacks off the last comment, and I, it, this has been bugging me now for sort of the last, since the beginning of, of the PMI, and we talk about consent and all these kinds of things, and we talk about privacy. Yeah. I personally don't believe we can have one consent that goes to all communities. Our studies of just the issues of privacy and consent show that they can be so culturally inflected, and just the message and how you position it um, from age ranges to different ethnicities to different cultures, right, is much, much more complicated. And, and if we assume a sort of monolithic stance that individuals have towards privacy concerns or um, issues of consent, then we're going to miss the fact that, that, you know, there are very different approaches to it that we have to consider when we go in and do it. Okay. Uh, next. Oh, you are next. Um, this last gentleman already... Um, okay touched upon the question sure. that I was, uh, or the suggestion I was about to make. Uh, we are talking about, in this inclusion session, we are talking about universals and particulars that human, uh, human biologists um, reach. So for the, in order to reach our goal, I think we need to look at, one, population genetic insights, anthropological genetic insights are necessary because they provide theoretical insights and theoretical framework to address these universal and particular questions. Uh, particular questions. And the second, talking about the um, over uh, sampling, perhaps it is uh, Ashkenazi Jewish population, perhaps maybe a better one because they have been exposed to various um, environmental, uh, uh, say, stresses over time, and also there is a great deal of history, both population genetic history and demographic history, um, is greatly available. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hudson. Tracy McGregor, I'm a clinical geneticist and pediatrician here at Vanderbilt. Um, from data that we've looked at that looks at birth cohorts, meaning what year were you born in and what does your genetic ancestry look like, children are very different than adults. So if you take an 80-year-old and ask them what bucket their grandparents fit in, they're all in the same bucket, yeah. no matter who you ask. If you go to children under the age of five, or for that matter, under the age of 20, and you ask them, what bucket do your grandparents fit in, they will pick more than one bucket. And so the pie chart that you show that shows 2% is multiracial is going to change over time. And so I would encourage the panel to think about when you encourage minority enrollment and you enc encourage these types of things, how do you define minority? How do you define who fits in what bucket? And this has practical implications when the budgets are associated with the type of recruitment. So if you have children who are biracial, simple mom is African American, dad is Caucasian European American, what does that count as? And so this is one of the things that we'll have to think about going forward, and I'd rather that be pre-thought out than kind of reactionary down the road. And that, that's wonderful because my expertise is uh, genetic ancestry. Uh, and so we were able to uh, deconvolute that component. Uh, I'm also trained in epidemiology, so I know that we cannot ignore the social aspects of race and ethnicity. Having said that, um, uh, Catherine Phillips is next. Sure. Hi, I'm Esteban's colleague, I'm Catherine Phillips. My primary head is a UCSF. But I'm here representing PCORI. And it struck me that PCORI has really done a huge amount of work in terms of how to engage patients and how to be inclusive, and that we should be able to build on what they've already done. So I would definitely encourage us to think about uh, engaging PCORI in that regard. I'm working with PCORI now to help them develop a research agenda on personalized medicine because they see that they're very important comparative effectiveness research issues that need to be addressed. So they want to be synergistic with what you're trying to do here at NIH. Dr. Rourke. Pearl O'Rourke, Boston. 
Um, I love the idea of needing to create partnerships up front. We should be doing it right now. We should have done it already, probably. Uh -huh. But to the panel, is it at all reasonable to think we could do partnerships for one big cohort? Are we going to really have to build partnerships around smaller cohorts that would then, in aggregate, become part of the whole? Uh. My, sense, my sense is the latter is probably the model that would work. Multiple and small cohorts? Mul multiple small cohorts. And they all consent to share core data with the PMI. That's the way I think it would work best. So one of the questions is going to come up, not here, but it come, came up earlier. Do we tap into existing cohorts, like the Strong Heart Study, the multi-ethnic study, and just re-consent people and have them, those uh, scientists contribute those samples to the overall goal of the nation? It's just something, I don't think we're going to address it here. Um, so, Dr. Kishi, you had a question. Yeah. Um, I think the panel has made a lot of great comments about uh, working with community, et cetera. Um, but, I, but you didn't really address, I mean, it was touched on at the very end, the retention question. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to actually hear more about recommendations or experience of actually following people who you've recruited into a study and how successful you have been in keeping them engaged over a multi-year you know, longitudinal study? Now, that's a wonderful question, and we have eight minutes, so I want to keep it brief. I'll and then I'm going to challenge Dr. Kishi how they did it. <laughs> I'll go really quickly. We use a hybrid method where we offer incentives to come back every year for follow-up, and that could be a cell phone card or a gift card or something. There's some incentives because some of the communities are so poor that, you know, a $10 food card is a big deal. So we use incentives. And then we also have asked them for permission to record link at baseline as our ultimate backup. And the majority of our populations do consent to re our record linkage. In Canada, we do have a public health care system. We still have interprovincial problems record linking. So if there are two things you could legislate for this cohort, it would be a central REB and um, you know, the record linkage that doesn't have state boundaries, if that's possible here. And I think it could be mixed methods uh, for the uh, various sub-cohorts that comprise the overall cohort. For example, if there is a... a a uh, Kaiser Permanente sub-cohort -co where you have uh, excellent follow-up on, on clinical outcomes. The intensity of follow-up would be different than would be for a, uh, a low-income cohort that was recruited from community health centers where, where it's much more difficult to bring people back in for uh, repeat clinical measurements or even to fill out uh, follow-up questionnaires. And, and Dr. Blood, how many... Uh, African-Americans are you following right now? So the ARCAR is, is about 55,000 African-Americans. Okay. Ray? Hi, um, Ray Patrick Lake. So I know that we only have a couple minutes in this panel, and it's really um, probably a bad idea to throw this out, but I have to ask, are any of you working with cohorts that experience frequent incarcerations? And if so, how do you deal with that? Our records are linked now in many of our communities. So we are able to follow that through the electronic health record, but I agree it's a challenge. But yeah, we've, we're doing a lot of integrating. Well, I'm asking more about the, with IRB issues and having people in study that are now, you know, if they're incarcerated, do you have to take them out of the study or how, you're, how do you deal with that? I think you have to take them out. Yeah. <laughs> we, well, we're, I mean, if you're looking at the health care they're utilizing, you're, they're utilizing health care within the jails as well, and we have that in our record for many of our populations, but it's a great question. I wanted to, I, I didn't get my minute to respond yeah. to the retention question. I'll, I'll be very brief. I was going to give you two minutes. That's fine. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so I, I think um, good retention begins with good recruitment. And, and, and both of them involve relationship. I think um, an ongoing active uh, communication is, is vital. And part of that um, also includes setting appropriate expectations at the beginning. So what do I mean? I think that um, people need to understand if you're going to do an observational study that there may be some latency between the time they sign up to the time that there's some major breakthrough announcement or new cure or new understanding of disease processes. Um, those, expect those expectations have to be there at the beginning so that people don't get frustrated that, you know, I've been involved in this study forever. When are you guys going to find something? When am I going to hear back? Um, I think it's also important to, uh, I mentioned communication, to keep that going. 
the, the traditional uh, mechanisms of newsletters and things of that sort. In, on a community-based uh, study like ours, we had uh, meetings of the cohort, if you will, um, gatherings for the people who were involved, such that they came together, shared stories, heard us talk about uh, topical um, uh, things, and uh, went back feeling they, they'd got something. I think altruism is something great that I think a lot of people who sign up will have, but they need something more. They want something that's uh, in the now, and that could be information or maybe some of the incentives that were mentioned here as well. Okay, we I'll have two, two guests. Uh, I'm going to let you go first, and then you're the pinch hitter. Uh, Tom, I'm Tom Glass from Johns Hopkins. Uh, I've been uh, really wrestling in my mind with uh, the concept of a cohort, which keeps getting used. Uh, and I'm an epidemiologist, so we kind of we're very fussy about this idea. Uh, a cohort is not just an aggregation of people that we're studying. Uh, in particular, there seems to be a tension between uh, the language of, of diversity and inclusion on the one hand and the language of representativeness on the other. And these are very, very different goals which require very, very different things. So as an example, you know, Noah's Ark, two animals of every species, that was extremely high on the inclusiveness side, but it was not representative. Had Noah's Ark been represented, it would have been filled with insects. So these are not the same thing. There are good re So it's not clear to me whether we've decided we want to, this to be a study that is representative of a particular population. If we decide that, it has very clear and powerful implications for how sampling is done, sampling as known probabilities of selection, and so forth. There are reasons to oversample, and I'm not sure when I hear this term whether people mean oversampling or whether they mean um, overscreening, which are two different things. There are good reasons to do oversampling, but it, it has to be a very good reason because oversampling produces the need for weights and very complicated analytic machinery that must be well justified. So it, I think it would help, at least for me, to, to get a sense of whether we really want to do a cohort study and what population we wish to generalize to and whether we have sufficient grounds for really doing oversampling, given how costly and difficult and complex it is. Maybe a quick response to that? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think these are, I don't know if this is on, these are all issues that will be, uh, need to be decided. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, it, I think the, the, the viewpoint I've had is that we want inclusion to, so that various populations uh, are indeed uh, included in, as part of the cohort. But the key issue is the internal validity of the study and getting uh, individuals in who, who would then be followed in similar matters in similar manners so that you could compare outcomes among individuals with or versus without a genetic trait or with versus without a particular exposure are the key things. And if the, the, the uh, cohort turns out not to be, quote, representative of the United States population, that's okay, as long as it, as it includes enough members of various uh, segments of the population. Well, thank you. Um, and to address your question, one of the first questions I asked was, are there particular populations that are more important to oversample than not? So using your Noah's Ark example, should we get insects or should we get the dodo bird? Um, and that's something that is a complex question, but I'm going to throw it out to the audience, and we may not address it here. Uh, Dr. Collins, you've been patiently waiting, so I'm going to let you wrap it up. Well, it, it was on the same point, actually. Um, that if one is going to do oversampling, then one has to do it seriously. Um, if you need a million people to be able to determine the association of risk factors with disease, uh, if in, you look in that 2004 paper, uh, one needs that kind of scale to be able to look for interactions, which is effectively what you're describing. You, is the association of some risk factor with disease different in one or other subgroup? Yes. Then, then the over-representation actually needs to be very serious. You need to be planning to have hundreds of thousands of people um, in particular groups. Uh, and to do anything other than that is really not a serious attempt to deal with the issue. So uh, I think this is a critical point um, because the, the cost implications both for recruitment and follow-up are very substantial. But, but if you're going to do it, then I think it's a statistical 
um, point, one needs to do it on, on a sufficiently large scale to make sure that it is actually informative. Uh, other, otherwise, it's really just uh, for face validity and not for real science. I agree with you. And if we don't take steps to make sure that we don't have representation, we're going to have another Plavix story which to me is a black eye for not only our scientific community, but for the industry. But I'm glad we were able to rectify it. I'm going to wrap it up. We are on time. And um, I want to thank my panelists. You've been outstanding. Um, and I'm going to, we're going to invite the next speakers to come up for the next session, which is uh, section, session four, cross-institutional uh, digital health data sharing for research. Thank you again. I think everyone's coming up. Come on up. Yeah. Great. So um, thank you. A great session. And we're going to uh, introduce the fourth uh, scheduled panel for today. Um, and um, uh, we have, most of our presenters actually have a few slides to go through. Um, and breaking from kind of traditions, we talk about uh, cross-institutional data health data sharing, digital health data sharing for research. Um, the first uh, speaker will be Dr. Mark Frizzi, who is local from Vanderbilt. Um, and uh, he has a, a diverse range of experiences, though, um, both university settings and corporate um, at Express Scripts are uh, helping launch RX Hub um, and uh, a large health information exchange uh, in West Tennessee um, that expand a number of partnerships. And um, so first, uh, Mark, would you like to start us off? Good afternoon. I've always been impaired with AV technologies. I'm just going to make a few very brief points based on some experience raising as many questions as answers. Uh, you'll see that I think all of us will be uh, harping on the same themes which have already been uh, raised multiple times through the session and maybe we can just dig a little deeper in one or two to your satisfaction. Uh, the topic is data sharing for research. And we were given a number of questions. One of them was just, what are the barriers uh, to this sort of process? And of course, we all know what they are. And we could talk all day about any one of these technical, political, behavioral, uh, financial, and uh, issues of data. What types of data are difficult? What types of data are straightforward? What do we really need for specific cohorts and the like? So there's a number of barriers that we could go back and visit, I think. Secondarily, though, I want to talk about alignment. Uh, when the High Tech Act was introduced, uh, the notion was quite, I think, mature, maybe excessively so, about the imperative for physician order entry and electronic health record adoption by primarily physicians in hospitals and clinics. It was far, far less mature in its notion of how to communicate among systems. And the primary uh, idea in the legislation was that of state health information exchanges which were not funded and probably in most instances not practicable and with a few notable exceptions have failed. Uh, at the same time, uh, the need of reimbursement systems to go to accountable care and bundled payments and like have uh, made everybody wake up to the fact that, well, holy cow, patients see multiple different clinicians across time and if we want to really manage and control costs and improve quality, we've got to get the data from all of these places. So lesson one really is that in order for this uh, million life cohort to exist and for this effort to thrive, we simply must leverage off the very large efforts that people are taking in the area of healthcare delivery. Often we talk about connectivity to EHRs as if it's a one-to-one -one connection. And so you'll have a organization uh, committed to health information exchange reaching out to an ambulatory care provider and asking for an interface. And the provider, the ambulatory care vendor will often say, well, That'll be five to ten thousand dollars, and then if there's a second uh, network in the same area also wanting to link that provider, it's another five to ten thousand dollars, and the numbers can be much much higher depending on what's being asked. And so, in the uh, greater Nashville area, for example, there are at least three fairly mature health information exchange networks organized not by geography but rather by uh, networks of care, Vanderbilt Health Affiliate Network, which spans about 50 hospitals and 
practices in multiple states, Mission Point, which is led by Ascension Healthcare, and finally Hospital Corporation of America. I could on, go on and on about the connectivity with Metro Hospital, uh, the issues with CHS, uh, LifePoint. We have a lot of healthcare delivery in this town. So when we have to look at aligning these things, we can't be thinking about getting data from the EHR as if it's a one-to-one -one connection, but rather, I think, first solve the problems of how the providers who will be providing these data and participating in research will link to all these disparate systems in an affordable way. I'm heartened that uh, the emphasis at the federal level has shifted dramatically from the adoption of electronic health records to emphasis on connectivity. The recent, the recent ONC strategic plan, for example, is a very, very good guidepost to how to proceed, and there's been a number of industry commentaries, both in the Senate Help Committee and the FTC and elsewhere, that are worth a read. So we have to think about how to leverage these things in an efficient way. And I can tell you that the uh, requirements for patient care are not the same as biomedical research. What will work for a referral will not necessarily work for the kind of studies that we're doing at Vanderbilt. If I had one wish list about the kind of quick wins we do, I'm startled that to this day we still do not have a reliable medication history in the United States. You know, the supply chain for medications is quite mature. I can go almost anywhere in the country and see a clinician and get a prescription for a certain antibiotic and go to a store and get it. But if I ask any three clinicians in a town, what's my medication history, I will get three completely different answers if I get anything at all. And of course, even if we look at medication histories, we often think of only prescription drugs. And with prescription drugs, often the claims databases only have the brand drugs or certain expensive drugs, not the generics. We're not looking at the inexpensive drugs. We're not looking at the herbals. We're not looking at the over-counters. Aspirin, things that are very important to PCORI. All of these things are fairly unreliable and I would argue inconsistent when you go to large scale and are issues that we have to address. So I think the medication history is a fine example of the kind of early test that we share with the delivery and research communities and public health communities, something we have to nail. If you look at the kind of changes we need, one of the biggest things that came up over and over again is a community of trust. And we've discussed that in the last session in terms of inclusion, and we've discussed it in terms of consent and authorization and the like, education. We are not in the technology business, those of us who do this stuff, we are in the trust business. And we're trying to make sure that people understand not who owns the data, but that my data are used in the same way that I would expect them to be used wherever they go. Because in a sense, this is Music City after all, uh, we all may own a copy of a Johnny Mathis record and we have certain rights to use that and certain rights not to use that. The same is true in health information. It is not a physical thing owned by a person, but rather there are rights of access and ownership and stewardship control and responsibilities we have to honor. Now, when I look at the trust thing a bit more deeply, my last point, I, I've always been struck by the serial nature of um, uh, our understanding of uh, privacy policies and consent policies. It's really a pipeline. You see, when we expanded HIPAA in February of, I think, 2013, if I remember right, the uh, regulatory impact statement said, well, all you have to do is hire a bunch of lawyers to do notification of privacy practices. But that's not true, because every... A uh, hospital administrator for the first time in their life said, holy cow, some pipe's going to come into my electronic record and pull information out. And I can tell you the cost in terms of committees and requirements and labor is enormous. I have never been able to find a true cost of HIPAA, for example, years back. I found a great review on an estimate of that. But I would say that these requirements, if you add those on top of the requirements we have for peer-reviewed research are huge. Again, at Vanderbilt, we're fairly fortunate that we have a pretty tight community with a lot of maturity and we can line those up. But as we go out and look at, at combining the data through the PCORI initiative, for example, to 50 other hospitals, we are running into the same problems. So this pipeline, if you will, starts at the, your policies, your institution, maybe some uh, data sharing research things for some proprietary thing, then there's state laws, then there's the federal laws and you go out the pipe. So what comes out the other end is really a function of the rate limiting step. For example, um, about eight years ago, there was a privacy uh, initiative funded by the federal government on where every state looked at this. And one of the findings was that even within their own states, people had dramatically different interpretations of what these regulations mean. And each of us here 
in the research business know very much how the word HIPAA has been used or abused and moved around. So you have to understand that any step in a serial process where information is constrained because of ignorance or poor understanding will constrain the overall output. So the role of education again and the constant theme I have alignment is very, very important. Finally, I think one thing that's come up over and over again is we've got to make this stuff meaningful. We've got to make this mean to something to people. We have to, again, to summarize, improve our care delivery and align our research efforts with that. We have to be sure that we don't exhaust people with uh, consent um, options that take too much office time or choice fatigue from too many choices. We've got to find more innovative distributed means of doing this have been mentioned today with mobile devices, patient access, and the like, and we've got to keep this stuff straight. And I would emphasize again that in my own view, it's always better to show the world you can do one or two things very, very well before you try to boil the ocean. So some of the emphasis on some of these research initiatives for specific targeted diseases, I think, by example, will have an enormous influence. Great. This on. Um, so next up will be uh, Dr. Sachin Kutterpol. Is this on? Yeah, okay. Um, who is um, uh, from Michigan and um, a, uh, the PI of the multi-center perioperative um, uh, outcomes group and um, also a designer of the um, Centricity uh, EHR system. Yeah, can you get those slides? They're not slides here that you okay. can see. I might stand there so I can see up yeah. there. Yeah. I'm up here and I had eyes in the back. Yeah, that's head. amazing. I've, I've never had to look at my presenter's paper print that first slide. That was really cool. And the forwarding. I didn't change the name of the slide after this morning's presentations. I think this really is what we've heard a couple of times, which is how do we do this in an economical way? And actually, that's, I think, my role here is to talk about how to do this on the cheap. And that's not to do it cheaply and poorly, but it's to do it at the right scale and in environments where we historically haven't reached. The previous session about inclusion, uh, our thoughts around sample size will all be kind of addressed here. Let me hit the points that we're going to hit, whether or not there's enough time for them. So this is what the takeaways are. Let's start there, and we'll see where we get to. Fundamentally, I don't mean to be uh, dismissing of the term research, but this can't be about just research. When we talk about engagement, when we talk about getting non-academic medical centers to do this, it is a waste of this infrastructure that we're about to build if at the end result of it, there's papers which eventually impact patient care. The participants here need to know that immediately something is changing. They're getting information back, and by participants, it could mean that the community health centers are getting information back, data back. This has to be taking advantage of infrastructure we build now to do more than research. We have to have a concept of some pair engagement in this process. You've heard access to data, but I think when we talk about pair, that doesn't necessarily mean always a for-profit pair. This can mean CMS. We've heard the term CMS a couple times this morning. The way we've done this on the cheap and our collaborative with literally a, you know, a factor of 10 or 100 less than another uh, consortia is by involving our pairs to see the value, and they fund this for other purposes, and we happen to do research on top of it. And then the final issue is that the participant there, whether it's a community health center or an individual participant signing up using their iPhone, ha has the same incentive structure here, which they need to feel like they're part of not just the altruistic long-term research mission, but also a near-term practice improvement, practice change mission. If you do both of those things, that's how you keep an engaged community of health centers and providers. The second takeaway point is about this record linking thing, which you've heard mentioned in passing once or twice. I think it's one of the most important things we could get away from a, the digital health data concept. If we don't build a national record linkage infrastructure as a result of this effort, we've once again wasted a prime opportunity. The technology is there, the policies are there, and the science is there. What is not there is the education and the willingness to do it. We have to have CMS, CDC, lead this by example if we're going to get folks like Shorescripts to participate. It's depressing to me that the guy who founded Shorescripts thinks we don't have medication history data. That's really kind of disconcerting to me. <laughs> it's like Francis Collins saying the genome is kind of a hokey thing going on right now. <laughs> So this is old school precision medicine. I'm an anesthesiologist. This is what we used to do on paper. Every single 
uh, minute, we get data off about 40 different physiologic things uh, on the monitor. We know their heart rate, their blood pressure, their respiratory rate, their pulmonary compliance, and we used to put this old school onto paper. This is, you know, for an average, uh, I was in the operating room yesterday doing kidney transplants. I felt bad because I could only take blood pressure every three minutes. I'd wanted an arterial line, but he had no peripheral arteries left for me to access. What we have is the ability to take precision medicine like this, and now that it's sitting in these digital versions, the option is what we've done in this uh, kind of on the cheap group called MPOG. This is a research consortium that I'd founded. What we've done is take electronic health record data and other systems, put it into standardized structures. And you'll notice there, this is happening on a daily basis across 20 hospitals. When we started this as a research consortium, we did this every three months. When we put the practice improvement and participant engagement use case scenario on top of it, they said, we want the data out every single night. Because at the end of the week, they want to get feedback on how well they're managing their patients. The research use case scenario was months. The practice improvement use case scenario is days. We map it to LOINC, to RxNorm, where it's possible. We do transmit to a centralized repository. There's a hybrid model here. They keep it locally, and they send it to a centralized place to give that distributed culture of they can do with it what they want. They have ownership over the data. They have innovation resulting from that data. And we have some centralized access as well to do centralized use case scenarios. We link it with registry data, genomics data. About 30,000 of these patients have had GWAS chips applied to them now. And when we used to be able to do it on the cheap with the social security death master file, unlike the NDI, we do it with death data as well. And the evolution we found on how to do this efficiently is research use case scenarios that fed performance improvement use case scenarios that actually had financial value. With the QCDR and PQRS requirements, we've had a doubling of our participant interest for research work because they happen to also prevent the CMS penalty. I'm the practical one here. I'm the least NIH-funded person in this room. I think I, I win that award. And yet, at the same time, we're able to make progress because we give different value propositions out of it. Very importantly, it has to be an egalitarian process. This is not central heavy. Whether you're a community hospital submitting 5,000 patients or University of Michigan that's got 500,000 patients, everybody has equal access to the data set. Nobody gets to be the big, big dog that manages access that way. We've got 2.8 million patients in the repository now. Every single medication that they've received, every single prescription that they've had with Rx norm codes, laboratory values, preoperative information about them, across 20 health systems, 17 states, six different EHR vendors, including Epic. So Epic wrote the extract into this repository because their providers said we will get some value out of this, not just five years from now for a paper, but next week for our practice improvement. And in our centralized repository at this point, we've got six billion vital signs across these patients. There's some really impressive phenotypes here regarding hyperglycemia. We can tell you who has diabetes. They don't know they have diabetes, but we can tell because we measure blood glucose every hour. They just never had it done in another setting. And it is a hybrid model, as we talked about. Now we've got the community health systems joining, not just the academic medical centers. And the way it's worked is that by actually using modern data visualization technology to actually improve data quality. So at each center, every month, they go through and find out where their data quality isn't good. We had to make it really simple. It says, you should feel bad there. That's how we got them to improve their data quality. You cannot make this too subtle or too academic. I was in industry first, and I came back to academics. It amazed me how many meetings it took to say something that would be like a one-minute conversation in industry. So we tell them, you're red. It's bad. Fix it. That's how you actually have to do it in the real world. They attest to it, and they make some progress. For a sampling of cases, 20 patients a month, a very small number, they actually review the EHR and compare it to their submission to give you that next level of confidence about the data. Because if we're going to make real conclusions, I consider this the CLIA version of EHR. How do I know this EHR abstraction really resulted in good data? Because for a small, random, yet important and inclusive sample, I need to actually look at the data to make sure what I'm submitting is what I want. And this is the central representation of it to make sure we were submitting what you thought you were. Then we give them PIs, uh, performance improvement data as well. I'm going to stop with the hashing thing because I think we've got some other people that are going to go into it. So we will ixnay the hashing record linking conversation for the discussion point. Great. Thank you very much. Next up is uh, Abel Ko um, from Northwestern. And uh, he is a member of a number of uh, research groups, Emerge, um, PCORnet, and we'll be talking about some of his experience in Chicago uh, network as well. Great, thanks. So um, 
Uh, let's see if this works. So, so going from national to provincial. So I'm going to describe really what we've been doing in Chicago, thinking of it, if we were to imagine Chicago or that region as sort of a part of a national sort of cohort or population, this is sort of the approach we've taken over the past several years. It aligns a lot with what sasha has been talking about. How do you align uh, this research initiative with things that are going to provide lasting benefit for the groups that you're working with, the primary care providers, the populations that they serve? And I think that there ha actually has been some very natural alignments that have happened over the past couple of years that I think have led us to a place where I think we're in quite a good position to really sort of build on that to create a research cohort. Uh, but I, I always put this slide up really as more of a cautionary tale. It sort of centers us, grounds us uh, to realize, I think it, it reflects one of the questions that was asked earlier, how representative are we? And we're always so enamored with the electronic health records. I am an informatics person. I, I am as well. Uh, but we also have to realize the limitations of this approach. Uh, if you look at what EHRs capture, they primarily capture the clinical care that's delivered to patients. Uh, and so that's really in that bottom right corner. It's probably even a fraction of that bottom right corner because we know that it's not 100% EHR penetrance in the country today. And so you, what we, people talked about there being a lot of room at the top. Well, there's a lot of room on that upper left side too, and that's everyone who doesn't come into the system at all. And that's a huge part of the population. I think that's one of the big porous spots that we love to see people thinking about concentrating some of that value add. Uh, and I think there's a lot of gains to be made there. Uh, and when we think about this, we think to ourselves every time we think of the next add-on uh, technology project, project, how is it going to help improve, expand out the capture of data on the whole population? Because in re reality, if we're always just working within the EHR space, we're very reactive to people with diagnosed conditions. I think some of the real gains could be in maintaining a healthy population in the first place. So ideally, we might have fewer people coming in to be captured in our EHR in the first place. So I think the record linkage part is really important. Most places in the country, I think this was said earlier, uh, don't have functioning health information exchanges, although it's a nice place to sort of benchmark. So this was prior work in Indianapolis. We tracked all patients with certain types of infections to see how often they crossed over from institution to institution. The idea being that we want to be able to capture, put a, a circle around all the care that's received by a patient. And in this instance, it was possible to do it for 95% of the care delivered in this city. What we found in this instance was that about 21, 22 to 23% of the time, patients with an infection had been seen in a different system within that city. And that was sort of our benchmark. So when, when we moved to Chicago, the consideration was could we sort of link all these people's records in Chicago together across competing institutions without a functioning health information exchange? And so over the past couple of years, we've been doing that, uh, again, sort of using uh, some of the same technology, this hashing linkage, this one-way hashing, and developed a method. And over time, because we knew the benchmark of what we expected to see in terms of overlap with an urban region, we knew sort of what the performance of our matching should be. And so over the past couple of years, we've been doing that. And then we can see that in this instance, when we sort of mapped out across multiple institutions in Chicago, you can see that there's a probably about the same thing over a six-year time frame, about a 21 to 22 percent or so overlap between institutions in Chicago. So we know we're sort of getting in that same sort of benchmark for sort of the diversity of care that patients receive. And of course, one thing that we should keep very clear is that makes a it varies a lot by sort of the disease itself. So depending on the condition, there may have less or more overlap across institution. Now, one of the things we talked about, we'll be talking about is this idea, well, we want to be able to overlay some of this clinical record data by all these other things, environmental factors, socioeconomic factors, because uh, those are obviously an important part of what determines a person's risk of disease. In fact, I would argue in places like Chicago, which has tremendous disparities, that is the primary driver of your health is your socioeconomic status. Uh, now, the, it, the point of these slides is that we, we know, actually, if I go to any major city in the country today, I can tell you where the pockets of disease for chronic disease are. We just take census data, we plot socioeconomic status, and we put circles around that. That's where disease is. And we see that certainly in Chicago, like, like everywhere else. Uh, but one of the things we've recognized, too, is if we want to do this well, uh, there are obviously a couple limitations. With geographic data in particular, that is considered by many people to be one of the features that can be, make data more re-identifiable. And so one of the things we've been thoughtful about is 
within the HIPAA sort of framework, there are all these different elements of, of PHI. And in addition to the hashing linkage, that linking uh, a patients in a de-identified way uh, by unique sort of uh, identifier, there probably is need for some sort of uh, geographic linker as well that is privacy protecting. And over the past uh, uh, a couple of years, we've had one guy sort of working independently on his own, trying to figure out if there's a way to sort of create these probabilities uh, that would take away some of the re-identification risk, but still allow us to assign very small area estimates of disease. We think that'll be an important complement to the linking comp uh, uh, problem. So link by the individual, but also allow to link by small area geography. Because as you know, in many large cities, a zip code is just far too coarse a level of geography. The variation within zip code is far greater than the variation across zip codes. The other thing to cobble together is not just all the data that pieces that need to go together, but also all the funding that needs to happen, and also trying, trying to find ways to align them all together. So, uh, you know, we've had the Emerge, sort of been part of the Emerge Consortia, as I think uh, Josh has alluded to over the past couple years. And what that is a very deep set of patients within one institution with genomic data. That's great. Uh, but, you know, these, I, we've shown patients live in a, in, in a real world out there, go, go everywhere. Uh, we've been able to take some ONC funding. And ONC funding, I think, is really important to recognize as part of the Extension Center program. We were able to build relationships, and I would say that's the main outcome, build relationships with electronic health record-enabled primary care providers in many underserved and uninsured and underinsured populations throughout the Chicagoland area. And that has been a key point. In fact, uh, through this program, we have in, uh, engaged 100% of the FQHCs within the Chicagoland area, and that is a key uh, population that we want to be able to serve. Uh, we're part of the PCORnet uh, uh, initiative through PCORI, and that I think is bringing in a very uh, valuable patient-centered perspective, and that allows to also, again, expand the work to uh, link across multiple institutions and now bring in about another five million records. Uh, and then uh, with the state of Illinois, we've been bring, able to bring in a Medicaid population. So suddenly we're looking at FQHCs and a Medicaid population and patients all sort of brought in through other mechanisms, but they all align ultimately, in this case, maybe linked through the EHR, but they align ultimately with what could be uh, a research cohort. And then now more recently, again, going along with this idea that we want to find a way to sort of draw a circle around a population uh, and then start gathering information that, uh, and, and put in tools that might be useful for them. Then, uh, you know, we recently were awarded uh, uh, one of the Evidence Now um, ARC awards. And this is really exciting because it builds off that uh, Extension Center program where now we're able to go in and build quality measurement tools for primary care providers in underserved communities. And that's a really exciting thing because if we can take that and scale it, then suddenly we are able to sort of engage this wide pool of, of providers, again, in, in, in underserved populations. And so, and there's other programs that are, are, that we're waiting for. So, so I, I think the, the, the point is that it's not just about cobbling data together, uh, but it is about also trying to find ways to align all these different initiatives together in ways that are of benefit to the people we work with and serve, the primary care providers, the populations they serve. And I think that we've found that they, they, they align very nicely, actually. So, for example, with eMERGE, we've been able to identify phenotype definitions. Uh, we're able to operationalize those through uh, the peak Cornet common data model. We're able to find uh, CMS quality measures, which actually are sort of kissing cousin to some of these phenotypes that people really want to implement in their practice. And that's been where I think we found a lot of alignment, a lot of sort of uh, value for our, for our providers. So thank you. Perfect. So our um, last uh, discussant is Russ Waitman from Kansas. And uh, he is a PI of the Greater Plains Collaboratory at PCORnet site and uh, developer of EHR systems uh, as well. Thanks. And I'm going to be in, just to be different, I'm going to just talk because Josh put all this beautiful thought into these questions, and I'm just going to try to run through them as fast as I can uh, to give a perspective that might sp spur uh, discussion among the group. So for background, again, we're one of the PCORnet networks. We represent uh, 10 institutions. We'll be adding two more, Indiana, Missouri. Um, and it's pretty much a very big geographic region, kind of the opposite of ABLE situation. We run kind of up I-35 from Minneapolis down to uh, San Antonio. So first question was, uh, well, let me just say, so for me as an informatics guy, the fun stuff is how do you create a low-cost way to link together data 
you got to get identified data to link it together um, and create novelty. You know, it's really neat when you learn more about the different research communities. There's some very low-lying fruit to link together that provide value, we hope. First question, what are the major technical, cultural, and political obstacles to cross-institutional data sharing, and what types of data pose the greatest challenges? Uh, for our foundation, we really view getting timely access to the back-end relational and hierarchical data stores of the source systems as the key starting block or key files. So getting those tumor registry files from the hospital. So I think Susan was saying she has a hard time getting them from the states. Well, all the hospitals, like in our network, are sitting on them. So for our PCORnet effort, we're looking at breast cancer as our common condition. So everybody our network has loaded their NACER tumor registries in to be side by side with their EMR and their billing data. Um, so those source files, I guess somebody said, if you want to get a lot of money, go to the bank, you know, if you're going to rob a place. So go where the data is sitting. Uh, don't wait sometimes for it to come up through some uh, filtered channel. Uh, then being able to link that to uh, national ontologies that are open, like the UMLS, is kind of our next step. And then the third thing I would add, though, is be aware you, you do the best you can, but things get lost in translation, say, between a pathology synoptic report, which might be really beautiful data, but by the time it goes via HL7, it gets dumbed down to free text into the EMR. So that type of work happens. You always have a long list of where you'd like to get better. Um, and be aware that can even happen within an EHR system. A cultural, to me, stems from the fact that healthcare organizations are highly regulated. They're highly regulated service organizations. Research organizations are focused on discovery and sometimes on, you know, open sharing of information. So those are two very different cultures. Um, if you're a highly regulated service industry, you're probably playing defense more, if you think about it from a sports analogy, where when you're doing research, you're thinking offense. If you're a computer guy, you're thinking about uh, software engineers, maybe more offensive about trying to do something new, and your database administrator is protecting your base. So that's kind of, it just takes time for these organizations to work together, and time and transparency help the two organizations work together. Um, I think the novel component with PCORnet that we're trying to do is then add in not just transparency between the research organization and the health systems, but also add in transparency to our patients. Because uh, to date, they have not been involved much in the actual data sharing that's flowing on under the covers. So we, we hope to increase that area as a country. Um, politics. Um, politics, I'll just make a caveat. It's often a vehicle for negotiation and to know who's serious. So I don't view it as always politics are bad, but sometimes that's how things get accomplished. Um, but that said, I think if you look at political barriers, they're often inertia and risk avoidance is inherent in government and bureaucracies. So you'll often see whenever major initiatives comes along, there's a, you know, will a clock just run out on the administration or the new effort? Um, the other political thing you see at times is people will hold data as a power base. Uh, tough data. Tough data that I thought of as relevant to this is um, external lab results, especially genetic markers, that come back into the health system as a scanned PDF or image. So you're looking at breast cancer, you know, these great genetic tests, Oncotype DX at KU, they're coming in as like a scanned image. Great, you know, how do I grapple with that? Um, data, the other tough data is data, this is obvious, but data that people don't want to share. So that can range from things like actual business costs which if you're putting on the hat of your health system executives to get value, I talked to Steve Stites, our senior VP for health, he's like, we need to look at costs, right? But then when you're putting on your business hat, you say, I, it's hard to share that across sites. We could actually be accused of business issues, you know, that we're violating uh, laws regarding, co you know, co collaborating together as a business entity, non, you know, ineffectively. Anyway. That's probably another set of data. It happens in researchers, as I think one of the earlier people talked about. Some people just don't want to share their research data. Um, and you see, one thing I've kind of observed is that can happen with some of this clinical registry data site by site. So if you look at tumor registries, a lot of people were all on board saying, yep, we're sharing it. Had some pockets where people said, wait, that's my cancer population. Or we looked at CATH PCI data out of the NCDR registry. Took a while to get people to say, hey, if we open this up, your CATH PCI data is going to help people understand cancer survivorship, you know, because 
Cardiovascular disease is a major risk to cancer survivors. So what happens a lot when you look at data sharing is if you're within that specialty community, maybe in anesthesiology, they're all used to each other because they're a small community and they're used, they know each other inherently. When you think about building something like Picornet or precision medicine, it's a different game because you're, you're serving a wide bunch of stakeholders. So that's kind of a one thing to pay attention to, I think, on the tough data side. I'll defer to Abel on the record linkage. We're amateurs compared to him because right now we are linking places separated by hundreds if not thousands of miles. But we realize we need to solve this and we want to do the record linkage more to figure out how we can link data with data holders who are payers or CMS so that we as a network don't have to hold any of the PHI. It just kind of flows between people who do hold PHI. Uh, personal health identifiers. Uh, so that's important to us is to kind of, we're trying to follow on Abel's leads and other people's leads. It just needs to execute quickly. So that was kind of the next question, which what's the current state on matching records? The third bullet was what specific changes uh, need to happen to facilitate cross-institutional data sharing? What's most urgent? What might be most easily accomplished? And so I think I'm an optimist because things are happening at a pace greater than ever before. I think sharing the legal agreements people use, that's where a lot of this starts. Just making a clearinghouse or coming up with best practices on the fundamental legal agreements are really important. But that is probably secondary to the actual time spent together on governance and shipping data. So kind of how many burgers are we serving to share data and kind of learn from the places that are actually releasing data. And uh, that type of familiarity helps build confidence in people who are new to data sharing. Um, I think the other observation would be, as other people have said, is to have HHS and CMS lead by example. So I've, you know, I've noted that um, PCORI was created in 2010, and in the registry it says that they're supposed to receive the data from CMS or to its contractors. And to my knowledge, that still hasn't happened. Uh, as we look at PCORnet, you know, having the opportunity to take the largest insurer's data and blend that claims data together with our EHR and billing data would be really valuable. So figuring out how to do that would be a big thing to tackle. And then there was a question about is there a role for Blue Button or something like it to promote cross-institutional sharing, which I think is a really neat question because a lot of this has been talking about consenting of patient-driven type of work. Um, I'm, in, I'm largely ignorant in this. I worry about bias, as other people have talked about, is who are the people who use Blue Button versus the vulnerable populations you may want to get data from. The other thing I would think about is, as I understand Blue Button, it's mainly a pull by the patient. It's not a handshake between the research organization and the patient. So I would think there would need to be more than just a pull. It would need to be like a handshake, and it would have perhaps different terms and conditions for research-grade data, which in some cases can be better, in other cases can be worse than medical data. So that type of research red button or handshake would need to be developed. And that is the four questions. Oh, one final question was policy changes that could facilitate sharing. Again, I think working with CMS on data sharing would be really valuable as a starting place. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think um, maybe I'll, I'll um, uh, I think uh, as I listened to the, the themes of what the four of you talked, I heard a lot of commonalities. I think one of the things maybe I'll start with is a question that was part of our um, design as we thought about some of this is, can you discuss and maybe the, some of the challenges and um, unsolved um, problems that we still have with um, mapping data across the different sites. Um, uh, such and for example, you, you discussed um, how you map your labs to link codes. Each of you have mapped across different sites a lot of data which probably predates um, standardized mappings and maybe multiple EHR systems at given sites over time. How have those mappings uh, been handled across different times and sites? So we've had to take a really hybrid approach. Some people call it late binding. I call it early and late binding, <laughs> unfortunately, which is uh, you bring all of the lab data in, and that which you've got a research hypothesis around early on, you make sure is mapped really well. We do those data quality checks. People get graphs. What are the percentage of patients with hemoglobin A1Cs? Is that consistent? And then the things that you don't have a research hypothesis around, you do late binding centrally um, later on, because the reality is the amount of effort it takes to bring the, all of the data in computationally is not much more than early on. You know this better than I do. But make sure you do the early binding for things you know you need right now, get good quality, and then later on, for example, LOINC codes at University of Michigan, 
A CBC doesn't have a link code, the most common thing that we have in our results set. So we map that one manually to a non-link uh, lexicon, but more obscure tests did have link codes. We take advantage of it there. Um, but but it, it has to be hypothesis driven early on, but take it all and late find later. Yeah, I would echo that. Uh, we found, for example, when you're going to go pull data out of an EMR, you might as well just grab all the flow sheets, even though, so nursing flow sheets are this huge resource where people often informatics think physician, but the person who's sitting in front of the nurse getting back pain is the, or in front of the computer getting back pain is the nurse and, to a greater degree. And so there's huge amounts of data that's sitting there. It's like the wild west of terminology, but you can look at a lot of it and say for Picornet, the focus on obesity, Height and weight, we can find that, we can find BMI, and pulling it all in makes it then available for other people to look at and say, oh, there's something else in here that might be valuable, like a physical therapy assessment we didn't even know we had across our sites. So we use a similar approach. I was gonna add on, so, so Josh, you know, like uh, we've talked about this before, uh, it is just an important thing if we were to do this, uh, to sort of set these up front, you know, put the questions out there so people know what sort of things, what kind of data need, needs to be standardized. Uh, as you know, with Emerge, it took us quite a while to do the phenotyping work because each group sort of did late binding in essence. And the interesting co contrast is with PCORnet where sort of a lot of the efforts up front to do early binding to a common data model, uh, it's more expensive up front, but then once you have it, then the idea is that you could have much higher throughput. And I think there's sort of uh, some, some, somewhere in there is, is probably the right, right mix. Great. One of the questions was talking about federal policy changes that might be required, um, maybe one of the thornier ones. And um, one of the things I heard, you t each person talked about record linkage and, and having, you know, potentially a common identifier. Um, uh, do you have any other thoughts about um, where that could come into the process um, in terms of early versus late um, uh, binding and um, the degree of accuracy that we have to have before we call someone the same individual across two different systems? And maybe with genetics, that starts to get easier. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll um, argue that uh, I think the vendor discussion and, uh, of course, Brad Malin are going to be talking about that as well. Others will chime in. But to me, the whole notion of matching and unique IDs is very much a function of the receiver operating curve and where you want to be. Do you want to have too many false positives or no false positives at all? And so the issue of uh, matching is somewhat context dependent and certainly population dependent, which is why I get a little bit concerned about national MPIs because I don't know what that means exactly in terms of performance. I know that any good uh, record locator service matching algorithm will retune the set as new data sources come in and the prevalence of names and other things happen. I would, I, I've always felt perhaps wrongly that the national patient identifier issue isn't as relevant as it used to be because there will be a certain, unless we have a uh, digital representation of that, which we might have someday for authentication for other reasons, um, we can pretty well uniquely identify someone through a uh, matching algorithm today. We can find the clusters and say this is a unique individual with a significant amount of certainty. So I don't think we need to have a national patient identifier to do that. So, but the, the anonymous record linkage, which I think Brad Malin will talk about tomorrow, and other ways of doing this are vital resources, record locator services, vital resources, as community resources that are fairly low cost, that have been implemented in a number of regions that don't have full information exchange and allow investigators and providers enormous flexibility about how they want to share data. Great. I think the answer to that question also is a little bit audience dependent. So uh, I think uh, that's obvious that that, that that discussion has happened before in the past. Uh, but one thing I would say is that it's actually interesting, uh, the, the idea of record linkage, uh, there's, there's a value in, in, in imperfection. I think one of the things that we took away from the work that was done here was, was that not knowing exact matches sometimes is a good thing because the plausible deniability, that not knowing for certain if a person truly matches in actually can be valuable. So I think we, it's a strange thing to say, but sometimes maybe a, it's got to be good enough, but maybe not perfect, I think would be. Great. Let's open it up to some questions from the audience. Dr. Platt. You did a terrific job of uh, describing how discouraging the environment is for them. <laughs> and I, and I, I agree. So uh, speaking from a number of perspectives, but for the moment I'll say as the, as the leader of the Coordinating Center for PCORnet, working with 
you guys and, and the rest of the 55 organizations that are wrestling with this. Uh, th there's not going to be an easy solution or one that's quick, and I'm not optimistic that federal policy changes are going to help the PMI in the time it's going to need to be successful to, de to demonstrate utility to the public. But I've been thinking that the PMI has a get out of jail card, and, and that is uh, these will be consented individuals, uh, which is very different from m most of the other large record linkage research activities. And so it, it, it has seemed to me that we don't have to, we could simply say as part of the consenting that we're asking the individuals to authorize holders of their medical data, and we could qualify that in a variety of ways, to provide their information to the PMI to be linked, you don't need anonymous, you don't need anonymous uh, linking methods because they'd be fully identified. Obviously those full identifiers won't be disclosed for other purposes unless you need to go back and, and uh, collect additional information. But isn't this a much simpler problem than, uh, than, than solving the, the general case? I think it can be, but remember, I mean, we just said Wall Street Journal front cover yesterday was 150,000 IRS uh, returns were breached. I, I don't think telling the public that here's another location with your identifiable data with your consent is now sitting is necessarily a viable strategy right now. It's easier to do it given that they're consenting, but it's actually not necessary. I think that's one thing we need to admit that if you do record linkage properly, you can have that same certainty level without bringing those things together to the same place. And well, I think the public deserves that level of computational honesty to say, we'll put the little bit of work, we'll do a little bit of policy change, ONC will come out with a standard of, is it SHA-256 or is it 512? CMS will take a subset of the idea and actually do it with that to show that this can work and not assume that we're just gonna get a million patient identifiers sitting, even if it's encrypted in some centralized repository, because it's not necessary, well, is one important topic. Well, such I'm gonna push you a little more on this, because uh, I, I think Mark did a great job of talking about the policy gauntlet and all the people and organizations that have to say yes. And, and they may have very diverse reasons for not getting to yes. So I think it's gonna be a long time, Russ, before the payers say, sure, take our data and merge it with, with your information. Um, but if, if, if the person whose data it is says to the insurer, I'd like you to provide this information to the PMI. In fact, here's the authorization. What the payers tell us is, we honor that request. And so I'm, I'm, still gonna, I'm, I'm still gonna hang a lot of the future success of the PMI on the fact that the individual participants will have, not only have agreed to have their data used, but will instruct their their providers and their insurers and others who hold their data to make it available to the PMI. And it seems to me that, that solves an enormous number of the problems that could otherwise cripple the enterprise. Yeah. Great Thanks. point. I'm going to let uh, Bray, as one of the co-chairs, break in real quick. Thanks. Um, number five. So I, I guess, in, so I'm coming at this from the patient perspective, and I look at that crazy slide with the 600 workarounds and all the little lines and all the boxes, and I hear, okay, well, we can just use an algorithm. We don't need to have an actual NPI. And I don't get it. I really don't get it. I, I know I hear about privacy, and I know that we need to obtain consent. But that looks like crazy, and it looks like a lot of work. And I also don't get able, I think I'm going to get your quote wrong, but something about maybe we don't really need to know if that's the same patient or not. And I completely don't get that. So I don't know if you guys can help me if I'm missing something. No, no, I, th I think that that's right. I mean, so actually, I, I agree with what Rich said. I think it's getting along with what you're, you're saying. One of the things around this is if we have patients activated to be owners or holders of their own data with the ability to consent to specific access uh, in a secure format, all this goes away. I think the, the craziness is, is a, a reaction. I think it's a reaction, a practical reaction to trying to get work done in the current environment uh, in the absence of that. And so I think if we can get to that state, much of this goes away. And I agree with that. And in fact, it's one of the real reasons, I think, why health information exchanges have failed to work. Uh, because unless you had an environment where people were willing to, at every level in the organization, say, yes, we're going to sign off on this. And that oftentimes people said no for lots of reasons. They still say no for lots of reasons, even for the work we're doing now. Uh, it's just not sustainable. Uh, and so the, the end goal, I think, should be that. And one of the things that we should be thinking about, actually, is given that, then how do we standardize the way we do that? In other words, can we do it in a way which scales? That part itself needs to scale. Like, we need to have 
uh, fine-grained consent in a way that uh, accommodates the majority of the population. So that, that part, I think, is something that we should focus on. Let's go ahead and take another question, because I know we have those questions moving up. Hi. Um, just a qu quick sort of clarification. Um, one of the points that I made earlier this morning is the ability, at least, to follow people in our settings uh, sort of passively, that after, after 10 years, you know, 55 or 60 percent of our overall population are still members and have been continuously enrolled in our settings. I don't know if that's the situation in what you're talking about. You can do all this data sharing and that type of thing, but if you can't necessarily follow people in a longitudinal context, then I'm not certain how useful that is, except if you can actually do what you're trying to do in the Chicago area, you know, where you actually try and link individual people across different systems, et cetera, and then, and then you're able to follow people in that way. And, and so I think that's really uh, an important sort of uh, type of data sharing that, that's really been talked about. And we talked about it a little bit, Sue Gapster mentioned it, in the context of linking with cancer registries and that type of thing. But it's very different from p data sharing where you're sharing information on different groups of people to build a really large uh, cohort or something like that, and then data sharing across systems so you can actually follow the in individuals you know, as they transition from one system to another. Those regional opportunities are founded based upon extending beyond the academic medical center. Um, as uh, you have your quaternary care done there and your secondary care done at the community center, and that's largely based upon giving those community centers an incentive to be participating in these initiatives. Um, I think that gets back to, you know, in an employer insurance world, you know there's going to be movement, but if you can get the majority of facilities in a region through something that brings them to these communities of care we keep talking about, then these record linking strategies do become necessary and helpful to give you full continuum uh, in a region like Chicago or southeastern Michigan, things like that. Quickly, uh, Mark, uh, Abel, or Russ, do you have any knowledge about how many of your patients were maybe at a site for a given number of years and then switched to another site and you can link them across? Yeah, so, so we, we, we looked at that, and that was the number around the 20-something percent. Over a six, and it makes a difference over the time span. So obviously, uh, crossover increases over time sort of linearly almost. Um, but all this work is, is I, I agree, this is kind of craziness. I mean, the fact is we, this is a necessary evil. We didn't get into the record linkage space because we wanted to. We did because we had to. Um, if we wanted to be able to answer questions about what is the prevalence of a condition or who, who our patients are seen consistently in our group that we could follow as a cohort, we had to do this, and it's not a space we want to be in, but we've had to do it. And so I think there are policy changes that can make a difference, but um, are, are we there yet? Are we going to wait? No. I think we've got, we got to work with what we have. I'll just say, because it may look ugly, but that's what you've got to do. And I don't think to, um, it's, I don't think it's a policy issue. It's a matter of getting the work done, because if I do want to share data technically with a payer, we could match on a beneficiary ID and do that in a hashed way so the network doesn't have to hold the data, but each recipient can exchange data. So some of that exchange just needs to happen technically to overcome some of the policies that are in place to protect the patient. The other comment, and I just want to get back to the, the, blue, the blue button issue about are we good enough if we just have a lot of patients who are willing to consent. So as described by other people, there are some bias issues with the type of patient that wants to do that type of activity. And the other concern is Blue Button and Health Exchange, and the meaningful use effort, has built on a very large federal investment of what does it mean for a patient to be able to download their medical record. I think for phase two of Picornet, we're just beginning to have those discussions of what does it mean for a patient-powered network that wants to receive research data from a CDRN what does that look like? And what are the promises each of us give each other about what that type of, what that means, that they would contribute data to us and vice versa? So I think there's not many, it's probably not policy driven as much as we need to work together to figure out what that looks like. And Great, I think um, let's, we, have, we have a lot of questions up and not much time, so we'll keep going. Thanks, um, Rachel Florence from the PCORI, and I'm the program director for PCORNet. So in that respect, I've been working with Ross and Abel and Rich uh, for about 16 months now, and I want to make another plug for uh, sharing the lessons that we've all learned in the past 16 months with the PMI uh, community and with Bray, of course, who's uh, co-chairing this. Um, and I'll just, just a few quick points. I mean, we've learned a lot about patient engagement, and Ross made the point about the, um, I think, the pilots that we're doing with the PPRNs and the CDRNs and being able to share 
um, the lessons from uh, linking patients who are willing to participate in research with the systems. Um, we're about to launch some pilots with uh, health plans and with CMS um, in order to really move that work forward as well. So it, uh, Rich is right, it's, it's slow, uh, tedious, difficult work, um, but we've started, we certainly started sort of um, inroads into that and we're uh, more than happy and willing to share this with the PMI community um, as you move forward in your um, endeavor. So thanks for the opportunity. Great. Thanks. Hi. Um, my, my comment was very similar to Rich's, maybe because we shared a conversation on the bus this morning. Um, but I, I guess I just want to push you a little more on this question of patients blue button their data maybe from your data sets into another place where it could be shared more broadly. I think I agree that if we take an organizational approach to the governance, um, there's a lot of good that comes from that, a lot of great conversations, but the incentives, some of them have to do with protecting patients, many of them have to do with other things. Um, and so I'm just wanting to hear from you your reactions to the idea of a model that might consent people into a new thing, literally allowing them to take the data from your data set and direct it as they wish into a new cohort. Um, and, and what, to what extent that solves some of the problems that we currently face around cross-organizational decision-making? And what, a di what new problems that might create that, I mean, obviously there's privacy, there's governance, there's like, but, but like really, like how could that work and, and what kinds of challenges does that pose for you as you think about it? And there is a patient-directed um, data session tomorrow um, that, that does have uh, Blue Button as one of the topics here. So maybe focus on the... Yeah, um, yeah Hugh Metrics and others are talking about that tomorrow. I would make a meta-level comment about this, and that is that the beautiful thing about this conference, this entire initiative, is so much of it is kind of off the grid. And if it sounds a little bit depressing, it's only because, as was said at the beginning, the goal is extraordinarily audacious. I suspect we would have been... Uh, skeptical if we were engineers when we proposed the moonshot as well. I'm, I'm very optimistic about this. But what I'm most optimistic about is we don't know the answers to these things. We can't have a committee meaning to figure the right answer. People are going to be trying, as we talked about today, the wonderful things about screen scraping websites and consolidating consents, web-based consents, the work from Vanderbilt, all over the country. We don't know what works. And what's so cool about this is we can innovate and we can share ideas and over about five years it usually takes, we're gonna figure it out. So I, I just don't know if the right answer can come but I certainly think the right questions are being asked and the right experiments are being done. Can I just, just to be sure you understood, I, I'm not talking about me going to my provider that's not part of a cohort and blue buttoning, I'm talking about enabling your participants to make a decision to go do something that's not governed by you uh, except as a participant in that broader effort. So can, I just love any reactions to that idea. I, I think it's the right thing. Good idea. I, I mean, it, it has All to happen. Favorite. And in fact, I think it's, you know, we don't have the tools yet, or maybe people don't want to make the tools for it yet, but it, it's the right thing. And I'll just say, you know, I think the adaptable study out of PCORI around the aspirin uh, trial of how do we share data with the PPRN that's going to be enrolling people, we're going to figure out a lot of that in that trial. The early thinking we've had, and we feel this is a big focus over the next several years, is the people running a patient-powered network, or let's say this cohort, or, and as we talked in a prior panel, they may be small cohorts cobbled together. They're going to have an IRB protocol. I'll, I would defer to people like Pearl to know what the right way we'd phrase this. They'll have an IRB protocol. They'll come to our network with that protocol. See, these patients have all signed up to be an e-healthy heart and you're sitting on a lot of their data, we figure out how we govern that under an IRB protocol and we set up some type of regular process for how we have an investigator within our network who's familiar with the process and it's a trust issue. So that's where to me, part of it's gonna be trust, you know, is building familiarity and trust to say, yes, I'm comfortable, you know, we know about this investigator, we know what this project is and we will ship them data periodically for the patients that are consented through their protocol. Great. Well, our time is basically up. Quick, one quick last question. Uh, okay. I'll try to make it real quick. My name is John Birch. I'm a private investor. And I wanted to follow up very specifically on something that uh, Sachin uh, mentioned, which is the need to view the infrastructure that's put in place for the PMI as something which is going to last and presumably serve not just precision medicine research, but precise medicine. Uh, 
And if you could talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and one, one component of that, Abel, is something that you mentioned, or at least displayed, I think, which is excellent visualization tools. Uh, and it seems to me that that's one of the crucial things that practitioners are going to be needing f for these incredibly new and diverse data streams is how will they visualize and interpret the information uh, as part of the practitioner community after the, after the initiative is over. I think that could take 30 minutes. Um. Well, thank you, too. That could be a session. <laughs> That's a great closing comment. <laughs> great. Well, um, with that, uh, let's thank all our panelists. The, um, the next up is to a break, so we will break. Good afternoon. We're into the uh, home stretch here. My name is Pearl O'Rourke. I'm uh, one of the members of the working committee, and my day job is... Um, I oversee all the IRB systems for Partners Healthcare in Boston. I am so happy to be moderating a panel that has no IRB issues. Um, so no, I've heard central IRB thrown around. I've heard IRB said in very derogatory terms, but no questions or comments regarding that topic will be entertained. Um, the topic of this session is actually quite intriguing. White House and Office of the National Coordinator, Vision for Future U.S. Health Data Infrastructure in 45 minutes. Um, now, I think we've all heard a number of comments through the many talks today, and I think these folks have a tall order here. We've heard comments such as, there's not going to be sharing until it's, quote, written into law. Uh, we need executive orders. It's got to be a condition of grant award. Um, we've heard people saying, yeah, I'm really willing to share, except for that little privacy thing. I really need some guarantees around that. We had specific questions about what federal policy changes need to occur. So with that as uh, the entree, not to put these two as the federal government, they are closer than the rest of us. So we shall unfairly call them the federal government. So we are very fortunate today to have Karen DeSalvo, who's the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology out of HHS. And if you Google her, one of the best ones is it comes up as federal government's healthcare champion. So, um, Karen, I am awed by that. We also have Maina Shung, who is the health data lead of the U.S. Digital Service, formerly known as USDS, for those of you in the know. Um, and this is an office in the White House. And she's a senior advisor to the chief technology officer. And at least what I could figure from Googling you is that you worry about how to make healthcare data more usable, coordinated, transparent, and make all of us happy. So with that as the intro, the way we have set up this panel is both Karen and Mina are going to do about a 10 minute, no more, open, five minute opening comments. Um, and then we have generated some questions. I really do hope to have most of the time for audience participation. So Karen? Well, th uh, thank you very much, Pearl. And um, we are from the government and we are here to help. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> You'll be able to ask your question in this round. So <laughs> to yourself out there, John, get ready. <laughs> Um, well, uh, really, th thank you all for giving us some time to come up here and uh, give some perspective from, from where we are trying to create a policy and, and support a technology framework that not only allows precision medicine to happen in the form of a cohort or some uh, other kind of a research environment, but one in which uh, we can create a learning health system that makes this ubiquitous and available in, in a responsible and an equitable way for everybody in the country. Um, I thought what I would do today is is just begin uh, hearing some of the comments earlier by putting a little bit of frame on what the Office of the National Coordinator is. I, I know that I have a lot of people in the room who know, but I wanted to level set and talk a bit about the success and the good news about where we are in terms of uh, advancement of health information technology, talk about um, some of the challenges, what we're working on to address it, and then uh, maybe end up with just sort of some general thoughts. And we do hope that there's a lot of, of, of Q&A. The Office of the National Coordinator was created in 2004 by executive order of President George Bush with the idea that there was this um, need to help spur and catalyze and 
focus not only the federal partners around digitizing the health care and uh, health experience of Americans, but also to work with the private sector and states to help bring them along. At the time, uh, rates of adoption of electronic health records were quite low, and the notion that we would move off of paper was still somewhat radical. Um, over the course of the years, they used a variety of levers, uh, whether that was uh, pulling the VA and the DOD uh, Department of Defense along or um, working with state government, but it was really in 2009 with the passage of the High Tech Act that there was a, a tremendous opportunity to catalyze the, the marketplace, the private sector in particular, though it did touch on some of the parts of the public sector, uh, with the investment of what is now about $29 billion in monies to help, uh, help offset the cost of adoption of electronic health records, and then also some $2 billion in grant monies to help understand what were the cultural and business and other challenges and opportunities to advance the digitization of the care experience and health in this country, really with the end goal to see that every American has access to an electronic health record that is their own. And um, that, that work was, in those early years, very focused on seeing that we were able to um, adopt electronic health records in healthcare institutions. And this is a really important frame because it led a lot of our work in the last five years. It was very successful. Um, by, many, uh, by, by many of the metrics uh, that you would use, we have now widespread adoption, certainly well across the tipping point. More than 90% of hospitals are using electronic health records. And nearly every Medicare discharge in this country has a digital footprint. So there is a record of that, of that care experience. Uh, in, the, in the physician world, uh, in the pr health professional world, it's about two-thirds are using some kind of electronic health record, some more sophisticated than others. Um, and so uh, really, just about anywhere you go in the country, you see that there, there's been a pretty good uptake in adoption. At the same time, you heard a couple of the other success stories. Uh, we were able to develop efforts like the, the Blue Button, which was designed to see that uh, consumers would have access to their health information. It wouldn't just be facing internally to institutions and doctors, um, and that we would create really a movement, a social movement that would help to pull the data, not just to, to push it. At the, the time that I became national coordinator, uh, just about a year and a quarter ago, it was, it was really clear that a few things were, were the case. One was um, all this data was pushing at the doors, and it wanted to be information, and it wanted to move. And it wasn't just that um, the doctors and, and payers and others wanted to see it. it was, there was a really increasingly loud cry on the part of consumers to see that their health information was going to be available when and where it mattered to them. That they would have it in a form that would make sense, that it would help them make decisions, be more engaged, um, help them care for family members, and um, that we would be, we were getting closer to a place where we were swimming in enough data that could become knowledge that would allow us to do things like precision medicine. And quite frankly, it's because of that foundation that we now have the opportunity to even not just dream about precision medicine, but I know that many in this room are aware that we are doing it on the ground. And it's because we have this foundation uh, from some of this investment in health information technology in the country. What's also changed uh, compared to where we started is that the, the marketplace has evolved. There is um, different payment expectations in healthcare that require data sharing that uh, make it such that we are paying for population level value and outcomes as opposed to just individual visits. So we need to be able to aggregate data. We need to be able to look longitudinally at people's care and there are more shared metrics. Um, we also, I think, as a country, have a sh new expectation about what good data feels and looks like. The way that we live our lives in other sectors isn't the way it is in healthcare, and so this consumer and doctor and payer and other demand is, is really about making the, the business of medicine have a data model and an information model that's more like other sectors. And there's newer technologies emerging. For those of you that are following it, um, there's work going on to uh, develop a technology called FIRE, which is better, faster, smarter, cheaper, um, in fact, uh, easy enough to do on a weekend, some pretty exciting, interesting projects on your home computer, which maybe we could talk about later, that uh, stand to help leapfrog us over kind of the, the kinds of challenges that we've been pushing up against um, for some period of time. So the world has, has evolved dramatically. It's also, I think, become increasingly clear to Abel's point in his slide, one of my favorites that I use a lot. Uh, the world is not just about health care, nor is it just about electronic health records. The health IT universe's ecosystem is vast. We're collecting data on ourselves 
constantly. Um, we need that information because what happens to us in our health is more than getting to the doctor. And so we need, particularly for efforts like this, to have a more fulsome picture of people's health. We need to create a policy and technology world that allows for that, protects the data, protects patient choice, and, and allows us to be, as consumers, um, not dependent on those of us that are doctors and trying to uh, not always unlock that data. What we're doing from a policy standpoint is just that, working to unlock the data. After, boy, um, almost a year of conversations in the community, working with the private sector, iter iteratively evolving our work, we came, a, came really upon there were three big challenges that we needed to overcome, three critical pathways, and we have a work plan to get through those, which I'd love to talk more about in the Q&A. But the, really, the three big areas have all been mentioned today, as they always are. One is about technology, not just about the data dictionary, the standards we use to collect things like systolic blood pressure, but the way that we move data or the way that we protect data. Um, there is then, secondly, an issue around incentives to move data or to not move data. And some of those are positive incentives and some of those are negative. We had big positive incentives around meaningful use. We're moving into a more negative incentive area because we're no longer giving out money. We're penalizing providers. But there are other things that are emerging in the marketplace to uh, discourage data blocking um, or hoarding, as, you, as the case might be. And then finally, there's a, a, an important opportunity and challenge around trust that consumers uh, are concerned about privacy and security, though they do have an expectation that we're sharing their health information on their behalf. They, frankly, want to share it um, on their own behalf without having to ask for so much permission. Uh, we do have real challenges, though, around data security, and we also have uh, challenges around the way we have such a federated system of information exchange, electronic health records, and state governments, frankly so that data sometimes gets stopped at artificial boundaries and we have to work on harmonizing not just the technology but the policies that, that surround that, particularly in areas like privacy and security which were some of the things that were mentioned. We have um, put out a roadmap, which is a blueprint to move forward in all those areas. We're working on structuring that um, with clear expectations about what we need to do by when and working with private sector and states on what they want to do by when. We've had Lots of great input from um, providers and vendors and states and consumers who want to lean in and, and raise their hand and say, we'll take that part. Very specifically, though, we have put out a list of uh, recommended standards to get us closer to a data dictionary and some implementation standards for moving information that's, that's in the technology space. And we're really encouraged by what the private sector is doing with FIRE as a technology to help us leap, leapfrog, and we want to continue to support that with them. In the second area around incentives, the HHS is, is really uh, working aggressively to move all of its payment levers in such a way that we're encouraging data to move. We're working with the Department of Defense, you'll hear more about that in their procurement to see that that's going to incentivize uh, interoperability and, and data unlocking. Uh, just to, to give you a couple of examples, um, there are some negative incentives with the Federal Trade Commission who's interested in the space. And then for trust. Um, we are, we are proposing a set of uh, governance rules of the road and expectations for how we're all going to behave in the marketplace to protect consumers, and that's not just the people receiving care, but the people delivering care, and then beyond, uh, other consumers of the data like public health. Um, all of that is, a, again, a collective approach that we want to do with the private sector because I've said this a bunch of times. I'm going to say it to you all. We cannot, should not, and will not do this alone. This is bigger than the government. This is really about what we all need to get to so that the data is free and able to be useful. And I'm just going to end with this kind of one comment because it was asked earlier. What does precision medicine have to do at all with the broader landscape of health IT uh, as we move forward? And, and here's here's what's really incredibly exciting about it to me. Um, here's what I hear that consumers want with their data. They want, a, they want to be the locus of control, not the electronic health record or the institution. They want a longitudinal health record that talks about each of their care experiences, sure, also talks about their health. Sometimes that's exposure, sometimes that's behavior, sometimes it's family history, it could be genetics. They want something that's a fulsome picture of the medical and non-medical determinants of health that carries across their lifetime and that they can access wherever they move, whatever insurer they have, whatever job they have, wherever their kid needs to go to camp and they need to pull down the immunization records because they've got their kids' stuff. So that longitudinal health record, which has gone by lots of names historically, is the kind of thing that when you really carefully listen 
that people in this country want. When, when we started out in 2004 and then restarted in nine and said every American will have access to their electronic health information, um, I think we thought of that in a lot of versions, but increasingly it's about something that I think the PMI cohort could start to explore. It's a way that we pull data around a person longitudinally and, and really paint a picture of their overall health and not just a series of, of healthcare episodes. So if we can sort out some of the technology and policy and, and rules of engagement around this, if we can shift the power so that it's not about, um, to Claudia's question, enabling patients to, to move their data. You said it a little bit differently than that, but this, this way that we are forcing people in this country to ask permission about their own health information, to send it to scientists or to send it to others, I, I think we really will have moved to a new era in, in health data, and that's the place that will enable not just this kind of research, but this kind of health and learning health system that's going to change the way that we're thinking about people's health in this country. So I'm going to stop there. Thanks, Karen. Mina? Hello. That's excellent. Thank you, guys. Um, so first, I just want to thank everyone here for, first and foremost, the amazing work that you do and that you have highlighted to us today. I have changed my notes so many times over the course of today because I have heard so many amazing things here. Um, and second, for coming and sharing that. But, but, so I'm an engineer, and you know, fundamentally, when you want to build a system or, or come up with a moonshot, like I'm all for moonshots <clears throat> that are difficult to achieve. But, uh, but the number you always want to have a near-term goal and little successes along the way that lead you to know that it is possible to do what you are proposing to do. And the conversation today has been more confidence building than anything I could have imagined. So I, so, so I will not speak for very long because I know that the expertise is across this room and really I want to get the, infer I want to understand your needs and, and really understand what we can do to help enable what we've just heard about to expand more and to cover more people and to be, um, you know, what is the infrastructure necessary to support the things that, that you guys are talking about? Um, so I guess the first thing that I would say is, you know, you all are aware that this is a central and very personally important priority for the president, for the NIH, for uh, HHS broadly, um, for, you know, our partners at the DOD and the VA. And there is a lot of bipartisan support. There is a tremendous amount of momentum. Um, but I think we need to think about how do we show interim results and how do we keep um, everyone engaged and that includes patients and that includes non-patients and the population abroad. Um, how do we show results you know, tomorrow, in six months, in two years, and in 10 years so that we can maintain the momentum and the excitement that we see now and so that people really understand how it pertains to them and, and we can maintain the support. So, you know, one of the questions that I asked before, but I, I think my first ask would be help us identify what those interim goals are and what is really possible. You guys know better than we do because you have already been doing this. So help us figure out, okay, what should we be aiming for? Um, and I think everyone in this room understands the benefits of the type of science that we're talking about. I think we could choose anyone here and they would say, I understand you know, several stories. We could take a woman who is diagnosed with cancer and you know, provide her with the best possible care and tomorrow we would have a different treatment regimen for her than in three months because we would learn new things about people who are just like her. Right? Any one of us could come up with those stories, but I'm not sure that we have all had the opportunity to share those stories broadly enough. And so I would encourage you all to to take this initiative as an opportunity to start to share those stories and generate a groundswell of support. I think a lot of it is local, but I think there are many localities and, and the folks here really just have a wealth of information about how this impacts the lives of, of average people and, and not average people because this is about precision. And, and I think that's um, just an exciting thing from this room. So, so I think that's my first ask. Um, from this, this conversation is ostensibly about technology. So I'll, I'll take a step back and say, um, so when the internet was young, uh, 
it was an incredibly transactional system, right? It was not centered on surfing or arbitrary tasks. You didn't go there to look for everything. It was a way for people to transmit and store information. It was for specific purposes and for specific groups of people to have access to specific information. Does this sound familiar? And, and now the system has grown, usage has grown, and when we can take a step back and look at usage patterns, look at the data that is stored there, look at the myriad different ways every, almost every person participates, we learn a lot of things about ourselves. Um, we use this as a way of phenotyping people, right? So researchers, marketers, product designers, this is how we determine if you're gonna be happier in a Prius and a Wrangler, or a Wrangler, but it also you know, helps us define, like predict when there's going to be civil unrest, it helps us understand how people behave. It helps us define whether interventions are working. If I listen in on Facebook or Twitter, I can determine why people don't like my TV show or um, why they have stopped watching. Um, what are the side effects of different things that are medical or not medical? You know, People will start to talk about those things. And that was a challenging problem. It was a challenging set of problems, but there were you know, ambitious groups of people, just like all of you here, and, and it, is on its way to being solved. I don't think that we will ever solve all of the problems of how do we match up disparate data sets, but I think we have a very similar set of challenges ahead of us. Um, we, in this room alone, have a tremendous amount of data. Um, and I think figuring out how we bring that together has been a lot of the conversation here. And, and I know we don't know the answer, um, but I think I have heard emerging trends in this conversation. I think the people in this room understand how we start to bring it together. And, and so I guess my second ask is to help us understand what pieces of infrastructure um, are truly necessary in order, and, and, and I mean that infrastructure writ large. So I think there are technological elements that are needed. I also hear that there are policy elements that are needed. I hear that there are, um, frameworks around consent that are needed. And, and many people in this room already have solutions. I think there are emerging solutions, but helping us to understand um, what those things are. I would say, you know, the thing that we are committed to is making sure that the hard thing that all of the scientists do is the science. Um, the questions that you guys should be focused on are the questions of how do I ask hard questions of this data, not how do I um, have to build some sort of a manual query for this system so that I can download data every 30 days. It shouldn't be how do I have to go and reconsent and re um, build a process around this. So, so the thing that, that we are committed to and that I would encourage you all to give us feedback on is what are those barriers that we can help you with and help clear out of the way so that we can focus on the science and we can focus on the care. Um, and I see that we are open for discussion, which is great. So I guess my, my last really quick point on, on the question of what technologies do we need to, to bring everything together. If I look across the organizations in this room, there are easily 150 million lives worth of data. And Francis isn't here anymore, but I know that, that we've been talking about, you know, whether it should be one million or two million. I, I think if we hear, you know, I'm very excited for this next panel. I think there's almost 150 million lives just on the stage for that. But just to understand what results we can really achieve from the types of data that we currently have and then start to build a roadmap. How do we build an arc from where we currently are to where we think and know we can be in 10 years? I think there's a tremendous opportunity and really looking to the group of people here to help us figure out what that roadmap looks like. So thank you all very much. Thank you both. Oop, we can clap now? Okay. Kathy started clapping and she's so important we had to follow. Um, we are now open for questions and actually as people start going up to the mic, one of the questions I had, and you kind of flipped it around on me, I was going to say, so the panel before you heard this, all these problems we're having with interoperability and sharing, how can you guys help us? Yet what I just heard from you was, you need to tell us how we can help you. Um, but are there ways that you could make this, at least you know, finding the solutions a little bit easier for us? You have you know, access to different things than we. Well, so, so 
what what we think um, at um, HHS and administratively, I would say, and what we've heard in feedback is that the ways that we can be helpful are, I'll give you some examples. We can, um, I'm going to talk about interoperability broadly, Pearl, mm -hmm. not specifically in this area, but it's got some similar, so, some similar solution points. So we can use our leverage of our certification program at, at ONC, so we can say that if you're going to use a product, um, an electronic health record, as an example, it has to have a, a, some features, and some of those features would have to, first of all, make it e make the data less messy. So use more specific standards for capturing data. You'd have to um, use a, kind of a public API mechanism to make the to unlock that data to mm -hmm. make it available, which would be a different. These are things we've proposed in our current certification rule, and. Um, we would also find a way to monitor and track and report out whether or not products are actually behaving that way in the marketplace. These are all changes from the way we're doing things now, and we propose those in our proposed rule. The comment period closes tomorrow. In case you'd like to make some comment and you forgot, um, you're welcome to do that. And so those are specific things we believe we can do. On the other hand, if you think about APIs, which are I'm assuming this crowd is really savvy in this, but you know, essentially a doorway to the data, and that that it's not really incumbent upon ONC itself or, or any part of government to write the code for that to happen. It actually seems to be working much better by us saying we'd like to see that, um, setting a table for our advisory committees to think that through, and then having the private sector, as they have, come together in a group that's called the Argonauts to solve that, to find a way to create a doorway that could be shared in common and work to pull out a common clinical data set that would be available not just for consumers, but consumers could choose to send to precision medicine scientists. So those are, that's a very concrete way that we want to be helpful. It also means, though, that we have to be thinking, as I said earlier, about not just electronic health records and certainly not just about the Meaningful Use Program, which incentivizes it. We need to think about all the ways that, um, whether it's the the, our, us as a provider or purchaser of care, Department of Defense, VA, whether it's about us as um, a leader, as a payer, and say we're going to pay for products that behave in that way in the marketplace, and we're going to incentivize providers and payers also to behave in that way in the marketplace so the data becomes more fluid. We've got, for example, in the most recent Medicaid managed care rule, some expectations or recommendations in the proposed rule about what that would look like in the Medicaid world. We've got some out in the accountable care rule. So I think what my mes message might be to these folks globally is, is to, we shouldn't look just in the meaningful use program for the ways right. that the federal government's doing that. We should be, you all should be looking all across the ways that we have uh, incentives. Um, and then I could talk about trust later, but I won't keep going. Okay. Mina, do you want to add to that at all? Yeah, I would just add, uh, another thing that we can really be helpful on is raising up stories of what works. So uh, recognizing that there are any number of challenges that you know, each organization here is encountered, but also recognizing that each of you has solved some subset of those challenges in a unique way, and some of those work incredibly well, right? We heard about how um, in Michigan they had written ways to extract the data from all of the different EMRs. We're about to see a bunch of companies that have really figured out that specific piece of the puzzle. Other groups here have really identified how they, you know, have a very sophisticated way that they deal with um, some of the consent and the privacy challenges. And I think helping to collect and raise up stories of what works and, and starting to build a template or a roadmap for other organizations to follow, and also making it easier for the policies and the laws to track to what actually plays out and what actually proves to work is an opportunity um, where we can be very helpful. Could yeah. I? Uh, I'm sorry. Oh gosh. So on the on the other hand, there are some, and we could have some questions about things like patient identifiers or matching. We could talk about HIPAA. We could talk about things that we can do with our bully pulpit, as she mentioned, which can be pretty powerful to lift up for, for the president to say this matters and we need data to be more fluid mm -hmm. and and to set some expectations. We can also use um, our bully pulpit to help educate around HIPAA so that it's not used as an excuse not to move data, but actually it's it's used appropriately when, when it should. There may be places that that stops and, and, and there needs to be some other opportunity for Congress or states to step in and we, we want to be helpful there as well. Okay, I have Bray and then Ellen and then Eric. Number five, Mike. Uh, Bray Patrick Lake. Um, I've had a lot of coffee, and I'm trying to contain myself because I'm sitting here. 
lot of patients don't have 10 years. So um, when you're talking about the bully pulpit, and then we do need to actually you know, rise up and see what we can actually get this administration to address, patients need you to do that. Um, I've been to probably less meetings than most of you about these issues, and they're the same issues, and they don't go away. And I'm very concerned from the patient perspective that people are you know, making money hand over fist doing things that are bad for patients. And I really don't understand why we don't just stop. Why, why should anybody bring on a new technology that doesn't talk to another one? Um, isn't there a point where we hold people accountable? And, you know, if you want to go sell products, go do it outside of healthcare, but don't do something that hurts patients. And so let me wrap this around because I know you're in a tough spot, but I feel like we have to come up with a plan, and I want to know, I hear the talk about something will be done and in 10 years, but I'm really unclear about what exactly will be done, and I don't understand data standards, why it's going to take 10 years to get to that, because I feel like the, it's not the technological challenge. It's, it's cultural, and it's bureaucratic, and it's all these other things that patients don't have time to wait for a solution. So um, our goal is not to wait 10 years. It's a, um, what, what people need to understand is that what we have proposed is our actions that start have already started. We have already started executing on the plan. We've released standards in la this last January. We have been acting on rulemaking in the last few months. So we have, we're not waiting 10 years. We agree with you. We say that um, to get ubiquitous, the reality is, is that technology and policy and culture might take that long. I hope it doesn't. Um, we, we have set discrete goals at three and six years to, to move us to a place that that we are in a closer time range, seeing that we're over a tipping point in three years so that data is moving. Quite frankly, though, data does move, and this is, I think, one of the other things people need to remember, is that in many communities, this one, Memphis, just to use Tennessee as an example, uh, data is available in uh, Nebraska, I was just there, they have 97% of their community has their health information available in a health information exchange. It's just not always used because the incentives aren't quite right, right? So we're, that's why we're using our payment drivers to, to tell the healthcare system, you need to also look if there's already been a test done and not repeat it. Don't stick the kid again. Don't put the person again in a CAT scanner, right? Use the information that's available. So there are, it's not just about technology, you're right, but that's a little part of it. It's not, it's not just about the right incentives. We're going to pull every lever we can that'll make the most difference. It's also about culture and trust, and we have to do some work in that space. So agree with you. It shouldn't wait 10 years. We don't want it to. That's why we've already started acting. Okay, Ellen? Hi, Ellen Clayton at Vanderbilt. Um, I have a couple of points to make about areas where I would hope that you would uh, take leadership. Um, one of them is I think you have a real opportunity to tell the population about why this is a good thing and why they ought to participate. Um, you have the biggest bully pulpit in the world, and I hope you will exercise it. Um, the second thing is that I think you need to think about ways to uh, enable uh, community participation and um, in the oversight of the federal databases. I realize that federal policy currently uh, prohibits that, but I think if you want to think about trust, I think that's absolutely essential and needs to be addressed. Um, and then uh, as a subset of that, um, one of the things you need to think about is our, can you create firewalls between um, these amazing federal databases and, um, and other branches of the federal government? Um, so, I, I mean, I'm just putting that out there. And then the final thing um, I would urge you to help think about is how we can come up with uh, ways to disincentivize misuse of information. Now, that obviously has two parts. One is how you define misuse. Um, but the other thing is it also says what kinds of penalties you can put in place. And by the way, who can bring them? I mean, so if there's a privacy breach under HIPAA, um, the federal government can sue, but patients can't. That makes a big difference. Um, but let me give you an example that really puts this squarely on the table. Here at Vanderbilt with BioView, which is our big, you know, DNA database that's been here for 50, almost 15 years now, um, people sign data use agreements, but they also know that their use is going to be monitored, and if they try to access the electronic health record in order to try to re-identify patients, um, they will be found and they will be punished. People at Vanderbilt lose their job every year 
for inappropriately accessing the electronic health record. None of our BioView investigators, I'm happy to say, but, um, but you know, but when the data leaves Vanderbilt and goes to DB Gap, there are no such protections. And so I think that real, or no such penalties for those who misuse. So I think that we really need to talk about, I mean, the actions in misuse. And so that's really where I would hope you would focus a lot of your attention. So those are just some of the ideas I have about things for which you could provide leadership. I know there are some laws being uh, thought about to send up to you, et cetera. But boy, these are, these are all hot button, button issues that I think in this biobank domain that I've been working in for 20 years at least. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Those are tremendous. And, and we have teams working on several of the issues that you've Highlighted. I think one other thing that I would ask is your first question was help educate the public on why this is a good thing and why they should participate. And I could not agree more. And maybe we can do this as a follow-up email or I don't know what the right forum is, but we can come up with answers to that question, but you all can come up with far better answers to that question. And in particular with why it's good for this patient this month and why it's good for this patient you know further out you guys have studies that have gone on for some of you have data for 30 years which is phenomenal so i guess one ask i have that will be explicit and we'll, we'll send out a note is help us understand what we need to be saying in that conversation with the public okay thank you Great. and before i go to eric i would expand ellen's question to it's not just the pmi many of those issues are for any research and any data use yeah. so it's across the board eric so I was sitting at lunch the other day at Intel. Oh my God, we just can't have a relaxing lunch. I mean, it was like, can we just like talk about our families or something? And they're like, hey, Eric, what kind of data do you think is going to go into this PMI thing? So I brought up some of the documents. And we, you know, I've got a mathematician and a bunch of other geeks sitting around me. And they can't help themselves. And the next thing you know, they've guessed very quickly, back of the napkin, that over a 10-year, so assuming the cohort lasted 10 years, that we generate about 10 to 25 terabytes of data per patient over that 10 years. I don't know if it's right, I don't know if it's wrong, but that was their sort of estimate looking at this. And so it immediately sort of begs the question from a PMI perspective, hey, you know, are we, can we build out the right infrastructure that anticipates that and does that? But then it actually begs a larger question, and this is, this is what I really want to know if these kinds of conversations are happening. There's the question of how you scale out these capabilities for a million people, but then there's the fundamental question of what we're going to learn in those million people that helps us scale precision medicine to all Americans. And in that context, I mean, the design of our broadband networks of the future, the design of our electrical grid, the design of our immigration policy, which in other countries we see this holistic multi-departmental approach to saying, how do we need to square up and make interoperability between all of these agencies so that we build national infrastructures that can accommodate 21st century healthcare? Are, are those kinds of conversations happening? And is, is there anybody looking at what the requirements are for all of these other parts of the ecosystem that will have to come to fruition in order for 21st century medicine to scale to all Americans? For such a wonderful question, could you have a brief response so we can get the last two questions <laughs> <laughs> That is a fantastic question. We certainly have those conversations, potentially not enough. You know, we had a conversation this morning about how we're going to have a strategy for building interconnectivity between agencies. What will APIs look like across government and across agencies in this century and the next? So, so it's, it's a conversation that we're having, but I think a lot of this is the input that we exactly need in terms of, okay, so what is a realistic way to think about scaling this infrastructure in order to accommodate the litany of cohorts that we will want to do in the future potentially, right? And so, uh, it's a great question. Okay, we have um, five minutes. Adam and then Kathy. Well, uh, <clears throat> being a relative newcomer to the research world in the last two years, uh, we've learned fast at the American Sleep Apnea Association. Um, it, we'd be very appreciative if you could use your bully pulpit to sort of, one, market this. Uh, I think it, it's been a mistake that PCORI made. Uh, no one outside of this room really knows who PCORI is. So we're talking about PMI. 
that needs to be a national, if not global, brand for all shapes and sizes, urban, rural, geographic, need I say more? Um, <clears throat> the IRB and what has been the traditional IRB has been the biggest obstruction to innovation in this country from a research standpoint. And I think you We're not going that. there. I told you at the very beginning, that's <laughs> off. <laughs> but blame it on my ADHD. What, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, with that being said, it's it's we've we've we found the the, the academic institutions hiding behind it, um, and it's prevented a lot of conversations that are going on in the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google world. You know where there are billions of people interacting, and there's billions of people's data every day. Uh, so it's sort of mind-boggling to the layman's why we're talking about a million-person cohort. I would say let's have a, a million-family cohort. Let's get the pediatrics. Let's, get, let's start with pregnancy. That shouldn't be an obstruction. Just because it's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it. Since when in this country have we not strive to do amazing, great things? This is our generation's chance to finally do that. Um, the third and most important thing is and what really ties everybody up in, in this room for all the different pe people they represent is who owns the data. There needs to be a once and for all discussion in this country about not only who owns it, who controls it, and who has access to it. And it's got to be in English so everyone could understand. It can't be 20 pages of consent and, and legalese that everyone just clicks right through. If we can't explain it to our children, we still don't understand it. So. That's my comments for Okay, I'm gonna take the moderator's prerogative and have, these are the last people, everyone else save your calories, don't bother getting up, you won't get <laughs> called on. And I think the questions are more important at this point than the answers. So I'd like to get all those out so that you can hear what is bothering us. Kathy. Hi, Kathy Giusti. Um, I guess one question I have is the focus that we have on the patients themselves and would it be easier if patients had more empowerment and we're willing to just to say, it's my data, I want everybody to be able to use it. But the challenge we see out there, and I run the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, is the patients don't know there's a problem. The patients that we work with, certainly in oncology, don't know that people aren't sharing the data. And so even when we try to explain this to them or we try to explain why we have to make investments in our own cohorts at the MMRF and try to even get them to support that, we're spending so much time educating them on the fact that the institution has their data set, but that data set's not shared with another institution, and we can't build enough data to actually understand the basic biology of our own disease. So I think when you have the bully puppet, pulpit, the best we can do is they'll become more empowered when they actually know there's a problem and they are the solution. So I think that part's important. And then back to your um, short-term wins, I do feel like... Um, I love this project because it is so audacious. But I also believe there are times when you have to look at things as a, as a pilot and say, well, if we actually roll up our sleeves and try to make a larger cohort, what would the incentives look like to do that? So I only say that we invested $40 million as a foundation to generate a longitudinal genotypic, phenotypic database in multiple myeloma. We invested the money to push it out to the public domain. Anybody can use the data. But we can't get anybody to give us their data. We didn't spend $40 million because we wanted to be a reference set. We wanted to be the foundation, the start of something big. And it makes me realize it's not that people are bad. I think a lot of people actually want to drop their data in. It's just, who's going to do it? Why do we want to do it? Are you going to pay us to do it? So until you actually start doing those pilots and understanding why anybody would do this, I think we're going to run into a few challenges. So I love today's meeting because it's so broad and it's great and bring all the ideas in. And I, I think there are many stories that can be told out there, and I hope many of them will be. But I also know at some point we'll get to the reality of what is it really going to take to start to join some of these That's forces together? That's after drinks tonight. Okay. Um, we are at time, but if you could just maybe very yeah. quickly yeah, say very what quickly. the topic is. Um, when you asked for stories at, at the first panel, you know, I was partly flummoxed, but also thought, yeah, you know, that's a great idea, and that really is our, our part of giving to this whole initiative to make it happen. Uh, but, but 
I guess one of the things that I was wondering, and, I'm, and it's, I don't need an answer, but, but I think it's You're something that we one. need to think about, is <laughs> are we talking about a million-person cohort that's a bunch of people with different diseases, or are we talking about people who are sort of, you know, because a lot of what has just been discussed about are these patients, patient uh, experiences, patient stories, you know, people with multiple myeloma or whatever, and and they're very different approaches towards assembling, you know, what this is going to be. Right. Okay. Last comment. Yes. And it is a comment, not a question. Oh, so, good. Um, it's so Eric's comment about the terabytes of data for each patient, I think, is spot on. I think those estimates are exactly right. And I immediately started thinking about our patient population and how. If you tell them, like, you have 25 terabytes of data, go ahead and download it, or here it is, they wouldn't know what to do with it. And so I encourage us to think about how, how we're going to make, whether it's cloud resources or something, available, especially if we're targeting lower income, lower socioeconomic status. They're not going to have, you know, 25 terabyte flash drives in their nice cars. Um, the other is make sure we engage our colleagues that are part of BD2K because a lot of what they're doing is developing and exploring technologies for better storage, better transfer. And what I don't want to see us do in PMI is create another set of very similar technologies. We should make sure that these two programs meet together or talk together mm -hmm. frequently. And that was all. Um, I would like to thank all of the audience questions, and I would like to uh, especially thank our two panel speakers, and it is wonderful to have colleagues and partners in this, and we shall be getting back to you with stories and more requests. So please uh, join me in thanking them. So let me ask the panelists for uh, this last session of today, and I think Kathy was going to wrap, wrap things up after that, um, to come on up. My name is Eric Dishman. I run the health and life sciences business for Intel Corporation as my day job, and then my, my night, weekends, mornings, and sometimes day job is doing patient advocacy for people with advanced cancer. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our folks as they sit down here. Uh, they didn't sit in the, in the right order, but that's totally... Oh, no, they did, actually. Yeah, they did. Excellent. Um, Dr. Paul Bleicher is the CEO of Optum Labs, um, formerly the CMO of Humedica. Um, did his training at the University of Rochester Med School, a place I got to spend a lot of time, who always seemed to bring great clinical people and computing together years and years ago with the Center for Future Health at Rochester. Um, he's also on the IOM Roundtable for Value and Science Driven uh, Healthcare. Next to him, oh, not next to him, but Eric just is down at the end there. Um, he's the VP of Technology at Health Catalyst, uh, what focuses a lot on their translational research uh, product line, so is living and breathing the kinds of challenges that, that many have talked about today. Um, formerly also in an academic environment, helping to build data research platforms when he was at Northwestern. Um, and then we have Dr. David McCauley, uh, Senior Vice President of, of Medical Informatics at Cerner, um, and also runs the Cerner Medical Informatics Institute, um, and has focused uh, in his past some on research computing at Children's Hospital in Boston. And then we have Scott Moss, uh, who's the development lead for, at Epic on research informatics and works with academic and communities on building, again, similar kinds of tools that we're talking about that will be needed for the PMI cohort. So great to have all of you here. I'm going to move around a little bit as I do this, just to keep people awake at 4 o'clock in the afternoon after a long day of, of very dense presentations. Let me um, just ask um, an initial question that has to do with... Uh, help us understand what you're working on and what your organization is working on that are relevant to figuring out how to set up this PMI effort and this million person cohort the right way. So let me just, I'll go down the line here and just start with you, Paul. Sounds good. Thanks, thanks very much and thanks for inviting me. Um, basically, uh, Optum Labs, my organization, uh, has been put together by Optum, part of United Health Group. Uh, to bring together organizations from around healthcare, stakeholders who are academics, providers, life sciences companies, government researchers, et cetera, who are interested in working on 
large databases in, in healthcare. And we've put together a database of 160 million lives of claims data over a 20 year period, 55 million lives of electronic health record data over, uh, over this year uh, that, that are three to, uh, five se uh, three to seven years old uh, or have longevity of three to seven years, 37 million lives of consumer data, uh, all brought together for the purpose of doing research for improving patient care uh, and, um, uh, and uh, clinical translation and innovation. And my particular background is that before this, as CMO of Humedica, I put together the data factory, which it has been responsible for standardizing, normalizing electronic health record data from Epic, Cerner, and from many other electronic health record uh, uh, providers uh, into standardized and normalized data around uh, uh, a number, about 15 different diseases and uh, pretty much all, uh, all of the electronic health record data. So it's that combined experience, I think, uh, that informs the panel. Great. Scott, talk a little bit about what you do at Epic and, and again, like w zero in on the capabilities that you're working on and creating that are addressing, and, and are you having some of the same challenges and how are you overcoming them in terms of the kinds of analytics that your customers and partners want to do? Uh, sure. So um, we, we have a, a system that has a lot of the capabilities that have uh, been discussed thus far. Our organizations have uh, an analytics engine that they can use to do a lot of the cohort identification, the mapping to standard terminologies. Um, the extraction to, to standard information models for uh, certain initiatives like PCORI um, and, 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 uh, and others. Um, but th that's a lot on the, uh, on the data side, and uh, we can talk about that all day. Um, but I think a lot of the really interesting things um, that health IT can, uh, can bring to the table, in addition to providing access to data and, and APIs, uh, like, like Karen was, was saying, uh, is along the operations uh, of, of running a cohort like this, uh, from tools for, uh, for consenting um, and bringing patient preferences and, and, and patient engagement uh, to, uh, to the interaction with participants in the cohort, uh, along with recruitment uh, techniques and, and methodologies for finding, uh, finding patients who are interested, reaching out to them, um, getting them involved. Um, uh, and, and collecting patient reported outcomes, uh, so, so getting, getting data back on, on patients' uh, self-reported -report, uh, information like promise. Um, and then uh, I, I think one of the things that I haven't heard a lot about today that I think is extremely important for uh, precision medicine is not just how do we get all this data, how do we do research on it, but how do we translate that back into clinical care? And, and using the electronic health record as a platform for that is, is extremely important. And of course, we have uh, lo lots of tools uh, and, and clinical decision support that can help bring that, uh, that knowledge back into, into care. David. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> thank you. And uh, apologies up front that I have a laryngitis I'm recovering from, so you guys might want to spread it out. <laughs> um, I'm immune compromised. I'll I, stay way over here. Yeah, <laughs> I, I haven't touched anybody yet. Um, uh, so at Cerner, we have um, a lot of ways to uh, get the data into the hands of the researchers. Uh, if anything, probably too many ways. It can be sometimes kind of confusing to figure out the best way. And it's a constantly evolving space, so um, uh, the challenges that worked last year all of a sudden aren't good enough for next year. So um, uh, m moving target. I think the traditional approach that we most commonly use is, is data feeds out of the operational or on, uh, transactional EHR into a data warehouse kind of structure where the data is normalized to some degree to make it easier for researchers to understand the things that are, you know, maybe a little bit overly optimized for performance in your EHR setting. You'd kind of untangle that into a data warehouse from which either you can move it as a researcher or we move it through I2B2. We export as an I2B2 format. Uh, into into your world. That's kind of the way we do it today, most of our settings. What's coming, and I think that's going to um, maybe re introduce some new complications, is um, many of our clients for whom we are now starting to deliver population health services don't really want the data feed to be limited to EHR data. They want the data feed to include all the data that's coming into their population health service, which typically is, you know, as many as 40 or 50 different data feeds, including payer claims data, PBM, pharmacy dispense data, et cetera. That's the data they want. And so we're developing 
uh, what we call a syndication service that allows that data to go through our mm -hmm. pipeline to get cleaned up and normalized and then push back down to our client, you, um, our customers, you. The tricky part is, of course, now the consent problem is even more complicated because there's so many different sources of data. So who gets the rights to see the PBM data that was captured for population health services from a research point of view? The, the consent issues that we've been hearing about all during the day today, I think, are, are really um, you know, more complex, not less complex. Um, <clears throat> I think what's exciting for the future, and I'm, I'm maybe going to step a little bit outside of your strict question just to introduce something we can come back and pursue it if it's of interest, is uh, Karen DeSalvo mentioned FHIR, which is a, a new API standard coming out of HL7. It's in early stages of development. Um, the vendor community has rallied around it and has started to aggressively do experiments with enabling uh, API, direct API access. Um, uh, Epic and a number of our other competitors are actively funding this thing called Argonaut that Karen mentioned, which is actually meeting today. I had to miss that meeting to be here. Um, uh, to um, get agreement on what are called data profiles that essentially standardize the way the data looks when it comes out of that API to a level of, of conformance that's much higher than what you're used to with the data that you get today. So in the long run, the big benefit may be not so much the APIs, but the fact that the data coming out of those APIs is now standardized and normalized to a much higher degree. And some of the credit to that goes to the much maligned meaningful use process that has forced you to learn how to do LOINC and RxNorm and <laughs> SNOMED problem list. All of that stuff's going to eventually pay back because the data that comes out of our systems is now going to be stuff you can understand without going through all the tedious mapping. So I think there's real potential um, as we move entirely into that world. And then I got some other things, but I've, I've said enough for the moment. Eric. All right. I'm with um, Health Catalyst. And Health Catalyst is in the business of helping our clients get to outcomes improvement. And we do this by leveraging their data as well as services that we provide um, to not only see the data and create meaningful analytics, but also walk them through interventions that actually do help improve care. And again, those are based on the analytics that we're showing them. Um, to facilitate this, we have developed a, a data warehouse platform. It's a late binding architecture. We've heard, we heard late binding earlier today, uh, meaning that we pull in a comprehensive view um, from the EMR system, from the costing system, from patient satisfaction systems, and other systems that are relevant uh, to patient care, and bring it into a central resource. And we link across those different systems. And then we provide a set of tools on top of that uh, central data warehouse that provide insight into specific areas of care. So we have applications around heart failure, around diabetes, and they really bring in the latest in clinical content. And that content is really how we define what's measured. So the cohort definition is one piece of content. And we've revised cohort definitions by implementing across various sites and come up with solid definitions that really work well for care improvement. Um, and then the metrics that we look at are also part of that clinical content. And so our, our, our approach is really holistic. The technology is an enabler uh, to get our clients towards quicker care improvement. And the late binding architecture, architecture is really how we get that quick time to value. And I heard a, a few comments earlier today about getting to um, quicker times to value. And I think, and, and again, late binding is, is the way that we accomplish that because we don't have to do a lot of twisting and contorting of the data to just get a hold of it. We do that when we have a, a, an, an outcome that we're trying to achieve. Um, when, when I think of the success factors for our, our implementations, a, there's still a lot of collaboration that needs to happen between the technologists and the clinicians. And we do that with our clients. We sit down and we get a team of, of clinicians to, to actually work through some of the data issues and work through the cohort definitions that are going to work for that organization. Um, and also focus, focusing in on an outcome and developing an architecture that's based on achieving that outcome instead of trying to boil the ocean and create a large enterprise data model up front. Um, the other thing that I'll add is another thing, another success factor is having access to raw data. Uh, we heard that um, in the very first session from Gina and also in session four, um, access to the raw uh, backend databases is very important to having that complete clinical record. Um, and that's part of how we um, create these analytics that can really look into some of the deeper, darker recesses of the medical record is, is sometimes required for care improvement. For research, we're just starting. We have a, a research product line um, that will leverage some of the same cohort tools that we use in our care improvement tool set. Uh, but we're also developing a re recruitment toolkit to make 
the finding and recruiting those patients much easier, as well as a toolkit to de-identify data in the data warehouse so it could be submitted to external organizations. And we're also developing a data exchange tool called CAFE that will allow our clients to submit de-identified data into a central repository for comparative purposes and also to share some of the best practices around how do we define the cohort and what tools are we using on the clinical side uh, to, to treat this condition, like things like order sets um, and care process maps. So let me, uh, I want to ask, I mean, there's a lot of questions already that even just came out of the last session, but, uh, you know, one of the things we're asked to talk about in this panel is interoperability, the myth, the realities, you know, technical interoperability, and some of the things a number of us talked about at lunch together were the human system interoperability, right? I mean, you may have it technically working, but there's a lot of human system interoperability, and you just mentioned collaboration. Um, I, at Intel, we're a large private insurer. We just published a white paper on our Intel.com site about um, advanced interoperability for healthcare based on the work that we did in Oregon with our connected care program. So we control the purse strings, purse strings um, to a much greater degree that we did in the past about what we're paying for. We've developed some very aggressive quality metrics with the providers that are for us that are, we think have a lot more teeth than most of the quality metrics that exist today. And then we had to do quite a bit of collaboration and work to get multiple instances of the EHRs to work and with the other systems to work for our particular, you know, Intel employee cohort there. That's an enormous amount of expense and cost. And my gosh, we're an IT expert shop. When are we going to get to the point where this kind of interoperability doesn't take a village and, and doesn't take that kind of investment that a critical access hospital or a community health center are never going to be able to bring the resources to bear that, that we do? Thoughts about what are, you know, when do we get to the scaled interoperability and what are the real barriers from your perspectives as people who do cover hundreds of millions of lives with digital health systems today? It, it, take it in any order. Go for so, it. So I'm going to just uh, um, attempt to derail the, the question a minute. Uh, and uh, That's right. I'll bring it back. It's <laughs> all right. Um, because, uh, you know, I really, I, I'm on a vendor panel, but in fact, don't really represent a vendor and, and um uh, in, in the sense of an EHR vendor, for example. Uh, but um, I, I want to say that listening today and reading about the precision medicine court, one of the things uh, that some of my fellow panelists have already said is that focus is one of the most important things that can be brought to an effort like this. No matter how much money is being put uh, to, to work, it's really important that um, rather than boil the ocean, that there actually be a focus on particular, I know we've had discussion with several, several people here, focus on particular diseases, particular disease models, rather than trying to do everything at once uh, from that perspective. And, from, and so getting back to the question of interoperability, it's really important. It's the focus of what a lot of people in healthcare IT are interested in. It will allow hospitals to operate, you know, with each other and patients to have better care. But it is not, it's not what precision medicine is about from from the perspective of of creating this large database. It may be necessary in the future for the application of it, but um, I would say that the 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 focus should be about how to bring data together, how to create common data models that allow, uh, and how to standardize and normalize the data so that it can be used together from, from many different sites uh, to, to provide information rather than focusing on individual organizations being interoperable within one, within, uh, between themselves. Other comments on interoperability, and how do we make sure that we don't spend our precious dollars that we're going to hopefully get from Congress? You know, every dollar that we don't have to spend making technical systems co you know coordinate with each other is another dollar we can spend on research. How do we how do we you know optimize those resources in the right way? I don't think I'm going to answer that question, but I want to just piggyback on Paul and maybe bring it back to your your original question. Uh, I agree with a, a lot of what Paul said, um, and I think uh, the. The question about how do we make interoperability possible without this huge cost, without all this work and effort, all these minds to make systems interoperate, I think you have to go back a step and, and really think of interoperability in a bit more of a broader scale. It's not just about document exchange. Right. It's not just about transactions and sending messages. It's, it's about data representation. It's about terminologies. It's about um, much more than just how do we get a document from point A to point B. And I think we've seen a lot of success with the Meaningful Use Program of uh, leveraging interoperability for clinical care. 
Um, but a lot of that interoperability and standards is not um, deep enough, uh, to use a word that, that Josh mentioned uh, in, in the beginning of the day, uh, to, to be extremely useful uh, from a research perspective. And a lot of the data elements that get into the periphery of information that you need to, to do research in, in some of these disease areas is not covered by it. Um, and so I think um, uh, that, that's an important challenge from, from an interoperability perspective. Um, the, the cost question, I think that's one of the biggest um, uh, touts of, of FIRE is it's easy. It's easy to learn, it's easy to use, um, it's, it's using you know, technologies that are used outside of healthcare. Um, and so I think uh, it, it remains to be seen, but the, the early signs are that you know, this might pose a, a really great opportunity for some of those common data representation uh, and some of those uh, easier interoperability. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's, it's difficult to be a vendor and not talk about products because that's what we do. So I apologize that I will mention things that are actually out there that we make, but um, interoperability is a hard problem. It's getting better. There's more of it happening than you'd believe if you read the New York Times every day yeah, and yeah. Re relied only on that for, for your uh, belief of the status of interoperability. And in large measure, the fact that it's gotten better is a side effect of the money that was spent through high tech on meaningful use. It has made a difference. Um, so, you know, Cerner and Epic are interchanging CCDs with each other now at a number of our in a number of cities where we have mutual clients and it works and the data comes in and out and it flows back and forth and it, it people don't think anything of it, it happens, it's real. Um, a number of the vendors have gotten together on their own to create a, a data sharing a trade association called Commonwealth Health Alliance and what we do is we all essentially agree to build in access to a federated shared record, a federated non-centralized but a federated record and we also allow the service to manage patient identity and keep track of the record location. The belief is that you should be able to walk into any physician that you get care from, you a patient, sit down and say, I authorize you to use the Commonwealth Network to go get the rest of my data, regardless of where it is. Uh, so it's, a, it's an opt-in program from the patient. We use their driver's license with their permission to link their records together. So this is early binding of identity, mm. late binding of data, but early binding of identity so that the physician system can go send a query out to just where it needs to go, just the places where that patient has been with their driver's license, aggregate the CDAs or eventually the FHIR data elements when we switch over to FHIR, pull it back, put it on the screen for the, for the provider to see and he can use whatever he needs. So that's, it's a new service, it's up and running. We've got, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred sites live. We need to have many thousands of sites live where we, we hope to get there in the course of this year and next year. Um, all of that said, however, in the long run, the real solution has come up a whole bunch of times in the questions that have been asked is to use the patient as the vector for their own data. Um, and I think that we can, maybe we'll have a separate bit of discussion about this, but when we fire enable the portal, then anybody who wants to aggregate a cohort can fire enable an app that they put in the hands of the patient and say, put in your portal's web address and it'll automatically download all the data that's available and do with it whatever that app needs to do with it. And if that app comes from the Multiple Myeloma Society, it'll do whatever you need. If it comes from the MS Society, it'll do whatever you need. And I think we'll end up in the long run with a thousand cohorts of 10,000 people with apps pulling the data that they need to answer specific questions. Mm. I, I, I'm somewhat skeptical that the million member broad database is going to have enough power to answer questions that we don't already have a pretty good uh, set of insights into. This uh, odds ratios that you're going to get out of that aren't high enough to, to perhaps justify that work. On the other hand, if you get 10,000 people with a very specific question and they're all carrying an app and that app can go pull the data down out of the EHRs and aggregate it for whatever purpose it needs, then I think you'll start to see some real power. And we heard earlier this morning, I forget who said it, that the distribution of smartphones in the population is actually pretty good. It's not, a, it's not, a, uh, it's not as limited as you might naively think. A lot, lots of people have smartphones. So we ought to be recruiting smartphones into these trials and bring their human along with them, right? Mm -hmm. So get your app together that, that wants to collect the data, get it in the hands of the people that need to have their questions answered, give them some tangible benefit from it. I mean, it needs to be worth it to them 
for some, in some way to have contributed their data. Uh, and then you sidestep all of these other questions of, of consent and ownership and the like. So anyway, that's a little bit off topic. But <laughs> Eric, just uh, comments on the preaching. interoperability challenges, either human or technical, and you know, what are real and how are you guys overcoming them? And then I actually want to move to some places that you guys have already moved to. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think the, um, the challenge of inter interoperability is real, and it's expensive no matter how you cut it. And the, the underlying problem is really has to do with data quality. Um, and, and poor data quality, you can have all the APIs and data exchange in the world, but if you don't have good data quality, that data is not going to be comparable. And the way that we've been able to work with our customers to, to solve that issue is to show value, to make it valuable to the customer to improve their data quality. And for, for us, it's really on a continuous improvement project and using the data mart to continually pull data. That, that actually shows value and shows them every day how they can be improving patient care. And so that's real short answer, but I think if there's a way that you can align it with value, align the research cohort with value, in particular, a more immediate way to improve patient care, that seems to be the way that we've been able to get a lot of leverage with our clients to do a lot of the data mapping that they just really have to do, because they're the ones with the tribal knowledge of the data. Let me do a quick lightning round. Um, I mean, just really quick answers to this, if they come to the top of your head, because you've already mentioned a couple. Um, as, as, as we try to build out this PMI infrastructure and we try to skate to where the puck is going, not to where it's been, are there other things, FIRE was a good example, that the committee ought to be looking at and recommending saying, you know, here's other initiatives or things that you ought to tap into because these are going to solve some of the scale problems that you're going to have, um, you know, other capabilities or organizations or standards or capabilities that we should be paying attention to. Just real quick, anybody go. <laughs> I think it's come up a number of times today, the notion of, con of getting consent more standardized so that it's clear that if two people have signed a similar consent document, it's much easier to negotiate data sharing arrangements. And some of that may take some regulatory and perhaps even statutory changes to HIPAA and the common rule. I'd put that on the list. Others? All I the wearable device technologies that will be feeding data in, figuring out a way to in incorporate that data with electronic health record data will be very important. I think I'll be the third third time to say this today, but aligning and, and, and taking lessons learned from the existing uh, data networks that are out there, like Pagori, uh, like CTSA, um, I, I think they've done a lot of the work um, and uh, have, have a lot of lessons learned that can be applied here. And uh, this refers back to the comment I made just before lunch today uh, about using a vast uh, uh, amount of de-identified data along with the identified and consented data. There is a lot of learning that we can do in terms of the methods of how to combine electronic health record data and claims data and genomic data uh, and how to uh, extrapolate and interpolate between, uh, between data sets that aren't fully connected but for which you could make complete use of if you really were able to apply more advanced methods. So I think a study of development of and an understanding of new methods for actually working with uh, massive data sets of electronic health record and claims data will be very valuable. So M Mina asked to provoke, I mean, I, as, as I thought about it, she was really right. I mean, we have two, uh, you know, world leaders in EHR and two world leaders in health analytics that are bringing in multimodal data sets. I have no idea how many actual lives, but it probably is more than 100 million people's worth of data that you have. I mean, what should we be learning from the platforms that you could ostensibly create together and not make redundant in PMI? What kinds of different questions should be PMI be asking that you can't answer with the data that, in theory, the four of you could, you know, in your organizations could bring together now? I think in any one of our platforms, there's a lot of, of diseases that are rare that would be very difficult for us to get large enough populations to look at. So I think some collaboration to get a, a bigger data set, of course, to look at those, those rare conditions would be one place to start. I, I think the, the biggest challenge that we've, we've had, um, or our organizations have had, have been mostly policy and, and, um, and, and not technical issues. It's getting, you know, getting data across boundaries, across organizational boundaries, across um, uh, legal boundaries. Um, and so I think what what PMI can bring um, that that we're we're still trying to to solve is um, that that IRB framework, the the consenting um, uh, uh, standardization and um, and the data use agreements that are needed to to share the data. That um, I think uh, is is just a critical step. Someone said it earlier. Uh, it's it's the foundation of all of this. 
What else can you guys answer today that we shouldn't make, you know, redundant efforts within the PMI to do? I mean, are, are there other kinds of, what are the right kinds of things that we ought to be focusing on that you can't already do with the tools that you have today or that are coming into the future in the next couple of years? Yeah, can't or can do? Yeah, what, what, what can you do that we shouldn't try to go create a, you know, a PMI infrastructure for, given the tools and sort of where the puck is going already? Well, I, and this may be the inverse answer to the inverse question. One of the things that, that the vendors have to uh, wrestle with is the, you know, the most precious resource in our day-to-day -day operations of our products is physician or provider time in front of the system. So everybody wants that provider to structure some data for some particular use case, you know, quality measure or a population health measure or an outcome kept measure or a PMI initiative question on ontology for uh, phenotype, you know, as, as someone said earlier this morning, the phenotype is much more expensive and complex than the genotype. Genotype's pretty easy compared to getting phenotypic data out of the clinician. So um, if you expect to get structured data out of the clinician, you, the community that wants to use that data, needs to find a way to do that that's extremely non-invasive. So either get agreement on some really core driver questions that we can trigger to ask only when it's really important to ask them, or convince us and convince yourselves that you have NLP tools that are good enough so that you don't need to ask structured questions, which you know, may be the long run range answer, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, pick a common nomenclature and stick with it. Is it gonna be HPO? Is it gonna be eMERGE? Is it gonna be, you know, just give us something to go work with so we don't have to keep doing it over and over again? Those are the kinds of things that we can't solve on our own. I think I answered your question. Yeah, no, I like to, Paul, you want to add to that? Yeah, I, so uh, I'm glad you mentioned NLP. Uh, I, just a tiny anecdote, I was in a physician's office uh, the other day and I was uh, at a great medical institution in Boston, which I won't name, uh, and I was showing the clinician some, uh, just some data uh, uh, about something and it, it had ICD-9 code, uh, it had frequencies of ICD-9 code uh, data, all obviously de-identified, but um, the, the clinician blanched because uh, she said that, but I only code with about five ICD-9 codes, which I think is very typical. Mm -hmm. and, and so she said, I'm going to be much better at that because I realize that people are actually using this data. So that's the truth, uh, and that's been much discussed about claims data, but it also is an issue with the HR data because a, uh, you know, a lot of the diagnoses are actually taken from the submitted ICD-9s, uh, and even the problem lists very often are, are correlated with that. ICD-10 isn't going to help. So really, 70% of the value it's been estimated, and I know that... Uh, 72% of statistics are made up on the spot. But 70% of the value of, uh, of medical records are in the narratives. And something that, that we have, and that probably you know, others have, is the ability to extract out of uh, narrative data useful, uh, structured information, to actually create structured data fields that can be shared and used and analyzed in the same way that that entered structured data can be uh, can be used. That is where a tremendous amount of the value of electronic health records are going to come in. It's something that there's going to have to be a lot of focus on or the all that specificity that you get out of genomics is going to be matched with the vagueness of, um, uh, you know, of, uh, of what you get from medical records and claims data. I, I just wanted to quickly piggyback on, on the point that David made um, and, and uh, expand a bit on, on the physician burden for collecting structured, uh, structured data um, and, um, and you know, kind of weighing that with the, with the benefit. Uh, I think it's really important uh, to go back to two sessions ago uh, to, sh you know, to give incentives for that, to show the value of it. Um, uh, because in doing so, physicians will be much more receptive. If you can show that collecting these six data elements for every patient with IBD can have a measurable improvement in not only their patients, but all patients, um, I, y y you'll be much more successful. Uh, I, I also want to expand that uh, to patients, not just physicians. So we have to think about, and, and this, is, this was said earlier as well, uh, it's not just showing the incentives and the value to providers, but also to patients uh, for participating. Eric? I think uh, one, one thing that 
we, I think we do well is with architecting the large data set from disparate data sources. That again, that late binding, not um, to not go head over heels trying to model things up front um, would be something that I hope the PMI initiative um, takes. And I think in terms of what the PMI initiative could provide, when I think of predictive analytics um, and having a large training set, a national training set, that could be used to develop some models um, that could be used more immediately for care improvement. I think there's good uh, potential benefit there. So uh, help me, and I'm not a medical informaticist, so I'm, I'm learning new words today and late binding and early binding and all of this, so uh, bear with me. I, I have finally figured out what I think you mean. Um, the, on the one hand, I hear you guys talking about focus and, and talking about, hey, let's get some agreed upon you know, uh, uh, data elements and, and data models that are already sort of known and just agree upon them. And you know, we probably should choose some disease states and all that. But at the same time, I'm hearing you talk about starting to capture what do I assume are not well normalized data sets like wearable data and all of these kinds of things. So help, you know, help me and help the committee sort of under, reconcile those two worlds, right? I mean, are you saying, you know, we, do, we need to sort of accept the known and create some standards around the known, but also generate, collect a bunch of data types where we don't yet have the abilities and tools to do that, or t talk more about the mix of those two things. Correct. I think when, when you're doing a data integration process, there's two, really two steps. One is intake of the data, and the other one is turning that data into a valuable asset, you're modeling it or doing some kind of analysis on it. And um, what we found is that in terms of data intake, it helps to take a very broad approach to data intake. Because you don't want to have to go back to the well every time you need a new data set. Or in, in, in the case of wearables, you're, the data is being collected out there um, and you want to pull it in, although you're not entirely sure how you're going to use it. So intake is a very broad um, approach to get as much of the data as you can so that when you need more data, you don't have to go back to the well. But then in terms of making value from that data and turning that data into a valuable asset, um, that's when you need focus. Uh, mapping to all the known vocabularies in the world up front is not going to lead to quick time to value. People will lose interest in the project before it gets off the ground because it'll take so long. People say, where's my value? Where's my value? So when it comes to creating value, picking a very specific um, outcome that you're looking for or hypothesis you want to prove seems to me the way that you get to value quicker. So you go for a very broad intake approach and then a very narrow approach when you first need to create value and then you expand from there. Yeah, and I, I think this is what where there's some, as a newcomer to the PMI project, there's a little bit of confusion that, that I've, it's getting less confused as the day's going on, but hmm. is it a hypothesis generation project, in which case you want to cast as broad a net as possible and capture as much data as you can and hope that you find patterns of correlation that you can back up with deeper studies? Or is it in fact, or should it in fact be focused on a thousand interesting questions that are pressing um, for which a very small amount of highly focused data is going to actually be adequate in the context of whatever genomic sampling and, and other um, non-genomic uh, you know, measures you, you can capture, exposome and so forth. So is it, which is it? Because it, I don't think it's the same project. I think those are two really very different projects. And if you're doing exploratory work, you're probably going to have to get away with NLP against uh, unstructured text mm -hmm. and hope that you, when you pull out the key concepts being discussed, you get the correlations that give you a clue to go dive in. If it's focused on specific questions that need to be answered, like does this drug work better than that drug for this particular type of epilepsy, you just need a few questions. The EHR has to be smart enough to know when to ask those questions to recognize, oh, this is cohort 27. I need to prompt for these two questions that are really relevant to interpreting that study. Um, so those are really very Paul, different things. To add things. Here. Yeah, so uh, first of all, just a, a comment on that. Uh, when you said for this particular type of epilepsy, you get exactly at the, the only way to know that is through NLP. It's it, because you're just going to have a general ICD-9 code, and, the, and it, you'll keep on coming back to that. The late binding uh, is sort of a, a bit of a religious, uh, I don't want to say war, it's a religious uh, argument in some ways, and it's, it's an important one. It, I absolutely agree that boiling the ocean, is, and, and I said that earlier, is, is a mistake. And late binding allows you to, to link together, uh, say, this is a, a date field, this is a, a medication field, et cetera. It does make the, the, the researcher 
um, do the work of, of actually doing the mapping and, and normalization and standardization. But there is a, there's another point that it brings up, and it gets to a discussion that's going to be held tomorrow about whether you have a centralized or a distributed model. Um, and the, the issue is that once you're actually creating the data structures, which you eventually have to, you want to you want to do that in a centralized way. You want to you want to manage and control that. If it's done in a distributed fashion, people are going to be unless you have a very efficient mechanism, which the world generally doesn't um, allow to uh, actually happen. Um, you're going to have people basically wasting their time creating and recreating data modeling and getting different data modeling and have incomplete data modeling. If you do it in a centralized fashion, everybody benefits from the data, you know, the data modeling that you're doing in a centralized uh, repository. So, I, I, I just want to push back a little bit. <laughs> I thought um, you might. I, I think <laughs> and you need... I don't want to take over too much of the, the, I expect the tomorrow's well. discussion. I, expect... well, no, I, I have a feeling need... that will be quite an issue tomorrow as well. You need, you need centralized models for the for the structures that you're going to capture data into, but I don't think you need to capture all the data on everybody all the time because there's too much of a burden on the position. Agree. And I think what we can do with, with um, the emerging technologies with like uh, plug-in architectures, smart platform kind of plug-in architectures, where is if you detect a condition like you've got an 18-month-old baby who's having seizures and all you've got is an ICD-9 code, you know it's a seizure. Well, when that physician is next in front of the system, prompt them with a plug-in that triggers on that vague thing and says, hey, you may need a neurome on this patient. You may need to order a sequence study, answer a couple of questions, we'll guide you to the right study, and you've got to give us a little bit of phenotypic clue so that when the geneticists interpret it, they don't have to call you and ask you a bunch of questions that you won't remember because you don't have the chart in front of you. So that can be a very focused conversation triggered by a specific clinical condition that needs that particular depth. And then it goes out of the way, and you don't see it again until the next patient that has a similar presentation. Let, let me ask you just one last question, and I want to open it up to the audience and, and to others for questions. Um, I don't know, about a decade ago, I had a team that, that collected in about 200 elderly households who were showing signs of mild cognitive impairment, early stage dementia. That, I'm, I'm going to give you an example of the data types. I mean, the comment I made earlier about our quick calculus said that we might generate 10 to 25 terabytes of data over the 10 years for each patient is sort of one thing I, I want you to sort of think about and respond to in terms of the IT systems that are in place or need to be in place to deal with that kind of volume and size of data. But then there's also the diversity of data types. I mean, there's the ones that we can predict out of the EHR, the unstructured data out of the field, but we also collected, you know, uh, uh, there are patterns of, of light usage and appliance usage like their oven in the home. Um, we collected, you know, mobile data as well as sensor network data out of the environment to try to look at changes in, in sleep patterns and falls and just their use of everyday electronics. We had software sensors that were looking at their use of email and their use of, um, well, there wasn't Facebook then, right, but social networking tools and just the everyday telephone to try to look at things like, you know, a social health measure, as you will. I don't know which of these will end up in all of the PMI cohort and, and which, you know, might be in parts of it. And, and then if you think about a genome sequence and imaging data that we're going to get for them, it is an incredibly disparate set of data coming in at different frequencies of time with different volumes, right? It is a true big data problem. What kinds of gotchas would, should we be ready for and what should we be thinking about in terms of architecting for that world? Spurious correlations. Okay. The, uh, right. The very big Bonferroni uh, correction. But um, <laughs> so... Uh, 10 to the 20th or something <laughs> like that. I mean... <laughs> But, uh, but actually, architecturally, though, it's very important because I talked about centralizing the data and, and, um, and David made the point that, you know, it creates a burden if it's too much data. You know, in fact, I'm, I don't think all the data should be centralized. I think that there's particular expertise around imaging data. There's particularly, a particular generation, uh, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, expertise around... Um, around genomics data, there's particular expertise around uh, environmental data, for example, just to give three examples. And it isn't necessary for it all to be there and worked with. It, 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 when a hypothesis has been generated and cohorts have been created, 
that you want to see the difference, uh, you know, in a, a particular genomic uh, 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 sequence or a particular environmental factor, you should be able to communicate with some shared patient identifier um, that you can create, pass the list of patients to the, to the other resource and have the resource pass you back not all the data and information, but simply the yes and no, has the sequence, doesn't have the sequence, was exposed to, uh, you know, a, a particular environmental toxin or wasn't. And, and it, so that's a federated model, but it's federated for different types of data rather than federated for the same type of data. Are there just quick questions on this, this issue of having a data architecture that's ready for the diversity of these? Just any other comments on that? I'll just make one more uh, quick comment uh, just to tag on. Um, I think it's, it's important to understand the big data problem, but uh, from showing the value and engaging patients and making sure that there's incentives for clinicians and patients to participate, you also need to think about how you're not only going to collect that data, but how you're going to present it and findings from that data to clinicians and patients. Um, just giving them a bunch of data points is not, um, not very usable. Great, okay, let's go here. Tracy McGregor here at Vanderbilt. Um, this is a great discussion. What I've heard is collecting data, pulling data, harmonizing data, and analyzing data, and we forgot the last piece. So my question to the panel is, what IT pieces need to be in place that are not in place yet to enable the, the pushback? We have the finding, we have everybody's CYP2D6 genotype, and we want to inform the patients and the clinicians what to do about that. What is not existing today that needs to be there to close the loop to get to the end? I think w one important component of that is being able to represent that knowledge in some standard way. Um, so I think the same problems that you come up with actual data representation apply to the knowledge about that data too. Um, and so I think this is, this is something that the Global Alliance is looking to look into a little more from a genomics perspective. But I think that's absolutely important to, to complete that learning health system, to, to complete that cycle is how do we not only represent this data and share it uh, and, and get access to it for, for the discovery part of that cycle, but also for the translation of it. Um, and just a, the technology trick, I think, that will become increasingly common is the use of, of plugins that can be interposed in the clinician's workflow when it's necessary, for which uh, they can represent essentially as an embedded web page data that lives outside the EHR but has the depth in it that you need to let the physician or the patient, the plugins can work just as well for the portal or for the, a smartphone. Um, to let them browse the data and understand it. There's too much data to transfer all that knowledge back into the EHR and hope that the EHR has the intelligence to interpret it and present it properly. So it's going to have to come from an external source via a plug-in. And um, you know, the, one of the Argonaut projects that Karen mentioned is to develop this plug-in architecture. We're working with, with Epic and Allscripts and others to make sure it's done in a standardized way so that it works across vendors. I, I think it's important, though, to... to realize and support both models. Um, uh, there are many organizations who, I, I think you use the, the CYP2C19 um, use case, many organizations who want that decision support in-house. They don't want to have to call out to an external source. So I think we need to support both, both the plug-in, you know, external decision support engine, but also uh, the ability to internalize that knowledge and the data to, to make a decision in the, the operational database. Let me, I, we got, let me go to Josh. <laughs> Six. Um, so a couple of things. One of the things I want to talk about, I think all these things around like Commonwealth and the different architectures for sharing data are great, but I do want to just underscore the, the point that that doesn't mean that we always know what a CBC is, especially for historical data. A lot of what we're going to get is, is retrospective data that has not been mapped to various standards. It also doesn't cover what is a colonoscopy, what is, you know, what is different kinds of note or what are the sections of the notes and things like that. Those are underspecified. Um, as far as the narrative data, what your narrative data really gets you is confirmation of your diagnosis and, um, and, and a bunch of diagnoses that you don't necessarily have specified by structured data. If you want to know who has, um, uh, uh, who's had a myocardial infarction, you can do very well with structured data. And, but you can confirm it with your narrative data. And if you want to know who had an MI while they were on rofecoxib, you need your narrative data to start really defining that procedure. Or if you want ACE inhibitor-induced cough. 
um, and um, we um, uh, other things that aren't identified well. And then the other thing is just looking at the size of records of 25 terabyte number that we keep throwing around. I think we really should recognize that it's not the traditional EHR that's that big. Um, it's a lot of the imaging data that we come in. It, just a quick calculation suggests our average record here is about six meg. Um, and hundreds of meg for the really, really dense people with lots of ICUs. But it's, it's the new data with imaging, with genomics, with um, microbiome, et cetera, that would push that number up. So, Bray, so I, I just want to... Quick responses, and then yeah. we'll go to Bray, and then here, here, and here. <laughs> so, so just a quick response about uh, confirmation of the diagnosis and a, a little anecdote. Uh, in an analysis of a number of medical centers when with combined claims data and electronic health record data, um, looking for the diagnosis of diabetes in patients who are clearly on, uh, who have A1Cs which are diagnostic of diabetes, who are clearly on anti-diabetes oral medications or, and or insulin, S something like, uh, and this was work that we did at Humatica, something like 21 to 37 uh, percent across these different medical centers did not have an ICD-9 diagnosis of, uh, of diabetes. It could only be found either from the medicines, the labs, or the, the narratives. It was in the narratives, if you, uh, if you look. Great. So, yeah. So, um, number five, I think, um, so Josh hit on part of this um, with Commonwealth. So it sounds great, the Cerner and Epic partnerships, but I thought that Epic even didn't talk to Epic, depending on the system. So if that's not the case, and all Epic systems can now talk to each other, scale it, let's go. Um, yeah, not, not the it, case that's possible. Okay. And it's At, happening today. Uh, you know, millions of patient records are being exchanged okay. on a monthly basis. That, I'm, that's encouraging. <laughs> not only just Epic to Epic, but Epic to Cerner and all scripts and 40 or plus more different vendors. Great. Um, as the panel went on, I was becoming increasingly disturbed because just listening fundamentally to even the language that's being used and that we have this data, we've collected all this data, um, we have you know, 150 million lives. What you have is our lives. And there's a fundamental thing that is very disturbing to me where when do patients get to ask the questions that we want to ask? And if we do want to ask them, we have to form a 501c3, we have to raise millions of dollars and we have to buy our data back. In Kathy's case, $40 million. This, it's ridiculous to me, and I, I know that um, this is more of a comment and not a question, but somehow we have to shift that. I, I just heard all of the, you know, we have all this, and you know what we have is nothing. We, we put our data into what you have, and what we have is nothing, and we have to change that. I'll just a quick comment on that. I mean, I totally agree. The data is, is not the vendor's data. The data is the provider's data. They are the shepherds of it or the caretakers of it. Um, what I think is the powerful opportunity with fire and APIs is the blue button on steroids so that any app that somebody could write on a weekend could go and pull down the data for that patient into the smartphone or into the cloud through the smartphone using a standards-based API. And that's why we have to make sure that gets done and gets done robustly across the vendor community because it's your data. Yeah. In the long run, and right. just to clarify as well, we don't we don't have any ability to query the data that's in the system, the health catalyst systems that are at our clients. It's really our clients are asking us to do things on behalf of them. So we're doing services that really aid in care improvement. I, I think you bring up a really important point, and and to sort of take it back to what uh, David was saying earlier, um, and oh, and just an anecdote on Blue Button, uh, we have the support for patients to log into their portal and 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 download their own data. Um, it doesn't happen very often, um, uh, you know, less than 5%. Um, and that's not just Epic. That's across vendors. Um, and, and, so I, yeah, I, yeah, I think uh, in addition to the APIs, you know, I see a model pretty similar to integrating you know, the sensor type data that we've seen where we're, we're giving the patient the ability to connect the dots, to connect their health kit app to their you know, my chart, their, their, their patient portal, and give authorization to share that data. I think it's, the, the, the model that David was, was explaining with FIRE is very similar. It's, I have data in this EHR, it's mine, and, and we, we really do think that, it's the patient's data. Uh, we, we just need a, a way for that to get to where it needs to go or where patients want it to go. I, let's, let's just, I, mean, I want to keep getting more of these quick questions. I'm going to do what Pearl did here to try to get some of the quick questions and comments out. Let's go here. So we're mixing up clinical, geno so clinical genomic and pharmacogenomic data. 
and clinical genomics very complex, but pharmacogenomic data has immediate relevance to patients, every patient, and I mean Vanderbilt data and on patient groups and our community data, you're suggesting 30 to 40 percent minimum of patients have clinically actionable genotypes from a pharmacogenomic perspective that can be acted on immediately, and community groups, if you look across the board, I'd say 100% of us are going to have uh, something that in the future when we take a medication is going to need action on. And so a lot of the things I'm hearing relate to the problems with clinico-genomic data. But in fact, a lot of this is avoided if you initially focus on pharmacogenomic, which sits across all the different diseases, so it doesn't require you to pull out any specific disease group for favoured treatment, and also is not so sensitive because it's always something that can be acted on and prevented. It's not um, unexpected, unanticipated, uh, the extra ethical issues that go along with that. So I'm just wondering if, if we should be holding a slightly, a bit more on the pharmacogenomic side of things initially. Quick comment on that. Yeah, side. Uh, you have one? Or, or, yeah so a quick comment on the pharmacogenomic. I, you're absolutely correct. It's, it, they're quite simple and they, they are more like a lab test than uh, the results from pharmacogenomics than they are like genomic data. And so they could be treated very similarly uh, uh, to lab tests. And to take it back to the theme of this session about, or one of the themes of this session about interoperability, there is work to, to make that more standard. Uh, the, the Institute of Medicine is working on it. HL7 is working on it. Um, there are many organizations doing this today. I mean, Vanderbilt is doing it. Um, uh, many of the organizations uh, that, that use our software are doing that, bringing pharmacogenomic indicators into the chart uh, and, and running decision support. So I definitely agree it's a great area to focus on in the near term while we figure out some of the more complex genomic problems. Uh, let's go here. You know, I'd like to throw out a question and, and that I think has many answers and, and throw out one possible answer real quickly. Uh, if we could start over, given the tools, the technology that exists today, given all the informatics tools that exist today, and given the, what we now know about the nature of 21st century medicine, and we were to, to design electronic records of some sort, electronic technology, to assist with that, what similarity, what, what would we do, and would it be even anything at all like the EHRs that we currently have and know and love? Uh, I, I think that's a useful exercise to think about. Uh, my, my one possible answer would be, what would you think of this as an answer? Um, to separate out the administrative, bookkeeping, legal kinds of functions that an EHR provides from separate from that the medical uses, the collection of biomarker data, the collection of vitals, and look at the list of things that the PMI is going gonna, is gonna to be asking for us to keep. Lifestyle variables, psychosocial variables, dental records has to be merged somehow, and so on and so forth. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Wouldn't one possible answer to my, the question I, ra I posed be to uh, allow patients to have their own medical records independent of the healthcare system? independent uh, and maintain it on an annual basis, go in not for your annual physical but for your annual data check uh, and maintain that and keep it going and make that data available to whatever doctor you choose, to whatever specialist you choose, to whatever scientist or researcher you choose. I, I think the, you know, that last notion is the, is the genesis of the health record bank model of, of uh, HIE, if you would, You're, each patient is an HIE of one by the designating a bank where their data accumulates and is, is enabled by them to be used by whoever they wish to use it. And I think there's a lot of value in that model. We were uh, strong advocates of it before high tech, and then high tech showed up and distracted us. <laughs> yeah, right, I, uh, I just. Go, I got, we've got five minutes to wrap up here. <laughs> let, me, let me just go to Mina, who's been waiting. I know Rob's been waiting, and we'll, do, we'll just finish off with the three of you there. So. Better turn on Quick shot, Ooh, sorry, I'll ask a quick shotgun question. I know some of you actually look at the data, some of you actually have clients who look at the data, but I think you're pretty aware of some of the analyses that they do. I guess I would, a shotgun for each of you, what are some of the most, what is the most meaningful or what are some of the most exciting precision medicine discoveries that you or your customers have had using the, the data and the analytics that, that you guys provide? We, we've done a, a project with one of our um, 
physician's practice groups that looks at diabetic patients, and it uses uh, predictive analytics to predict a risk level for the patient. And it actually allows um, kind of a what-if analysis for, for out-of-pocket costs for the patient so they can see how certain actions they take can either increase or decrease their cost. And it uses um, an algorithm behind the scenes to help them find the, the quickest route and, the, and the, the best route to improve their health and lower their risk level. Uh, it's pretty exciting. It's actually not being used with the patients yet. It's in an early pilot stage. Uh, but it's called the Patient Flight Plan Predictor, and it's, we have a blog on our website about it. It's a very um, exciting development in using predictive analytics to really help a patient improve their own health. Um, in our population health deployments, we're leveraging um, non-clinical data more effectively than ever to improve the algorithms that predict readmission and the like. And in, as, you, as you know, it's the socioeconomic factors that are sometimes the dominant factors, and so we can now take advantage of that in ways that were impossible when you just had EHR data in the past, and that's pretty exciting. I'll just go into our Scott. Yeah. And then oh, sure. Uh, I... I, I, I I think a lot of the, the work that's being done is in predictive analytics. I think that's a lot of really cool, innovative stuff. But I, I think the, the combination of genotypic and phenotypic data and doing GWAS and FIWAS is another big area where we're seeing some really cool uh, uh, and, and interesting findings. We've also had some successfully deployed predictive analytics. But I think one of the most exciting things that, that, that we see coming out of, uh, uh, of our work uh, relates to uh, creating a, a quality measure development factory, if you will, where we can, in, we can replace the very subjective, uh, very non-data intensive, very process-oriented quality measures, we hope in collaboration with national uh, organizations, um, with objective EHR-derived quality measures that are, um, that are truly outcomes-related. Uh, Richard and then Rob, bring us home. Okay. I, I think it's important for the, the record to show that the data is going to need an enormous amount of curation to be useful for the PMI. That uh, data that comes out of an EHR that is perfectly useful for patient care purposes won't support the PMI's needs. Just as, as, as one example, um, FDA Sentinels working with EHR laboratory test result data from a few tens of millions of people, we found 60 different units of measure just for platelet counts and so it took the work of uh, a large number of uh, thousands of person hours of time to regularize that data just to be able to work with platelet counts. And that's the, that's the near-term future that PMI is going to be working in. So we use the term data janitor with pride there, but that's going to be a major piece of what the PMI is going to have to, have to address. And, you know, things that are mixed up, you have uh, urine glucose, but it's urine glucose versus, uh, versus a serum glucose. There's all sorts of things. I could not agree with you more, and it is the issue with late binding, which is that burden goes to the researchers who are then going to work with the data. And often it, it, what, what it requires is actually forensic work with the site and the, and, uh, and the origin of the data which in a, in a late binding scenario may not necessarily be available yeah. to, um, to those who are actually doing that curation yeah. and I, it becomes problematic. I, 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 I was pleased to hear what it sounded to me like was a fair amount of convergence on the idea of doing that hard standardization for a relatively small number of data elements for the whole million person PMI. And, and then to do the deep dive as needed on specific kinds of data elements. I think that's a good, a good approach. I just want to really quickly challenge one of the things that you said, um, uh, good enough for patient care, not good enough for research. Uh, that scares me as a patient. Oh, oh, oh. Um, the, reason, so I, the, I, reason, the reason that it's good enough for patient care is any clinician can interpret the result. I, I just want to... It's, it's, it's a correct result. It's just that they all happen to be different. And if you're writing code, it has to know whether you're talking about per, uh, per cubic millimeter or, or, per, or per cubic deciliter. Yeah. And... Th those are things that clinicians do perfectly well. I also want to challenge us to think about the, the data quality issues that are found and how those impact patient care and how we can bring it yeah, back I, I, in, right. into all, the clinical all, system. All I'm saying so, is I, you, yeah. you can run a, a high-quality clinical system mm -hmm. where the, the human intelligence interprets the results on the fly correctly. But when we're putting together the data for a million people, it's coming from a, a bunch of different sources, it's going to need substantial number of FTEs just to make the damn platelet counts usable.
let's let's wrap up with Rob here. <laughs> as long as I'm following Eeyore, I, I will give another shout out for the data janitors of the world. Uh, that was a point I was going to make. We need a lot more of them, and if we don't pay attention to that, we're going to have a bunch of junk. The way we say it in the South is you can't make chicken salad out of chicken blank, but you can interpret that. But the second point I want to make, actually, I think may be more important. I've heard it several times today. Um, data analytics, uh, I think a real challenge uh, as we get into PMI is going to know when the analytics are giving you a testable hypothesis versus knowing that it's actually giving you an action that you should recommend that a lot of people take. You know, data analytics would have predicted that normalizing hemoglobin A1C would be a great thing to do with people with diabetes, or that normalizing hemoglobin would be a great thing to do with people with renal failure, or now that normalizing HDL cholesterol would be a tremendous thing to do with people with coronary disease. The interventions for all those actually killed people. They weren't just neutral, they actually killed people. So we've got to have the intelligence to know the difference between it's a testable hypothesis, or um, we, we know enough to say that people should actually take action and change their health based on this. Should we wrap it up there and we'll get a, a great summary and appreciate a yeah, hand for all the panelists for persevering. <laughs>Wow, what a day we have had. My head feels very full and very heavy. I am going to try to summarize quickly uh, some of the topics that we have gone over today. Um, as this is, oops, this is, yeah. So this is uh, um, the agenda that we had today, and I'm going to waltz quickly through it uh, using an unusual uh, method, at least unusual for me. Um, Today, many of you have been tweeting, and today we had 970 tweets, 19.1 million impressions. I have no idea what an impression is. <laughs> 20, uh, 281 participants and 364 people have been watching on the webcast, and of course that's going to be archived, so additional people certainly will benefit from watching that over time. Um, we started out this morning uh, with Francis Collins. Uh, sharing with us uh, some of his expectations about what might be happening with the cohort over time. And people were tweeting about that. And then we were joined uh, by Chairman Alexander, who talked to us about his, uh, told us a few stories, and I think we can really count on him for being a champion for precision medicine uh, in the Senate as we move, uh, move towards finalization of the bill in both the House and the Senate. You know, there was a lot of conversation today about policy needs, and I think uh, as we develop what those policy needs are, we're going to have to have a, a clean, fast mechanism to transmit those uh, to 21st Century Cures in the House and innovation in the Senate. Uh, we talked about data sharing. Uh, it's not just a good idea. It should be the law. Uh, it, those kinds of provisions are included in the draft legislation, so we need to be paying attention to those and cheering those on. We then heard a really nice presentation from Gina Wei uh, summarizing the response that we got from all of you about, um, in response to our request for information about uh, cohorts. And then we had two very uh, fascinating panels, uh, one with healthcare delivery uh, system representatives talking about what their cohorts, their healthcare delivery system might be able to uh, provide to precision medicine and uh, really emphasizing the need to be able to leverage the cohorts that we have. Um, and then we talked about, um, we had a panel on research cohorts, and it was during this panel on research cohorts um, that I tweeted for the very first time. <laughs> <clears throat> Hashtag, how does this thing work? <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, then we had a really uh, wonderful session that Esteban masterfully moderated for us about diversity and inclusion um, with great, uh, great panelists and great questions and discussion. And I think that we're going to have we're going to see that amplified uh, over the course of the next weeks when we have our participant and community engagement um, panel in uh, Washington in July 1st and 2nd. And then we had a panel uh, discussion about um, 
uh, cross-institutional data sharing and talking about some of the challenges and opportunities there and being able to move data from point A to point B. Um, and then we heard from uh, Mina and Karen uh, from the White House and from the Office of the National Coordinator, uh, respectively, and people tweeting about their uh, presentations as well. And then uh, last, and because it was last, I didn't pick up many tweets from this, uh, we had uh, Eric in the all-male panel <clears throat> talking to us about uh, electronic health records and uh, data exchange. Um, so we have been keeping very careful track of tweets today, and I am pleased to announce um, the hashtag PMI network top tweeter of the day is Bray. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> So I want to close with a big thank you to everybody, the moderators, the speakers, the people who brought their questions and comments uh, to the microphones, the people who tweeted. And I want to remind you that we're going to have an earlier start tomorrow. We're starting at 8 AM. And we will not be in this building. We will be in the Vanderbilt Commons Center. Uh, so please have a great evening. And we look forward to having you all join us tomorrow. Thank you.